The Lonely Warrior by Claude C. Washburn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lee Smalley. The Lonely Warrior, Prologue, 1. On the afternoon of the fifth day of November, 1914, Edward Carroll was sitting as usual in his pleasant inner office, the windows of which looked down upon the middle western city where Mr. Carroll had lived for forty of his fifty-six years. But he was not behaving quite as usual. At this hour he should normally have been conferring with other men upon matters of importance, matters concerning the cement works of which he was vice-president, or the bank of which he was director, or the copper mines whose policy he principally determined. Or he should, at the very least, have been dictating replies to half a dozen important letters that had been placed on his desk while he was out at luncheon. Instead, Mr. Carroll merely sat in his chair, and stared oddly at a calendar on the wall opposite, as though its large black announcement of the date had some deep significance for him, as perhaps it had. At last he shook his head impatiently, and with a quick gesture pressed a button in his desk. Almost at once his stenographer entered the room. "'Ruth,' said Mr. Carroll, "'did you tell me a little while ago that someone was waiting to see me?' A faint surprise showed in the young woman's composed face, but she answered the question quietly. "'Yes, sir, Mr. Barnett and Mr. King. "'Well, they'll have to wait a little or come some other time.' I must see Stacy first. He telephoned that he'd be here at three o'clock. It's three-five now, Mr. Carroll observed, drawing out his watch, which was quite unnecessary, since on the table before his eyes stood a small, perfectly regulated clock encased in thick, curved glass that magnified its hands and characters conveniently. When he comes, send him in at once, he concluded but the stenographer had scarcely left the room when the door was opened again and Stacy appeared. He was a tall, handsome, well-built young man, with blue eyes, short brown hair, and a clear healthy complexion from which the summer tan had even yet not quite faded. He looked and was well-bred and well-educated, but there was nothing unusual or distinguished in any of his features except perhaps in his mouth which was finely modelled and sensitive without being self-conscious. The only thing at all out of the common about him was the impression he gave of restless but happy eagerness, of being fresh and curious. He appeared about twenty-six or twenty-seven years old. "'Sit down, Stacy,' said Mr. Carroll. "'You wanted to see me?' "'Yes, sir,' said the young man, and took the chair at the opposite side of the desk. There was a brief pause while the two gazed across at each other. Neither could consider the other with cool detached estimation. Years of familiarity were in the way. Yet Stacy felt dimly that he was nearer to being outside than he could remember to have been before. He studied his father's well-shaped head, with its thick gray hair, clipped moustache and firm mouth, in something of the spirit in which, being an architect, he would have studied a building. He saw his father today, quite clearly, as a man of tremendous, never-wasted energy, and with a warm, generous, unspoiled heart. But it came over Stacy for the first time that the same directness which made his father go so unerringly to the point in business matters, discarding all non-essentials, made him inclined to hold very positive, oversimplified opinions about things in general. Whereupon, all in this half-minute of silence, it also occurred to Stacy that business was like mathematics, founded on definite pre-assumed principles that you were always sure of, whereas those, Stacy supposed they were there, beneath life seemed a trifle wavering and indeterminate. "'Well, son, what was it?' asked Mr. Carroll. "'You know, father,' Stacy replied. The older man pushed back his chair impatiently, and his face took on an almost querulous expression, that set small uncharacteristic wrinkles to interfering oddly with its firm, deeply traced lines. "'Yes, I suppose I know what it is,' he said. "'But I don't see why you should make me state it. You want to go to the war, and you have an answer ready to every objection I can make. 
Damn it all, Stacy, it isn't our war. If it becomes so, I'll be the first to say, enlist. But it isn't. Not yet, anyway. You know you think it ought to be, father, replied the young man steadily. I've heard you say so a score of times. Every one with any generosity whom we know thinks it ought to be. I only want to live up to that conviction. I believe it's right against wrong, the, the soul against the machine. And so do you, or you wouldn't have given so generously to Belgium. His father did not seem to be listening. He was staring away over his son's head almost dreamily. I remember when I built a playhouse for you and Julie back of the stable. You were six years old and tried to carry two-by-fours to me. You didn't succeed. He paused and looked at his son again. Stacy, he went on, I sent you to school and college for nine years, and then for two years all over Europe, and then for three years to the Beaux-Arts in Paris. It's taken, how old are you? Thirty. You don't look it. It's taken thirty careful years to educate you. You're an expensive instrument ready for use. Are you going to throw all that away to do what some untrained laborer can do as well? No, better than you. Are all those years of training going to be to fit you for no other service than to, to stop a machine-gun bullet? They ought not to be, father, said the young man. They wouldn't be in a normal world. They were given me in a normal world for use in a normal world. But all of a sudden, the normal world has been upset. It's been wickedly assailed, wiped out for the moment, by the greatest crime in history. It's up to every one of us to help bring it back. And all over Europe, better men than I, men equally well educated, have given themselves freely, poets, painters, thinkers, and trained businessmen, he added hastily. However, it did not for an instant occur to Stacy to question the justice of his father's argument. It seemed to him the only considerable argument against his going to war, and he again respectfully recognized his father's ability to go straight to the essential point. "'But you see, sir,' he said, "'that, true as your contention is for the world as it was, and isn't, it doesn't hold good now, for it would be equally true if America were in the war. Yet then you would, as you said, be the first to want me to go. But, I know, America isn't in the war, yet, but every single trivial example like mine will help, just a little, to bring her in. There was a moment of silence. What about me, Stacy? Mr. Carroll asked at last. The young man gazed at his father sadly. I know, he said, it's horrible, but all over the world it's going on, the same questions being asked and set aside in thousands and thousands of families. And, though it isn't adequate compensation, you still at least have your work, which is more than wives and mothers have. At this Mr. Carroll pushed his chair back sharply. My work! he exclaimed angrily. Who's it for? For you! Every bit of it! For you and Julie! After all, Stacy was young and had a sense of the ridiculous. So laughter surged up within him now, and, though he kept it silent, relieved his intensity, for he was earning a respectable salary from the firm of architects in which he would soon have a junior partnership, and his father had long since given him two hundred thousand dollars worth of excellent municipal and industrial bonds, some bearing five, some five and a half per cent. While, as for his sister Julie, she not only had a strictly equal private fortune, but was also comfortably married to a prosperous young lawyer. But, knowing his father, and knowing him better than usual today, Stacy carefully kept his amusement to himself. It vanished anyway when his father added, And Marion? And Stacy winced. I haven't told her yet. I'm going to tell her tonight, he said a little hoarsely. It'll almost break her heart, I'm afraid. All the Marions in the world are having their hearts broken today. And all the fathers and mothers... I could pretty nearly say, thank God your mother is not living. Stacy nodded grave assent. The individuals gone by the board, after which silence fell upon both men. At last the older man drew himself together. What army? he asked. The French? No, I thought of that. 
since I speak French decently, said his son briskly, glad of the change in mood. But I rather think, though I'm not sure, that I'd have to join the Foreign Legion there. And sacrifice is all very well, you know, but it needn't be suicide. I mean to come back alive if I can do so honorably. And of course I've thought of the Canadian army, but there's too much neighborly dislike between Canadians and Americans. So I'm going into the English army, if they'll take me. I've a lot of friends in England, you know. I've visited some of them at their homes. They'll all be in as officers. Perhaps I can get into some regiment where I'll be under one of them. And you leave? Next Wednesday. I'll catch the Mauritania. Don't be angry with me, sir, he begged. His father shook his head. No, he replied dully. I suppose, as a matter of fact, I'd have done the same thing at your age. It's the kindest thing you could say to me, said the young man, with a deep sigh of relief. He rose. I mustn't keep you any longer now. The office is full of people waiting to see you. I say, Dad, tonight I, I must go to see Marion, but tomorrow night let's dine at the club together and have champagne and then go to a show and be awfully gay. All right, said his father. They shook hands and Stacy departed. But when the door had closed behind him, Mr. Carroll did not at once summon his stenographer. Instead, he sat gazing, as before Stacy's arrival, at the calendar on the wall opposite. At last he rose, crossed the room, and tore off the leaf. November 5. He folded the paper once across and placed it carefully in his pocket book. Then he returned to his chair and pressed the button in his desk. End of Prologue, Section 1 The Lonely Warrior by Claude C. Washburn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Prologue 2. Stacy Carroll was not more unusual than most men, but he was as much so. The only difference was that his diversity had been fostered by his education, and that he was not ashamed of it, but clung to it as something of value, desiring only to suppress the appearance of it. He was healthy and vigorous mentally as well as physically, mixed easily with his fellows, and was as usual on the surface as they on the surface. But really he was unusual in being extraordinarily sensitive to impressions, to whatever was beautiful, provided it was also faintly exotic, in short, to whatever was fine and delicate and fanciful. And if one asks how it came about that, with this characteristic, he was content to live in the city of Vernon, which had two hundred thousand inhabitants, was situated in Illinois, was not very beautiful, and certainly had no touch of the exotic about it, the answer is that he was not content with this part of him. The part was not by any means the whole. With a great deal of the rest of him, Stacy very much liked living in Vernon. He liked many Vernon people, he liked the physical comforts of his existence, and he did not dislike being a member of one of the city's most prominent families. He had a great capacity for liking both people and things. He could perceive bad in them, but quite instinctively his mind singled out and dwelt on the good. Moreover, it should at once be said for Vernon that it differed from the average Middle Western city of two hundred thousand inhabitants. Being close to Chicago, it was metropolitan in feeling. Plays came to it and music. Its citizens, the ones Stacy knew, were sophisticated, well-informed, almost too up-to-date. The houses that they built, often with Stacy's help, were modern and handsome. The provincial spirit had long since vanished from Vernon. And, after all, Stacy's very eccentricity, his delight in what was wistful and lovely, though it would certainly have been better satisfied in Paris, was not altogether starved in Vernon, as a love of classic line might have been. Books and music fed it, and where in the whole world could he have found more perfect satisfaction of it than in Marion Latimer? For the three years that he had known her, to enter the door of the house in which she and her parents lived had been to him like crossing the threshold of fairyland. Outside there might be street cars and motors and the smell of soft coal. 
Within there was charm and grace and peace, not stupid peace, tingling peace, and Marian, who embodied them all, with so much more, and spread them about her. Never until this evening had Stacy entered the Latimer house without experiencing a sudden sense of buoyancy. But tonight his heart was so heavy that it seemed to weigh his whole body down. He had a curious feeling that he must tread carefully or he would break something. In the narrow colonial hallway he gave his coat and hat to the maid, then went into the drawing-room, which was white and spacious, though the house was small. Mr. and Mrs. Latimer were there. Marian was not. Marian was never there. She was always coming from somewhere else, or going somewhere else, both in space and time. At least that was the impression she left lovingly in Stacy. Not that she was full of futile restlessness. It was only that her charm was the charm of movement, of running water, of a hummingbird. Mentally as well as physically, oh, far more. She paused only at moments in her flittings. You hardly ever caught her, but that made the rare moment more precious. Her parents greeted Stacy with quiet cordiality, and made him sit down beside them in front of the open fire that, in the semi-darkness of the room, set reflections glowing here and there across the yellow of polished brass and the cool rich surface of statuettes. "'Marion will be down soon, I've no doubt,' said her father, with a low laugh at having said it so many times before. Stacy considered him, feeling much the same appreciation he felt for Marion, only without the thrill and the sense of enchantment. And, indeed, Mr. Latimer deserved appreciation. He was slim and straight, and his head was the head of a Greek youth grown old. Curly white hair, straight nose, short upper lip, nothing was wrong. His profile, at which Stacy gazed now, was clear and perfect, like Marion's. Until three years ago, Mr. Latimer had lived, with his wife and daughter, his books, his pictures, and his Chinese vases, in Italy. And certainly a Florentine villa seemed the more proper setting. For the life of him, Stacy could not understand why the Latimers should have returned to live in America, and of all places in America, should have chosen Vernon, Illinois, even if it was Mr. Latimer's birthplace. But Stacy was devoutly grateful that they had done so. He rather thought it was due to Mrs. Latimer, and he was glad to think so, since it gave him something to like her for. Mrs. Latimer, in fact, worried Stacy a little, because he could not make her out. She, too, was handsome in a way, but she seemed to Stacy not to be in the picture, but aloof, dispassionately commenting on everything and everyone, including himself, her daughter, her husband, and her husband's Chinese vases. Stacy recognized honorably that this was probably only his fancy, for Mrs. Latimer never passed such comment aloud. She was habitually quiet, letting others talk, but she was certainly not stupid. Sometimes she would laugh suddenly and spontaneously when neither Stacy nor Mr. Latimer had seen anything amusing until her laughter caught them up and sent them back to look again and made them laugh too always appreciatively. "'You're grave tonight, Stacy," said Mr. Latimer, turning his eyes to the young man's face. "'I suppose it's this catastrophic war. Of course it's to your credit that you're capable of feeling it intensely. The fact reveals a precious un-American gift of imagination. But you're wrong, all the same, to let the thought of the war weigh you down, you know. I'm increasingly convinced that each man has a world of his own, and that this is the only world in which he can profitably live. I'm more convinced of it than ever now, when I see painters and philosophers and musicians dropping their arts and engaging in violent, quite futile polemics on something outside their own worlds. A painter's ideas on, say, the correct method of building a sewer, are without value, and also are his ideas on war. He wastes his own time and that of others in expressing them. To each man his own world. To you, building noble houses. To me, collecting vases. Also, we have properly an outlet for our emotion there. We have no outlet for emotion concerning the war. That's harmful. Stacy had listened to the melodious flow of Mr. Latimer's words with a faint unaccustomed irritation. He could see no flaw in the argument. 
Logically, Mr. Latimer was right. Yet, even if uselessly and wastefully, how could one help abandoning cool logic while the terrible waves of the war flooded in from every side? Just as that afternoon it had occurred to Stacy that success in business entailed an oversimplified view of life, so now it occurred to him that success in living entailed too neat a perfection. Actually, the two results were not so very far apart. How odd! Of course, he added to himself, he does not know that I have found an outlet for my emotion about the war. But Stacy was not going to tell Mr. Latimer of this. He was going to tell Marion, if she would only come. "'It's the tour de voir theory, sir,' he said, after a brief pause. "'I dare say—' But Fingers brushed his hair and forehead, and his words ceased abruptly, while his heart gave a bound, and a slow thrill crept over him. "'Marion!' he cried. But she was gone already, and smiling at him mischievously from the arm of her father's chair. "'I wonder—' Stacy said appealingly to Mrs. Latimer, if you'd think me very abrupt in asking Marion to go up to the library with me. There's something I want to talk over with her. Mrs. Latimer looked at the young man steadily for the first time since his entrance. No, she said quietly, do go. I wonder, said Marion gaily, whether Marion is going to have anything to say about it. But then, before the earnestness of Stacy's expression, she ceased smiling and led him away. Upstairs in the library she made him sit down in an easy chair and perched herself on an ottoman at his feet. She was admirably quick in responding to moods, and she looked up at Stacy now with a tender gravity. He longed to stretch out his hand and touch her and draw her to him, but he knew that if he did so she would slip away from him to become all motion and fluidity again so he merely sat and gazed at her fair curly hair, her eyes, her small mouth, and the delicate contour of her cheeks, thinking her like a Tanagra come to life. "'Marion, dearest,' he said at last, "'I've made up my mind about something, all alone, without asking you first, because if I'd asked you I'd have made it up wrong, no matter what you said. Marion, I'm going to the war.' For just an instant the girl continued to gaze up at him, clearly not taking it in. Then her face flamed with eagerness. "'Oh, Stacy!' she cried, her eyes shining. "'Oh, Stacy!' But Stacy's heart had all at once grown intolerably heavy with pain. It is true that the very next instant Marion's mouth drooped and she cried, "'Oh, Stacy!' again in a different, lower tone and suddenly was in the young man's arms and kissing him tenderly. But though Stacy was made dizzy with love, the pain endured. As long as he lived, he felt, he would remember that Marion's first thought had been that he was going to be a hero, that he was going away from her into that horrid mess across the Atlantic, perhaps to be killed, only her second thought. This perception did not develop into criticism of Marion. Stacy was incapable of criticizing Marion. She was perfect. It was simply a wound, the first the war inflicted on him. And he felt dimly that since this morning all the fine clarity of his life had given place to confusion. His reaction to everything was hopelessly different. Throughout the evening Marion was prodigal of her grace, showered him with impulsive expressions of affection. Yet, instead of sheer loving delight in her, such things stirred him to physical and mental desire, desire to possess this girl, body and soul. He flushed with shame. He had never felt this way before, or, if he had, he had not known it. When at last it was so late that Stacy simply must not stay longer, Marion accompanied him downstairs, her hand in his. They looked into the drawing-room so that he might say good-night to her parents, but the room was empty. Only a single shaded lamp had been left burning, and the fire on the hearth was flickering to ashes. "'I suppose Papa's at the club, and probably Mama has gone to bed,' said the girl, in the hushed tone that dark and emptiness induce. "'It's awfully late,' he replied remorsefully. She drew away from him to a distant dim corner, from which her face shone palely like a white flower in the night. "'Stacy,' she called softly, come here. 
He obeyed, and all at once her slender arms were about his neck, pulling his head down, her fragrant hair was against his face, and her lips were pressed to his in such a willing kiss as she had never given him before. It left him trembling from head to foot. His heart beat madly. He could not speak. But she could. "'Now will you forget me, Stacy? she murmured, with a low mischievous laugh. Whatever she felt, it was certainly not what he was feeling. Well, that was right. He was glad of that, he supposed. In the hall, however, she did not laugh. "'Oh, Stacy," she said, "'come every day until you go. Come twice a day, three times. Come all day long.' He kissed her fingers and stumbled dizzily out of the door. When he reached the sidewalk, a woman, muffled in a heavy fur coat, came toward him. "'Mrs. Latimer!' he cried out in surprise, when she was close to him. "'I wanted to speak to you alone, Stacy,' she said. "'So when I heard you leave the library, I slipped on a coat and came out here.' Stacy was genuinely touched, but also apprehensive, as one always is toward the mother of one's fiancé for fear that she was going to reprove him for something in his behavior to her daughter. "'Oh, but I've kept you a long time,' he stammered. "'Aren't you cold?' "'Stacy,' said Mrs. Latimer, looking gravely into the young man's face, "'you're going to the war.' "'How did you know?' he exclaimed. "'I've seen it coming for many days,' she replied, "'and tonight I was sure. You came to tell Marion.' "'Yes, how very, very good of you to want to speak to me and to wait for me here outside. She shook her head. Come, let's walk up and down for a few minutes, she said, and took his arm. Mrs. Latimer, he begged, you're not going to tell me that I'm wrong. It's been so hard for me to decide. You're not going to tell me that I owe it to Marion to stay. It would be so sweet to stay. Oh, no, oh, no, no, no she replied. Then, after a pause, how did Marion take it? She was a dear, he said loyally, but with a sinking feeling at his heart. She has never been so kind to me before. Was she glad you were going to be a hero? He started. This was uncanny. But he felt resentment, too. Marion is so fine, he said a little stiffly. She sees things in flashes. She looks through the, the ugly facts to the glory beneath them. I'm not a hero. I know it only too well. But Marion sees only the collective recognition that I and a thousand others are giving of, of the existence of something deeper than facts, of an idea. He shook his head, unable to express his thought, and uneasily conscious that he was defending Marion, not very well, either. My dear boy, Mrs. Latimer returned, Please believe me that I am not blaming Marion for anything. I recognize as clearly as you do all her fineness. Marion lives in a palace, and when you live properly in a palace, perfectly at home there, you have palatial thoughts. But you see, I don't live in a palace. I'm of coarser clay. You don't know me very well, Stacy, but I know you, I think, and I felt I must see you for a few minutes. He was moved by her kindness and murmured his gratitude. "'But I don't really know,' she went on, "'what it is I want to say. Nothing, perhaps. Certainly nothing that is clear. The world is a welter of confusion.' He nodded assent, feeling closely and comfortingly drawn to this middle-aged woman who had always seemed aloof to him before. Mrs. Latimer did not speak again for several minutes. "'How do I know what war does?' she continued at last. How should you know, for that matter? But, Stacy, if it changes you in odd deep ways that you can't conceive of now, nor I either, don't, please don't, suffer too much and blame yourself for the changes. There'll be so much suffering you'll have to go through anyway that it would be a pity to add to it unnecessarily. He shook his head. I don't think I understand, Mrs. Latimer. How in the world should you? she replied. I don't, either. I only feel something rather vaguely. But there is one thing clear, my dear boy. I want you to be certain that you have a sincere, affectionate friend in me, who will always try her puzzled best to understand you sympathetically, 
and that was really all I had to say. Oh, thank you, he cried, genuinely touched. Now take me home, she added. We must go carefully around the house, and I'll let myself in at the back door so that Marion won't know I've been out. She laughed. Think of your having an assignation with your mother-in-law and having to conceal it from her daughter. But when Stacy had seen Mrs. Latimer safely enter the back door of her house, and was walking home along the deserted streets, though he felt warmed and comforted by her unexpected intelligent friendship, he also felt an uneasy sense of disloyalty, as though he and she had become accomplices in a secret league against Marion. End of Prologue Section 2 The Lonely Warrior by Claude C. Washburn This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Prologue 3 Stacy arrived in New York one afternoon about a week later. His boat was to sail the next morning. He went to the small hotel on 10th Street, where he always stayed. "'How do you do, Mr. Carroll? Glad to see you, sir,' said the clerk. Stacy wasted no time, but dropped his suitcase in his room, and set off immediately uptown on the top of a motor-bus. It was clear dry weather, not too cold, and the city's buildings stood out sharply against a brilliant sky. Stacy had never liked this glittering hardness in the atmosphere of New York. The Metropolitan Tower wouldn't be so bad and the Woolworth would be bully, he had often thought, if only they would soar up dimly into a softening haze, as they would in Paris. The whole show was good, but not good enough to stand this crude vivid light. Nothing could stand it, neither façades nor human faces. It was like an immense close-up at the movies. And today, since he continued to feel about him and within himself, so much confusion, this effect of physical clarity really made him uneasy. But the discomfort soon faded, and he thought only that he was to have this whole afternoon and evening with Philip Blair. He took the stuffy elevator in the Harlem apartment house, stepped out, and hurried down the dark hall to Philip's door, with no other feeling than gladness. Philip himself opened the door and his face showed as warm a pleasure as his guest's. He was thin and slight almost to emaciation, with keen prominent blue eyes, a sharp-cut nose whose nostrils seemed to sniff like a dog's, and a short fair moustache. He looked like a medieval ascetic, superficially modernized. Just at present he was in shirt-sleeves and held a pair of compasses in one hand. With the other, he shook Stacy's eagerly. "'By Jove, I'm glad to see you,' he cried. "'But why do you give me only a day? Why didn't you come and stay a week? Come on in!' And he led Stacy down a narrow hall and threw the dining-room into his study. "'Couldn't do it,' Stacy replied on the way. "'Whole business so sudden.' "'Yes, I suppose so,' the other assented quietly. "'What you working on?' asked Stacy, leaning over the drawing-board in the study, and fumbling abstractly at the same time, with a pile of sketches that lay, curled up anyhow, on a table close by. "'Public library for a village,' said Blair, pulling a sketch of the front elevation from the rattling heap of papers, spreading it out on the board, and holding it down flat. Together they leaned over it. Stacy nodded. Fine, he said. Awfully good. Let's see. It's not for a New England village. Where is it for? Pennsylvania? Pretty near. Western New York, close to the Pennsylvania line. Stacy continued to examine the drawing, then began to smile, poked his finger at it with a wide curving gesture, and finally broke into a frank laugh. Always the same old Phil, he said gaily, dropping into an easy chair quite incorrigible. Don't you ever remember how many shameful hors concours you were always getting at the Beaux-Arts, and how disapprovingly old Fromels used to shake his head over your projets, and what they all used to think of you? Too bad. Just a little vulgar. Just a little vulgar. Blair laughed with him, 
but after a moment Stacy became suddenly silent and gazed with a puzzled frown at his friend, wondering how it was that anyone so physically frail as Blair could possess such creative masculine vigor of mind. "'How are you getting on, Phil?' he asked abruptly. Blair shrugged his shoulders. "'Oh, all right enough,' he answered lightly. "'I scrape along without too much difficulty. It would be easier in one way if I were to go in with some firm, but—' "'Never do. For you, never in the world,' Stacy interrupted, shaking his head. "'You'd feel crushed.' "'Yes, I'd rather go it on my own. I'm all right. Absolutely the only thing that bothers me is not getting enough jobs. I don't mean because I need them financially, but because, you know how it is, to learn a man has to see his work in actual stone and brick. "'You're too damn good,' said Stacy hotly. "'You've got the real stuff in you. Here am I, prospering like a—like a, like a pork-packer, while you struggle along unappreciated. Yet you're a thousand times better than I.' "'You're too generous and loyal, Stacy,' Blair returned, with a shake of his fair head. "'I couldn't ever reach your delicacy in detail.' "'Detail, yes,' Stacy muttered. "'I—' He, too, shook his head, while his friend gazed at him with a calm, clear smile. "'Lack of vulgarity is the curse of more places than the Beaux-Arts,' Stacy concluded suddenly. "'There's a brand-new thought for you, brand-new so far as I'm concerned. Make what you can of it, Phil.' Philip Blair laughed. "'Sounds interesting,' he said. "'I'll have to think it over.' Anyhow, you needn't worry about me. I managed to scrape enough together to live and keep Catherine and the boys going. Where are the kiddies? Out for a walk with her. They'll be in soon. After this, a silence, that perhaps both young men had felt lying in wait, descended upon them. Blair was the first to meet frankly what it stood for. So you're going over into it, Stacy, he said. Stacy nodded. I've got to. Well, said Blair, slowly, after another pause, I suppose, in view of the tremendous issue, I ought to feel principally gladness that one bit more of strength and courage is thrown into the right side of the balance. But do you know, I don't, I can't. Perhaps it's because I'm not big enough to get away from personal feelings. And yet I don't think it's merely that. The truth is, Stacy, that you and I are individualists. We were born like that, and we've been brought up that way. The profession we've chosen is individualistic, not perfectly so, because we have to meet the ideas of our clients, but a good deal so all the same. For the very fact that people in general are so standardized, unindividual, wanting in ideas of their own, makes them leave pretty much in our hands the houses they hire us to build for them. Stacy was smiling. He recognized with affectionate amusement a characteristic of his friend's mind, that inability to leave any side issue of a theme unexplored before pursuing the main theme onward. How different from Stacy's father! and also how honest and thorough. Most people thought that Philip had a wandering mind. He knew better. For Philip always did come back to the theme. He was back in it now. "'We're against the current,' he was saying sadly. "'The whole trend of the world is overwhelmingly toward collectivism, doing and feeling in common, standardization. And yet, and yet, the unit is the individual, it can't ever be the group. The individual's a fact. There you have him, complete, a world, his only one, to himself. The group's a fiction, a composite photograph, lifeless. Oh, I know the whole trend of things is wrong, and that we're right, so long as we harness our individualism and don't let it grow into a silly cult. Right? Wrong? He went on musingly, staring off through the window. What do I mean by right and wrong? Well, I mean, I suppose, creatively valuable, creatively harmful. And the war is going to rush and swell the advance of collectivism. No more art, no more thought, no more real life. Not till long after the war is over. You'll see. 
Well, it was what Stacy himself had told his father, but he hadn't perceived all that it meant. That was what you got for being impressionistic instead of thorough, he told himself humbly. Blair turned his eyes back slowly to his friend. And that, he concluded, his thin face drawn with an expression of pain, is why, though I know you've got to do it, and though I'd do it too if I had the bodily health, that is why I feel, above all, grief that you must throw yourself into that inferno of awful physical and worse mental suffering. Forgive me, he cried remorsefully. But the shadow that had come over Stacy's face was not there because of the prophecy of pain. Stacy was thinking of the contrast between Philip's words and Marion's. That's all right, Phil, he said quietly. It wasn't what you said that bothered me. It was something else. Of course I know what I'm going into, so far as anyone can know, through his imagination, about something totally outside his experience. It's a great deal better to think of it beforehand than be ready. They dropped all talk of the war after this, and before long Philip's sons dashed in. Jack, the younger boy, who was two and a half, ran at once shyly to his father, but the older, who was five, gave his hand to Stacy with a pretty confiding cordiality. "'How do you do, Uncle Stacy?' he said, with childish formality, recently enough learned to demand care and effort. "'Hello, Carter,' returned Stacy, who liked the boy and liked being called uncle. The child leaned against his knee. "'Uncle Stacy,' he exclaimed, his soft eager face glowing, Will you do fly away, Jack, fly away, Jill, for me? I think I can find them this time. I think I know where they went. Philip Blair laughed. Having achieved formality, he said, he puts it behind him at once. Something accomplished, something done. Has earned a night's repose. Quite right, too, Stacy replied. I promise I will after just a little while, Carter. Where's your mother? Here said Catherine, coming through the doorway. It was windy out. I had to fix my hair. She shook hands with Stacy, a little shyly and formally, almost like her son. Let's go into the sitting-room, she said, in the abrupt way she had of speaking. There's a pleasant fire in there. But when they had sat down in front of it, they all became silent, all, that is, save Jack, who, on the floor with his toys, babbled to himself ceaselessly of a thousand important things. Even Carter was silent. He sat on a footstool and gazed at Stacy from a little distance with patient expectancy. Stacy, however, had forgotten him. A dozen thoughts were moving through the young man's mind, yet not turbulently, but smoothly, without interference, like ships on a wide river. Perhaps this was because he was not thinking of himself at all, but of Phil and Catherine. He looked at Catherine, sitting there across the hearth, she, too, apparently far away in thought, and tried to study her objectively. She was tall and dark and handsome, with high cheekbones, a high forehead, and black eyes set deep beneath long sweeping lashes. She had a magnificent figure, lithe, supple, and without opulence, slender even, but making evident the large bony structure so too with her head. It was like a firm Mantegna drawing, revealing clearly what lay beneath the smooth close textured skin. Therefore in repose her face appeared even stern. There was something sculpturesque about Catherine. But these things were externals. What was she really like? Stacy could not discover. In all the years that he had known her, first as Philip's fiancée and then as Philip's wife, he had never got beneath her intense, shy reserve. Yet, which seemed odd, there was no sense of constraint between them as long as Phil was there, too. Stacy could talk impersonally with her, or, better still, sit for a long time silent with her, as now, perfectly at ease and sure that she, too, felt at ease. That was all, though. He could not understand the marriage. Still, 
he recognized that it was a happy marriage, and he admitted loyally that a man very rarely did understand his most intimate friend's choice of a wife. Sometimes, he remembered, he had tried to sum up Catherine and her relation to Phil impressionistically. Once he had told himself that she was like a castle, and Philip like a wind blowing around it, rattling the shutters, but leaving the castle permanent and unchanged. But he felt a touch of impatience now, in the recollection of that judgment. He had always been full of such fancies. Perhaps he had even cultivated them, and felt a small pride in them. Somehow, in these last weeks, he had come to feel almost antipathy for these baubles. What did they really explain? What good did it do to catch a mood, even truly? What was a mood but an evanescent, unrelated thing? But distaste for oneself does not suffice to alter one's nature. Stacy did not perceive that his present musings had the same quality they disapproved of. It was Carter who broke the silence, with a plaintive, unconscious sigh. Philip laughed, but his visitor started. "'Oh, Carter, old chap,' he said remorsefully. "'I forgot all about Jack and Jill. I'm ready now. Come on over.' The child ran to him delightedly, all the ages and ages of tedious waiting forgotten at once, and Stacy took a postage stamp from his pocket, tore it carefully in half, and gummed the pieces to the nails of his two forefingers. Experience had taught him that stamps were safer than scraps of ordinary paper, which had an embarrassing way of coming off. Two little blackbirds sitting on a hill, one named Jack and one named Jill. Fly away, Jack! Fly away, Jill! Come back, Jack! Come back, Jill! Stacy performed the magic trick over and over again, while Carter searched unavailingly for the bird's hiding place, sure that he would find it the next time, and Jack, not understanding, but delighted none the less, trotted around tirelessly after his brother, and the November twilight crept in through the windows and darkened the room. Then it was time for the children to go to bed, and Catherine led them away, leaving the two men together. After a while she came back, and they all three went in to dinner. Stacy glanced at the table appreciatively. "'Phil has one human foible anyway,' he said to Catherine. "'He never cared what he ate, but he's always been fastidious about how he eats it.' Catherine gave him a rare smile that softened her face to beauty. "'Do you mean,' she asked, "'that all the setting is good, but the dinner itself not?' He laughed, pleased and surprised at the disappearance of her shyness. "'You know I don't. How can I tell what the dinner's like when everything's concealed beneath those heavy silver covers?' He stayed until very late in the evening. It had always been Catherine's way to disappear rather early and leave her husband and Stacy to themselves, no doubt because she knew that she had no real part in their intimacy. But to-night, though she went out of the room from time to time, she invariably returned. Indeed, she seemed different to Stacy. It was, he thought, as though one thickness of the veil between them had been stripped away. Oh, Stacy, dislike of impressionism? Once he caught her gazing at him with a melancholy intentness, but, seeing that he was looking, she turned her eyes away at once and stared into the fire. The war was not mentioned, but, because there was no feverishness in the talk or sense of constraint upon the three, Stacy felt that this revealed no attempt to evade the war and his share in it. The war was there, and he was going to it. That was a simple fact, conceded by all three. There was nothing to do about it or say about it. War was not a part of their past or woven anyhow into the fabric of their minds. Not a bit of use for conversation. "'I'll be down at the boat tomorrow morning,' Phil said, when at last Stacy rose to go. "'Thanks, Phil,' Stacy replied gratefully. "'Good night, Catherine, and thank you both ever so much. I feel bathed in quiet happiness.' Catherine gave him her hand, with a murmured good night, then dropped it abruptly. "'Shy once again,' thought Stacy, with kindly amusement. 
when the next day all good-byes had been said and the great ship was sweeping out to sea and stacy was walking to and fro alone on the deck with all his thirty years of life vanishing behind him rounded out ended a completed story while between it and his present self a mist began to rise like the mist that was rising between ship and shore he gathered up the impressions the final week had left him gently as one ties together old letters before putting them away and stripping them down to essentials he could find but this that there was a sweet serenity in the memory of the afternoon and evening with the blairs an odd sense of comfort in the picture of mrs latimer stepping towards him beneath the arc-light in front of her house and yes comfort again in the thought of julie his sister julie with whom he had never had anything in common save their relationship but the vision of whose good-humoured face stained with tears and of whose ridiculous efforts to make her eight months old baby say good-bye to uncle stacy recurred to him now gratefully in the thought of marion there was only uneasy pain perhaps he reflected sadly this was just because she had hurt his vanity or perhaps it was because at such a moment of leave-taking what one demanded was merely simple affection or perhaps it was because intense love must be uneasy and painful well he put the letters away and closed the drawer upon them end of prologue The Lonely Warrior by Claude C. Washburn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part One, Chapter One. Funny, June is June, permanent sort of thing. Looks in 1919 ridiculously the same as it looked in 1914. So Stacy Carroll reflected idly as he stepped out into the fresh dusty sunlight from the pier of the foot of West 23rd Street. He wore the uniform of a captain of infantry in the American Army, with the red, white, and blue ribbon of the D.S.C. He summoned a taxi with an imperious but economical gesture of the wrist and forefinger, spoke two words to the chauffeur, flung in his bags lightly, and set off for the small hotel on 10th Street. During the whole of the brief ride he looked out of the window, observantly enough, but he did not appear to be affected one way or another by what he saw. At any rate, his face remained impassive until, when he had descended from the taxi and entered the hotel, the clerk at the desk shook his hand and said, "'How do you do, Captain Carroll? Glad to see you safely back, sir.' Then Stacy smiled in an odd, twisted way that did not make the expression of his mouth more genial or bring any expression at all into his eyes. In his room he lighted a cigarette, laid it on an ashtray, and set immediately to unpacking his bags, swiftly, systematically, and without haste, pausing only for an occasional puff at the cigarette. Three minutes before he had finished unpacking, he turned on the water in the bathtub. The bath was ready at almost the precise moment Stacy was ready for it. He dressed with the same smooth uninterested efficiency he had shown in unpacking and undressing. Only once did he make any wasteful gesture. This was when, his foot coming in contact with one of the puttees he had laid on the floor, he deliberately kicked the puttee across the room. Finally, when he had bathed and dressed, and everything was put away, Stacy looked in the telephone book, then called up Philip Blair's number. "'Phil, this is Stacy. Yes. Yes. What? Oh, just now. A few minutes ago. How's that?' Oh, yes, perfectly sound. No wooden leg, no false face, nothing at all. Why didn't I what? What the devil's come over your telephone system? Oh, right oftener. Well, I did. Yes, of course. It's what I telephoned for. Sure, be right up. Stacy's voice had been cool and almost expressionless, but his face had softened a little. After he had hung up the telephone, he stood for a moment, gazing abstractedly ahead of him. Then he put on his hat and went out of the hotel. But he did not take a motor bus. Instead, he set off up Fifth Avenue on foot, 
with an easy sauntering gait that was faster than it looked. It was not at all the way Stacy had walked in 1914. It was more graceful and fluent, revealing a perfect, harmonious, and unconscious command of his whole body. As he walked, he stared about him restlessly, but nothing that he saw disturbed the immobility of his face until he reached the triumphal arch at Madison Square. He gazed at this for some time with a most unpleasant expression indeed, then approached it more closely and read the immortal village names inscribed upon it. Oh, damn, he said, and walked quickly to the nearest subway station and took a train for Harlem. Same dingy apartment house, looking a little dingier after five years, same dark elevator, same stuffy hall, and here came Phil and Catherine running down to meet him. Their eagerness touched Stacy. He did not feel himself eager, though he was glad to see them. Well, cried Phil, well, now how, now what, I mean, what can a fellow say in these circumstances? Come along, come on in, hurry up about it and we're so glad said catherine they pushed him into their flat through the dining room into the sitting room and plumped him down in an easy chair a table stood beside it with a pitcher and glasses ice tinkled as the table was jostled saw turn cup phil explained breathlessly gather ye rosebuds and so forth only a short time left you know sole subject of conversation in our great republic here, drink, drink for your altars and your fires. I mean to say, drink, for once dead you never... Oh, no, that isn't it. And he broke out laughing. Catherine was calmer, or anyway more static. She had sat down on an ottoman, elbows on knees, chin in hands, and was gazing up at Stacy. But her face, too, glowed with pleasure. Stacy was smiling faintly. He looked from one to the other, and said to himself that they both looked just the same as four and a half years since. For all that, Phil looked older and more worn, and even a little thinner. "'You're both awfully good to me,' he said. "'We're awfully noisy,' exclaimed Phil remorsefully, sitting down. "'We forget that you're tired.' Stacy lit a cigarette. "'I'm not tired, Phil,' he remarked. "'I never get tired nowadays.' Nothing like military service for keeping one fit, you know, he said dryly, and I'm gladder to see both of you than any other two people in the world. He spoke with an effort. You both all right? Everything going well? The children? Out at their aunt's house in the country, replied Philip, a look of perplexity coming over his face. There was a pause. Then suddenly Catherine spoke, haltingly, with the way she had of being unused to words, but earnestly. "'What does it do to a man, Stacy, as much as all that?' He sighed in relief. "'Wipes him out, Catherine,' he replied in an emotionless voice. "'Replaces him with someone else. Good thing that you saw, because I couldn't possibly keep up the bluff. I can't pretend with you two.' "'Nor with anyone else,' said Catherine. "'Nor with anyone else.' Philip laughed. Well, then, he declared, we have with us today a brand new friend. But Catherine was clearly going to have things over and done with. You mean, she said courageously, that you're glad a little to see us, but not... Not the way I ought to be, only in a vague, uneasy, dead way. Rotten, isn't it? And brutal, and bound to hurt your feelings. But what can you expect? If I were to see a man cut in two by a bus on the avenue, I shouldn't feel anything at all except a little distaste. There you have it. Pretty, isn't it? But the truth, said Catherine, her eyes shining. Yes, Stacy admitted. There's that to be said for it. Philip Blair tugged at his short blond moustache and stared at his friend wistfully. You don't hurt me, Stacy, he said at last and it's not true that you're not fond of us. If it were true, you wouldn't have been so honest. How do I know what they've done to you? You're all seared over. Had to be, I suppose, or die. You'll come back to us. Now, tell us about all the outside things. First with the English. I was with them, first as an NCO, then as a lieutenant, up to June 1917. Then I transferred to our 
Hold on, hold on. You got to the DSO? How? Yes, the DSO, on the Somme, at Bazantine le Grand, for going out with ten men and cleaning up a machine gun nest. I transferred. Damn it all, said Phil, is that the best you can do with it? How did you do it? Stacy shook his head impatiently. And then, he went on, as I said, I transferred to the American army and was made a captain, and I got the DSC for cool leadership and conspicuous bravery in action. A sudden change came over Stacy's face. It woke, as it were, to life, but to sinister life. I'll tell you about that, he said, in a vibrant, passionate voice. I got the DSC for carrying out an order that was sheer murder, for leading my company in a frontal attack against a perfectly worthless position over ground rotten with machine guns. Not half of my men got off clear. A perfectly worthless position, I tell you, that we retired from next day because it wasn't possible to hold, and wouldn't have done us any good if we could have held it. Well, there was capacity for emotion left in Stacy. That was clear. Anyone's first impression of him would have been wrong. The question was, capacity for what emotion? A fierce chill intensity glowed in, or perhaps behind, his face. It died down as swiftly as it had kindled. What a, what a ghastly blunder, Philip Blair murmured. Catherine said nothing. That's what war is, Stacy replied, one blunder after another. The side which makes the most blunders loses. A trite thought, but true. Then the Germans made the most? Oh, by far. Strange, for a while they seemed invincible. Machine perfect. Stacy lit a fresh cigarette. It was the legend they threw out. They might have won, perhaps, if they hadn't grown to believe in it themselves, he remarked almost indifferently. He laid his cigarette down suddenly and smiled. Come, he said, with a hard cheerfulness, I'll tell you about something pleasant. The reason I'm here only now, the reason I didn't get my majority, the reason they packed me off to Italy after the armistice, the one thing I did in the great war that I'll tell my son about. It was in the Argonne, and I was in command of a battalion, had been for a long time. We were in a fairly isolated position. You know what the Argonne was, woods lightly held as to numbers by the enemy. Careful, oh, so careful, machine-gun nests everywhere. We'd had terrible losses, but had plugged on through, little by little. Paused at last, sat still for about a week, being bombarded in a desultory fashion, but comfortable enough, comparatively. This was November. Well, on November 10th, in the morning, I learned something that I hadn't any business to learn that the armistice was coming absolutely, on November 10th at 4 p.m. I received orders to attack the position in front of us, sweet little hill, picture puzzle of machine guns, at 5 a.m. the next morning, November 11th. November 11th! Well, I didn't do it. Stacy's smile disappeared, and his face took on again that intensity that seemed to reveal the presence within him of some single dark absorbing passion. Think of it, he said, the cold-blooded futile murder in such orders, given why? How should I know? Because headquarters didn't care about going through the red tape of changing their prearranged plans, I suppose. Anyhow, he concluded, I didn't obey. I stood out for once against the machine. What did they do to you when they found out? And did the soldiers under you know? cried Phil and Catherine simultaneously. Can't say as to my men. My lieutenants knew. They'd never have split on me. But of course I was found out. There we still were, you see, after the armistice, which came that very day, in the same position as before. My colonel, a decent fellow for a regular army officer, did the least he could under the circumstances relieved me of my command and sent me as liaison officer to italy one being called for about then whole thing very quiet no fuss made i should think not wouldn't i have loved a fuss but the fact remains he said that having set out to make the world a better place to live in 
Wasn't that the way my departure was explained? Not at the time, of course. Then we were to keep our minds neutral. But posthumously, after three years. I return, having made it a place, of no matter what sort, for a hundred young men or so to be alive in. They'd have been rotting in neat little graves but for me. And that's all. I got demobilized over there, eventually, in Italy, and came back a free man in spite of the uniform, on the Dante. And here I am. He leaned back and lit still another cigarette. "'And do you know what people are going to say to you?' asked Catherine, in an odd voice. "'They're going to say, "'Stacy, you smoke too much.' Suddenly she buried her head in her hands, and burst out sobbing. Both men started, and Philip half rose, then sat down again, pulling his moustache, and considering her helplessly. Stacy gazed at her with a kind of grim sadness, as if from an immense distance. "'Forgive me,' she said at last, controlling herself, and wiping her eyes. "'It, it isn't because you're bitter, Stacy.' she went on wearily, after a moment, choosing her words with difficulty. And, oh, not at all because you feel burnt out and unaffectionate. It's, Phil, you tell him, I can't talk. It's because Catherine is tired, said Phil simply. With all that you've been through, it would be too much to ask you to sympathize with what she's been through. But, infinitely less than your experience, that's been a lot, too. She always looked at things squarely, more squarely than I. And what are you going to do when the truth you're seeking comes marching at you with great steps from a long way off and shows itself a bleak, brutal thing? Stacy gazed at his friend with intellectual sympathy at least. Phil went on slowly. We believed in the war, too. Perhaps not quite so ardently as you, but we believed in it. It seemed, in the big essentials, right against wrong. We were told, oh, you know all the things we were told, the dreams we lived on. I know, said Stacy. All to end in this, this bitter, merciless peace, with all the seeds of new wars in it. Well, asked Stacy, when you saw the futile pettiness that revealed itself in men, and the pomposity, and the selfishness, and the greed, he spat the word out, did you expect anything better? Not after a while, no, Phil replied steadily. At first I did, when I saw the heroism. What happened to the war? A great wrong was done. Hundreds of thousands of you went to war nobly to right it. Belgium was invaded, wasn't it? I don't remember, said Stacy. I suppose so. You touched the truth when you said we went to war. What did we go to? Suppose one ant massacred another, and you arranged an earthquake to punish it. That's what happened. You see, a time came, he continued slowly, an odd dazed look in his eyes. About 1916 it began, I should think, when all the surface seemed to have been stripped from life, one layer after another, until there was nothing left showing but universal naked pain. Nothing mattered except this. It was so much bigger than anything else. Belgium didn't matter. Prussian militarism was a word. Love and hate disappeared. Unimportant. Nothing was left but pain. Catherine drew a long breath. And then, she murmured, and then, he returned, you went on existing somehow, impersonally, without any emotions. Are you sure? Phil broke in and without one tattered shred of an illusion left. I made up a story about it once. It must have been in 1916. Imagine a man who has always lived in a house with a roof of beautiful stained glass, and who revels in the soft colours that shine through. One day a tremendous hailstorm comes and shatters the glass to fragments and lets the bleak white daylight pour in. Well, at first the man is heartbroken. But after a little, he thinks, anyway, this is truth. This is real light. I've been living falsely. So he bends down to the marble floor to see what has done the damage. But all he can find is a little pool of dirty water. Philip and Catherine stared at Stacy. The latter shook his head impatiently. But that's all past, he said coolly. 
That was 1916. I give you my word that I don't think about myself at all any more. It's an effort trying to. I haven't any thoughts, and I don't care a rap for anyone, and there isn't anything I want to do, but I'm jolly well not going to do anything I don't want to do. So that's that. Catherine rose. She seemed quite her calm self again. She even smiled, and there was only a slight unsteadiness in her voice when she spoke. "'Oh, no, it isn't, Stacy,' she said. "'You don't want to stay to dinner with us, but you're going to all the same.' He laughed. "'All right,' he assented. End of chapter 1「Chapter I wish, thought Stacy nervously, when, on the afternoon of the next day but one, his train, slowing down, was passing through the suburbs of Vernon. I wish that old things would either die outright or else live. For there in the distance crept by, on its hill, the Endicott School, where he had gone as a boy. Here was a sudden glimpse of the drive, where he had often motored with Marion, and old emotions stirred feebly within him like ghosts of their dead selves. He did not want them. They annoyed him. They had nothing to do with Stacy Carroll, 1919. They made him conscious of himself, that he had a self. They were worse than anything he felt at sight of the small crowd which awaited him as the train swept into the station. Amusement submerged all other feelings then. "'Good Lord!' he exclaimed, "'the conquering hero!' and plunged down into the tumult. There was his father, his face rigid with repressed emotion, his hand shaking Stacy's vigorously and there were half a dozen of his old friends standing back to let the family have free play. And here was his sister, Julie, fatter than in 1914, laughing and crying and kissing him, and trying to talk all at once, while her pleasant-faced husband, Jimmy Prout, smilingly held out a hand across her shoulder and managed to grasp one of Stacy's fingers. Did they really care so much as all this for him? Stacy wondered, with remorse at feeling so little himself. Or was it just the dramatic moment? Then, all at once, his coolness was swept away by a gust of genuine emotion, the last he should have felt, anger and something like horror, for Julie had bent over and lifted high her five-year-old son, and the child had on a tiny khaki uniform and was saluting his uncle solemnly, fingers stiffly touching his overseas cap. "'For God's sake, Julie!' cried Stacy, his face white. The proud smile suddenly vanished from his sister's face. She stared at him in hurt surprise. "'What's the matter, Stacy?' she stammered. "'Don't you like him? Don't you like Junior?' Uh, "'Of course I like him,' he muttered. "'It's just the uniform. Don't put it on him, Julie.' He swung the boy up in his arms. "'Don't salute, old fellow.' he said, sweeping off the little cap from the blonde curls. Give us a kiss. Oh, I thought you'd like it, said Julie wretchedly. I trained him so carefully to salute. It's all right, old girl, said Stacy, putting the child down. His wave of emotion had disappeared. He was vaguely sorry to have hurt his sister's feelings. Other people had crowded up. The station rang with greetings. But, through the insistent pressure forward of Mr. Carroll, Sr., who had hold of his son's arm, Stacy presently found himself at the waiting motor-car, into which the train-porter, thanks to Jimmy Prout's directions, had piled Stacy's bags. "'Good-bye for now,' said Julie, giving her brother another kiss. "'We're going to take Junior home, but we'll be out at Dad's for dinner.' And Stacy was in the tonneau of his father's car, with only his father by his side. The car moved off. Mr. Carroll drew a long breath. Whew, he exclaimed. So you're back at last, son, he said after a moment. Back at last. Deuce of a long time, isn't it? Mr. Carroll nodded gravely. Longer than anyone can imagine. I've missed you terribly, Stacy. The young man found himself wondering. Was it true? 
Was affection a real and vivid thing? He, Stacy, had had his life, such as it was, in these four years and a half. He had not missed his father, save in a mild way now and then. Well, his father, too, had had his own life. His days must have been taken up with business. He must have dined out frequently in the evenings, or have had people to dinner. Had his thoughts truly clung to Stacy? Wasn't it all half a convention? Between a child, helpless, appealing, undeveloped, and a father, protective, tender, apprehensive of a thousand infant dangers, there, indeed, was a poignant relationship. Afterward? Not that Stacy was not fond of his father. He was fond of him, even now, but without pretense, decoration or melodrama. And, though he pursued these idle thoughts in a cool, detached way, he was not quite cool, not quite detached. "'You don't look a day older, Dad,' he said. "'No, I ought to. I feel older, or did, <laughs> till just now.' Mr. Carroll scrutinized his face affectionately. "'You look older, son,' he continued. "'Older in a good sense. Grown up. Surer of yourself. It's made a man of you.' Except for a faint sense of irony, this estimate proved no impression at all on the young man. He was simply not interested in the subject. However, his father pursued it pleasantly. Looking you over, five years ago, a business man would have said, Charming boy, young, fresh, eager, full of ideas, but something of a dreamer. Today, he'd think, there's a strong man that I could put at the head of a big company. Careful, sir, said Stacy. Remember that anything you say may be used against you. I may take you up on that. A sudden gleam shone in Mr. Carroll's eyes. You mean that? he demanded. His son laughed. Don't really know yet. Maybe. Not going back into architecture? Not enough fight in it now, eh? Want something more vigorous. Well, said Stacy, I'm not going back into it. Architecture. At once, anyway. Want to look around a bit first. Can't say that I really know what my reasons are. His answer was strictly truthful. He did not know his reasons, except that he literally couldn't have drawn plans for so much as a barn. His father nodded then, catching sight of a man who was walking briskly along the sidewalk of the street down which the car was gliding, told the chauffeur to stop, and leaning out called, Colin! Oh, Colin! It was Colin Jeffries, president of the smelting works, president of the power plant, vice-president and dictator of the great linseed oil mills, head of a dozen corporations, donor to the city of its art gallery and public library, Vernon's first citizen. A man of fifty-five, vigorous, keen-eyed, clean-shaven but for a short dark moustache. Not at all like Mr. Carroll in features, as like him as one pea to another in expression. My son, Colin, Captain Carroll, you remember him, just got back, wanted you to shake hands with him, D.S.C., for cool leadership and conspicuous bravery in action. I know, said Mr. Jeffries, shaking Stacy's hand warmly and gazing straight into his eyes. Glad to see you back, my boy. Very genuinely glad. Congratulations aren't much, but you have them. We older men, who couldn't go, aren't going to forget what you young men did. Thanks, said Stacy, considering him coolly. It occurred to him that it was quite right of Mr. Jeffries to be grateful, since one thing the young men had done was to make him considerably richer than formerly. However, Stacy did not think this with any bitterness, or accuse the millionaire of a self-interested patriotism, or of anything else. He was simply no longer, as he had once been, impressed by the legend of the man. He merely scrutinized him coldly, from outside, and reserved judgment. There's another reason we're glad to have you back, Mr. Jeffries was saying gravely. You young men have saved the country from one danger. We count on you to save it from another. You'll find, probably, that you've got to keep on saving it. Conditions are chaotic. The country's full of social unrest. You'll see. Mr. Carroll nodded assent emphatically. Malignant forces are at work secretly. It's you boys of the American Legion who will be the greatest factor for good in the country's life for the next generation. Rest? You won't find rest. Do you want it? Not particularly, Mr. Jeffries, 
Stacy replied calmly. Good. Good luck to you. Fine man, Colin, Mr. Carroll observed, as the car moved off again. A great citizen and a true friend. Not a stain on his reputation. Stacy did not contradict the assertion, even inwardly. He merely reserved judgment, and was not especially interested in what the result of it would be. The only positive comment he passed, to himself, was that Mr. Jeffreys talked rather like an orator on a platform. "'Oh, by Jove!' exclaimed Mr. Carroll suddenly. "'I completely forgot. Selfish of me. Marion called me up, and asked me to tell you that she wouldn't expect you to-night, said she realized the family had first rights to you, but would look for you to-morrow afternoon, three-thirty. Considerate of her, though hard on you, perhaps. Nice girl, Marion, very. Showed uncommon good sense in not coming to the station. But Mr. Carroll would have been dismayed, had he known the effect his apologetic explanatory remarks produced upon his son. They weighed Stacy down for it is the extraordinary truth that not once since Stacy descended from the train had the thought of Marion crossed his mind, and that to have had it recalled to him now was burdensome. However, he recovered quickly from the sudden feeling of depression, for, being totally without any scheme of life, he lived from day to day, and met problems only as they arose. Marion was tomorrow's problem. He shook it off. "'Thank you,' he said. "'It's right of her.' Of course I want this evening at home with you. But when finally they were at home, Stacy and his father found little to say to each other. Mr. Carroll was full of the nervous restlessness of repressed affection, bustled about, made his son a cocktail, which Stacy drank with relish, and finally threw himself down in a chair and lit a cigar, though it was close to dinner time. Stacy was more self-possessed, though he could not be entirely self-possessed in this house, where all the edges of things and thoughts were blurred by memories out of childhood. He was able to recognize clearly, with no more than a touch of sadness, that at bottom he and his father had little in common. Stacy felt that he ought to be expansive, communicative, but he simply could not be. Besides, he had nothing to communicate. Yet, if Stacy revealed no characteristic for which he may be loved, he did reveal one for which he may be admired, self-control. For when his father asked him, almost shyly, about the action in which he had won his American decoration, Stacy told the story of it, quietly, artistically, handsomely, with even a smile on his lips, as one might tell the story of Thermopylae or Bunker Hill, while all the time his eyes, that gazed off across his father's shoulder, were seeing the unendurable picture of the real thing. It was an achievement. When the tale was finished, the older man drew a long breath. "'By Jove!' he exclaimed in a low voice, mingled admiration and envy showing in his face. "'To live through moments like those! Wonderful! Moments you'll never forget!' But Stacy, who had risen and was leaning against the empty fireplace, gave an odd sound like a strangled laugh. He crossed the room to a tall window, flung it wide open, and surreptitiously wiped a drop of perspiration from his forehead. Then he turned back. "'Make me another cocktail, Dad,' he said. "'Do. We couldn't get gin like that in Italy.' It was a relief to Stacy when Julie and her husband arrived for he craved of his sister now precisely what had irked him in her formerly, her apparent absence of any inner life, and her absorbed occupation with externals. If any one had protested that she probably did have an inner life, he would have assented cheerfully. He simply did not want to know about it, or about anyone else's. The Prouts were a little late. Julie was always a little late and Mr. Carroll, who had been fidgeting with increased exasperation, greeted his daughter wrathfully. "'Confound it, Julie! Can't you be on time for once in a way? Isn't it as easy to get here at seven as at seven ten? "'Well, now, Daddy, it wasn't my fault,' said Julie, her voice and eyes full of hurt innocence, while her husband grinned. "'I was all ready, and then at the very last moment—' "'Pshaw!' her father interrupted. If only you wouldn't always have an excuse. Come on in. Everything will be cold, of course. And such things put Stacy in good humor. 
Indeed, among them he enjoyed himself more than later, when the first two courses had been served, and his father was ready for conversation. "'Poor Jimmy!' Julie was saying. "'He was so unhappy not to get across. After he'd gone through officers' training camp, they sent him to Camp Grant, and just kept him there the whole time. He was so mad, weren't you, Jimmy?' Well, said her husband pleasantly, it was a good deal of a bore to go through all that training and never have a chance to use it. Oh, it'll come in handy for the next war, Stacy observed. Oh, Stacy, his sister cried, you don't think there's going to be another? Stacy laughed. I was only trying to comfort you, Julie. Thought from the way you spoke you'd like to give Jimmy a chance. Just think of it. There he'd be on a big white horse, waving his sword and charging the enemy, with all his men following him and cheering madly. Wouldn't you like that? Jimmy grinned at his brother-in-law, but Julie shook her head soberly, though perhaps she was only playing at being as ingenious as all that. No, she said firmly, I wouldn't. Jimmy plays a good game of golf, but he's no use at all on a horse. Never was. And I think it would be nice enough, now, for him to have got across, and have had a medal, like you, Stacy dear, so that I could say, I don't think you've met my husband, Mrs. Jones. You see, he's been in France for two years. Oh, yes, D.S.C., of course. But at the time, I never did want him to go, not for a minute. The two young men laughed again. Stacy considered his sister's point of view human, straightforward, and sensible. Where was the good, he wondered swiftly, in going through a lot of complicated emotions, since, if you were honest, you always ended in just such simplicity. It was a lot better to be simple, in the first place, and stay so. But Mr. Carroll, who was in the midst of a swallow of claret, gulped suddenly, choked, and set his glass down with a bump. That, he said angrily, is about as silly and weak and unpatriotic as anything I've ever heard you say, Julie. I can't help it, Dad, Julie returned meekly. It's the way I really feel. Then you should keep still about it. Nice sort of part we should have played in the war if every wife had taken that attitude. Stacy, who thought his sister was being badly scolded for no reason at all, gave her a sly, friendly smile, at which her face brightened. She recovered so quickly, indeed, and her husband had shown throughout such absence of any discomfort that Stacy concluded Julie must be inured to this sort of harshness. He tried to remember whether his father had always been so sharp with her, but couldn't. Jimmy would have had his chance, no doubt, Mr. Carroll remarked, if the war had lasted a few months longer, as it should have. He frowned. I believe, he went on solemnly, that the armistice will prove to be the biggest disaster the world has ever known. And he looked about him fiercely. The first time that Stacy had heard this sentiment expressed, at tea in Rome, at the house of an elderly American gentleman whom everyone cultivated because he mysteriously always had butter and sugar, he had first felt genuine horror, and then immediately had flown into a white ungovernable rage, during which he said things that had reduced the kindly old gentleman, who was used to having everyone pleasant, to a state of helpless trembling discomfort. However, by now Stacy was growing used to the sentiment. It had been mentioned, for instance, on the boat, and the smoking-room of the Pullman car had run with it. It no longer produced in him any emotion save a weary scorn. "'I'd like to have seen the Huns get a taste of their own medicine,' Mr. Carroll continued, his eyes gleaming beneath their heavy white eyebrows. "'Only a month or two more of the war, and they'd have seen their soil invaded, their towns in flames, and the Allies would have marched into Berlin. Now hear them talk. They don't know they're beaten.' "'I dare say they suspected it when they handed over their fleet,' said Stacy calmly. "'You don't agree with me, son?' Mr. Carroll exclaimed. Stacy shook his head. "'It would have cost thousands of lives more,' he remarked, helping himself to almonds. "'Not so many, not so many,' his father insisted. "'Some,' said Stacy. "'However,' he added in a dry voice, "'to do our leaders justice, I don't think they gave that point undue importance. The truth was, we'd have had to pause pretty soon anyway. 
our troops were fagged our lines of communication were impossibly long and we'd shot off most of our ammunition a pause would have given the germans a chance to fall back on a nice short line all prepared for them and it would have taken another tremendous battle to break through again and there was winter already upon us mr carroll had followed his son's words attentively well of course he said that's different i'm not a military man and i don't pretend to have become an expert strategist like most of my friends at the club they'll amuse you stacy all the same it's an outrage that the germans should get off scot-free and after this the subject of the war was dropped for a while julie related personal gossip agreeably and jimmy prout told an amusing story about an eccentric client of his and stacy listened with interest to both of them but he observed that his father did not listen mr carroll did pay his son-in-law a perfunctory semblance of attention but he made no pretense of even hearing what his daughter said and he cut short her account of a country club feud with a sudden irrelevant remark accompanied by an impatient frown we passed colin jeffreys on the way home jimmy he said and stopped to speak with him he said a few words to stacy about the rottenness of conditions over here today, about what we've all got to face jimmy's good-humoured countenance became sober he nodded yes he said it's pretty fierce but mr carroll had turned again to his son the whole country's full of social unrest he went on angrily you've no idea stacy all the lazy worthless have-nots are up in arms against the haves and our damned government pets them and plays right into their hands not a bit of respect for the men who've made the country what it is you'll see i've seen something of it abroad stacy remarked what do you expect you have four years and a half of universal war positively guaranteed to turn the world into heaven and then it ends with the world even less heavenly than before of course you get unrest he had spoken idly enough without much thought as to what he had said save that he exercised care not to plunge into the question truly but he was not really apathetic he was curious about the intensity of feeling his father displayed no but i'm talking about definite concrete unjustifiable demonstrations of unrest mr carroll continued shaking off generalities here you have labor the one real profiteer in the war getting more and more more than it ever got far more than its share yet always increasing its demands always doing less work why it takes three men nowadays to get through a piece of work that one man could do a few years ago bolshevism sheer bolshevism julie bravely ventured a remark you remember harry baird stacy she said with a little laugh he's a contractor you know well he says that nearly all his men drive up to work in their own fords stacy laughed too though he kept his eyes on his father's face mr carroll seemed to have relapsed into his former state of indignant meditation now i ask you julie concluded what more do they want why stacy observed lightly they probably want to drive up in packards you see if you've had power that is to say if you've had money for a long time you don't much care whether you ride around in a packard or a ford oh i care julie broke in a ford is awfully jolty yes you care because one is more comfortable what i mean to say is that a packard isn't to you a belligerent symbol that you're as good as anybody else i dare say it is to the laborer but mr carroll had emerged from his thoughts and was looking at stacy keenly son he said soberly you've done your duty heroically you've gone through a tremendous ordeal and you've gone through it without flinching don't go back on what's right now will you keep on going straight don't let yourself get infected with bolshevism you're not are you stacy considered his father thoughtfully and with a faint but genuine sadness almost the only touch of a soft emotion he had felt since his arrival for though the remarks to julie had been careless and superficial they had just grazed the outside of something in which he really believed as much as he believed in anything and it was precisely these remarks which had alarmed mr carroll stacy could not make his father out and still less did he make himself out but whatever his father was and whatever he himself was 
it was clear that an impassable gulf lay between them. They had nothing in common save affection and memories. Therefore, when he answered his father, he did so as gently and circumspectly as the truth, his one remaining God, would permit. Which was rare, since in general he was careless enough of others' feelings. "'Why, no, Dad,' he said slowly, smiling at his father, "'I don't believe I'm tainted with Bolshevism. I know almost nothing about it, and don't trust what I do know. Propaganda for, propaganda against, that's all we're getting, not facts. In so far as I can make out the theory, I don't like it, too crushing for the individual. What we want is more individualism than before the war, not less. But I think it's a mistake to hate a word, because hate reveals fear. One ought not to be afraid of anything. Now you've probably got all kinds of unrest over here, just as everywhere else. Some of it, I dare say, is right, some wrong. Mere abuse of power. Well, nobody ever yet had power without abusing it. The teachers in your schools, the professors in your colleges, the salaried clerks in your offices, are restless, poor things, as well as the laborers in your factories, and the men who deliver your coal. What I'm trying to say is that these are all different kinds of restlessness. Don't go and lump them together and give them a name and then shudder or get angry at it. You're drilling your enemies that way, handing them out a uniform, and urging a lot of your friends to join them. There's a lot in what you say, Stacy, said Jimmy Prout. We've enough enemies without adding to them unnecessarily. I'm all for the school teachers myself. As for Mr. Carroll, he had sat silently, gnawing at his grey moustache, during Stacy's discourse, and he remained, now that it was over, still appearing to reflect upon it. But at the sound of a sharp pop behind him, he started, shook his head as though to rid himself of troubles, and watched the champagne being poured into his glass. Good, he cried, with a smile that softened his firm, handsome face, and rose to his feet. Here's to Stacy, DSO, DSC, and my son. Thank God he's back home again, with his duty accomplished. End of chapter 2「Chapter Three of the Lonely Warrior » by Claude C. Washburn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The evening, pleasant as it was, left Stacy with a feeling of emptiness. When he had finally said good-night to his father and gone upstairs to his own study, he wandered about it restlessly, smoking cigarettes and staring blankly at one after another of the objects with which he had once affectionately filled it. Everything and everyone, he said to himself, were just the same, or almost. It was inconceivable. He had gone through something that had destroyed every particle of his former self, and now he came back to just what he had left. Not, he reflected, that he wanted his people changed, certainly not in the way he was changed, whatever that was. What the devil did he want? Well, for one thing, he would rather like to be able to feel a little more. Toward Phil and Catherine Blair, for example. He knew that he had treated them badly. What sort of gratitude had he returned them for their open-hearted welcome? He shrugged his shoulders. He couldn't help it. It was all he had felt. Nevertheless, even though only intellectually, he was sorry. And all at once he found something he could do about it, and felt immediate relief. To do something had become his sole means of relief in any situation. He sat down at the desk in his study and drew out paper and ink. Then he paused for a moment, reflecting. Of course he might be mistaken about it. Phil might be prospering. He remembered that he hadn't even asked. But he shook his head. No, the signs were clear enough. And if he was mistaken, it would anyway do no harm to write. He dashed off the brief letter at once, never pausing for the best word or expression. Dear Phil, it has occurred to me that under present building conditions you might be having rather a struggle of it on your own in New York. I'm writing to know whether you would consider coming out here for a time, or permanently, if you can stand the place. I think I could find you a job with my old firm. You'd be a great acquisition for them. You'd bring a little more vulgarity into our—what's the word? etiolated architecture. 
and you could live through this difficult and expensive period without worrying how to make both ends meet. Of course I know what your independence means to you, and I may be all wrong in assuming that you would consider abandoning it temporarily, but I figure that when the difficulty of existence passes a certain mark, it becomes absorbing to the point of destroying most of one's real life and that this mark is pretty sure to be passed by any young man trying to be an architect on his own in New York City today. I'll add a postscript tomorrow morning after I've seen Parkins, the head of my firm. Good night. Yours, Stacy. Stacy glanced the letter through swiftly, folded and addressed it, and laid it on the desk. Then he went to bed and fell asleep at once. Waking early the next morning, he did not lie still through those moments of delicious indolence in which most men indulge themselves, but slipped out of bed immediately and into his cold bath. His body responded to the shock glowingly. It was magnificently fit. The muscles of his back and abdomen rippled smoothly as he rubbed himself with the rough towel. One would justly have admired Stacy as a healthy, handsome animal and it may be that his obstinate distaste for speculation, his barely conscious, undeliberate desire to avoid thought, arose out of his animal instinct of self-preservation, was but the deep determination not to allow his strong sane body to be affected by his sick and twisted mind. He took from the closet a pre-war suit of his, a soft grey civilian suit, and in regarding it felt a keener joy than he had felt in stepping off the steamer, or in seeing Phil and Catherine, or in drinking champagne last evening, a keener joy, alas, than he felt when he had donned the clothes, for they did not seem natural and easy to his militarized body. Then he went downstairs and out of doors into the well-kept garden. It was still only seven o'clock, and nobody was about, not even his father, who was an early riser but Mr. Carroll did presently appear. "'Well, you are changed, Stacy,' he called jovially, as he drew near through the tall rose bushes. "'Seems to me I remember the time when for you to get down to eight o'clock breakfast was... Hello!' And he surveyed his son critically. "'Back in civilian clothes already, eh?' he observed meditatively. "'Well, that's right, I suppose. You are a civilian again, of course.' and I don't think much of these lads who go flaunting their uniforms about for months after they're out of the service, determined to wring the last drop of credit from their performance of duty. Still, he paused, well, he concluded cheerfully, there's one thing. You can put on all the civilian clothes you like, but nobody with half an eye would be deceived. You don't look like a civilian. You look like a soldier. Damn it all, said Stacy, exasperated, I know I do. His father laughed. Come on in to breakfast. Do you still eat that idiotic excuse for a meal you used to? Coffee and two bites of a roll? No, said Stacy. I eat bacon, eggs, fish, anything I get. By Jove, you have improved, Mr. Carroll exclaimed with another laugh. After breakfast, Stacy drove into town with his father, but left him at the door of the Carroll building and walked briskly along the street until he came to the building in which Parkins and May, the architects with whom he had worked before the war, had their offices. He was asked his business formally by the office boy, new since his time, but waved him aside and opened the door of Mr. Parkins' private room a little way. Yes, said Mr. Parkins. Oh, by the Lord, it's Stacy Carroll. Come in, come in, he cried, rising and holding out his hand. Stacy was pleased at the welcome. There exists between people who have worked hard together a camaraderie, approaching affection, but pleasanter since it makes no demands on expression. Stacy felt it for the men of his battalion. He had forgotten that he felt it for anyone else. The rediscovery was a small pleasant surprise. He shook the architect's hand cordially. Of course I saw by the paper this morning that you were back, Mr. Parkins was saying, but I'm blessed if I expected you to get around here today. Thought I'd drop in, said Stacy, collapsing lightly into a chair. How are you? And he scrutinized the older man's shrewd, clean-shaven face, which showed around the eyes little worried wrinkles, 
brought there by the perpetual endeavor to reconcile clients' ideas with some modicum of architectural consistency. "'Pretty well, pretty well,' Mr. Parkins replied. "'These have been lean years, as you know. No building to speak of. But we've got all we can do again now, and more too, even though the cost of material and labor is so high you'd think it would be prohibitive. But a good many people have made a good deal of money, and, after all, houses have got to be built. There aren't enough to go around. We surely can use you, Stacy. Hmm, said Stacy. Sorry to disappoint you, but I'm out of the running for a while. Not coming back. You're not? Oh, now, look here. May and I talked it over and decided we'd offer you a junior partnership right off the bat, and now you... What's wrong? You're awfully kind, said Stacy, but honestly I can't, and I swear I don't know why. I give you my word I couldn't draw plans for a billboard at present. Fiddlesticks. Sorry, Stacy remarked, but that's the way it is. He smiled ironically. All this returned soldier restlessness stuff, you know. Mr. Parkins considered him closely. Now what have you gone and done to yourself? He observed at last. You look like Stacy Carroll, yet you don't seem quite like him. I believe, he added with a laugh, I really believe I'm half afraid of you. You're a... Little changeling, yes, said Stacy, bored. Now listen, Mr. Parkins, he went on quickly, there's something I want to ask you to do for me. It'll be a favor to me and a good turn to yourself at the same time. And he stated Philip Blair's case without mentioning his name. Well, said Mr. Parkins thoughtfully, it might be done, of course. We'll need a new man, since you're not coming back for now. Confound you! But what we need is a good safe man. Is your friend... What's his name, by the way? Philip Blair. Mr. Parkins uttered an exclamation. Oh, I've seen his work, he said. Happened on a perfect wonder of a library he did in a small New York town. The villagers disliked it immensely. I asked about him afterward. He's the real thing. But the idea of your recommending him to me as a safe man, it's outrageous. He'll be as safe as you like, Stacy insisted. Five years of what he's been trying to do would have crushed the danger out of an anarchist. Try him. Well, said Mr. Parkins, I will. I'll try him, because I think it's a shame a man like that should be so hard-pressed but I know I'm making a mistake. You can write, Blair, that if he wants to come, I'll give him twenty-five hundred a year on a year's trial. An odd spasm contracted Stacy's features, but passed at once. Oh, but I say, he protested, in a dead, emotionless voice, you were giving me four thousand before the war. Mr. Parkins shook his head. I'll make it three thousand, but not a cent beyond, he said firmly. Philip Blair's a genius. A genius isn't worth more than three thousand to me. Stacy laughed. I like the implication, he observed. So he added a postscript to his letter and sent it off to Phil. At three-thirty precisely, Stacy was at Marion's house. He knew he had a problem to face, since it was unfortunately true that he had no love left for Marion and did not desire to marry either her or anyone else but he had no plan, and he had not said to himself that he would not marry her. He had not said anything at all to himself. He merely went to her house as per schedule. All that he felt was a sense of something burdensome, and just a little faint curiosity. After all, he had loved this girl once upon a time. That was it. Once upon a time, exactly expressed it. It was the way you began fairy tales. He was relieved, if so slender an emotion can be called relief, that it was not Marion who opened the door of the house to him. He had been a little afraid that Marion herself would welcome him with an impetuous rush, but the door was opened by a maid, and not even the one the Latimers had had in the old days, at which also Stacy somehow felt relief. He went into the drawing-room, hoping to find Mrs. Latimer there for, besides feeling that her presence would put off the demand for emotional moments, he really did want to see her. But she was not there. The room was empty. He went over and stood with his back to the fireplace and looked around him, 
an odd smile drawing at one corner of his mouth. For again he was feeling the weak, futile tug of old discarded emotions. These vases and chairs and statuettes, the whole familiar setting of the room, reminded him of what he had once felt in their presence, which is the same as saying, what he had once been. Stacy was like a boat floating on the water, almost solitary, almost loose, but not quite, still attached by a frayed cord or two to his old self. But the portieres at one end of the room were parted gently, and Marion stood between them. Stacy caught the soft sound and saw her at once, but, as he gazed at her, he continued to smile the same smile. Nevertheless, what he felt was mixed. He was straightforwardly contemptuous of her melodramatic behavior, unexpectedly struck by her fine beauty, and stirred uneasily by memories. Well, that half-pleasurable discomfort is all that most long-parted lovers truly feel on meeting again, no matter how earnestly in letters they may have lashed their old emotion to keep it awake. But, since even though changed, they are still they, the discomfort readily grows again to love in the renewed proximity. Not with Stacy. He was no longer Stacy Carroll, 1914. He was a different person. His discomfort faded, flickered, and went out, all in the brief moment of silence. "'You certainly are beautiful, Marion,' he said appreciatively, but without moving. "'Well,' she returned, with a ripple of laughter, "'I'm glad you still think so, and feel so sure of it.' She moved slowly forward a few steps toward him. His mind was quite clear now and working swiftly. He thought rapidly that five years ago this demeanor of Marion's would have set his heart to throbbing with delight. He would have likened Marion to a shy, half-tamed bird, fond yet afraid of being caught. What an idiot he had been! Today he coldly found her behavior absurdly affected. All these little airs and graces! Fiddlesticks! But, far more strongly than admiration of Marion's beauty and cool scorn of her coquetry, Stacy was feeling elation, because it was now obvious to him that she did not love him, probably had never loved him. Frank love would not accord with these mincing ways. Yet with all this only a few seconds of silence elapsed. Stacy crossed the room to a divan and threw himself down easily into one corner of it. "'Come on over here, Marion,' he said comfortably. She stood still and looked at him, half archly, half in a puzzled way. "'Stacy, you are—you are you are the most ardent lover!' she exclaimed. "'And you,' he retorted calmly. "'Let's sit down and talk over our passion.' Marion flushed and gave something like a pettish stamp of her small foot. "'I won't,' she cried. "'Then don't,' he returned with a laugh. However, she seemed to think better of it, for she did come slowly to the couch and perched herself on the end opposite Stacy. She sat there gazing at him, one foot on the upholstery, elbow on knee, her small pointed chin resting in her cupped hand. Stacy, still smiling, considered her. "'You're perfect like that,' he said sincerely. "'Some Greek sculptor of the fourth century, no, the third, ought to have carved you.' "'Stacy, don't you love me any longer?' she asked softly. "'Do you love me?' She started up. "'You're horrid!' she cried furiously. "'Each time that I ask you a question, you ask me one in return. I've waited for you nearly five years, and this afternoon I looked forward to your coming and sent everybody out of the house, and then when you come you look at me as though I were an objet de art and laugh at me laugh coldly at me not at you marion he said quietly i couldn't laugh at you i find i don't know you at all come forgive me for being rude let's talk everything over soberly she sat down again and looked at him hostily i see now why you didn't write oftener she said haughtily i thought it was because you were too busy fancy no you don't see he replied, and it's difficult for me to explain, because I don't understand very well myself. Also, the subject's distasteful to me, but I owe it to you to try to explain. I think you do, she said icily. 
he nodded, unimpressed by her tone. "'It's like this,' he went on, with an effort. "'You've got to see me straight, and if I'm brutal, why, so much the better for you. I'm not only not the laurel-crowned knight of your flattering princess's fancy, I'm not even the person I really was before I went away. Every bit of sweetness and light has been burned out of me. I don't get delicate soft sensations out of anything any more. The overtones that you love don't exist for me. Nothing has any glamour. All I can see in life is a mess of bare conflicting facts, stark and naked." Stacy had forgotten Marion. His eyes glowed and there was a stern beauty in his face. Yet he was only leaning abhorrently over the upper edge of the well. He missed almost everything of importance. While he spoke, the girl's features had lost their expression of chill aloofness. Her lips were parted now, and she gazed at him as though fascinated. "'And if I tell you that I don't love you,' he concluded fiercely, "'I can honestly swear that it's just that I don't, can't, love anyone or anything. My saying so shouldn't hurt anything but your pride, because you don't love me either.' She leaned toward him ever so little. "'How do you know I don't love you?' she demanded softly. "'Because you create a setting, play a game, surround our meeting with little tricks,' he returned, quite unmoved by her coaxing grace. She gazed at him intently, her breath coming and going rapidly. "'Then you don't, you truly don't, even want to kiss me?' she asked. He returned her gaze. Her coquetry did not stir him. Her beauty did. "'Yes,' he said somberly, "'of course I do. But not because I find you shy and alluring. I don't. Just because you're beautiful, and desire is a fact.' He seized her small wrists and drew her toward him slowly. She struggled fiercely at first, but then, when her face was close to his, yielded suddenly and returned his kiss. "'Now don't you love me, Stacy?' she murmured. "'No.' he cried, releasing her. Nor you me. She rose and smoothed her hair. You look precisely like a Tanagra, he said admiringly. If you say anything more of that sort, she burst out, I shall hate you. You'll do that anyway, he replied. She gazed at him strangely, an expression of cruelty in her fine mouth. Ames Price has been imploring me for two years now to marry him she said slowly. I think I'll do it. Would you mind, Stacy? Mind? Of course I'd mind. Animal jealousy, too, is a fact. Nasty fact, like all the rest of them. But go ahead and marry him, if you'll be happy with him. Her eyes shone for a moment with triumph. Then she laughed musically. What a weird afternoon, she observed, and pressed a bell in the wall. Come, let's have tea. You're quite Byronic, Stacy. Well, she was a sentimentalist, no doubt, but she was no fool, Stacy admitted to himself. Come to think of it, he was being Byronic in his intense antagonistic desire to stand alone, freed from all ties. End of chapter 3「Chapter Four of the Lonely Warrior by Claude C. Washburn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mr. Latimer was talking, although it was early afternoon and therefore not his best hour. The supreme importance of the arts, he said, is poise. There is no poise in life itself. Life is mere tumult and shouting, and since there is no poise, there is no meaning. The arts hover above the hurly-burly, dipping down into it a little for delicate nourishment, but no more of it than a cloud, which sucks its constituent vapour from the earth, is of the earth. In the country of the arts there is quiet. That is to say, he added dryly, there was. The arts at the moment have ceased to exist, and with them has vanished all that we possessed of value. No doubt, Stacy assented politely. But the beautifully enunciated phrases really gave him a feeling of contempt for Mr. Latimer, and he wondered how he could ever have admired this polished esthete. His glance wandered to Marion, the only other person in the room, her mother being out somewhere, 
who was curled up in a large chair on the other side of her father. Stacy considered the girl's face attentively. She stirred him by her beauty, especially when seen thus, motionless, carved, yet left him, when everything was summed up, feeling actively hostile. Mr. Latimer had taken a small vase from the mantel-shelf, and was toying with it abstractedly. Leisure, he remarked, is anathema to Americans, yet leisure is all there is of importance. It is what all men strive to attain through labour, but, having attained, are incapable of supporting. It is too noble for their tawdry energetic minds, and they hasten to fill it up with meaningless movement. They even, I am told, go to witness what they call photo-plays, where, though themselves sitting still, they can enjoy a vicarious restlessness and be saved from the leisure they dread. How false an understanding of life! Or, rather, what complete lack of any understanding! The goal of life itself is, after all, just the eternal leisure of the grave. An admirable epigram, said Stacy, with no hint of expression in his face. I cannot make out whether it belongs spiritually in the eighteenth century or in the nineties of the last century. In any case it does not belong in the twentieth, Mr. Latimer returned, a touch of irascibility in his voice. Nor do I. He set the vase down again with a bump. I must go, he said. I have an appointment, and here in America everyone is always on time. And he left them. Marian uncurled herself gracefully. "'Papa is cross,' she observed with a laugh. "'It is only three o'clock, you see. He does not approve of early afternoon. Let's go to the library, Stacy. I don't like this room.' And she danced off up the stairs, he following. She half knelt on a window-seat in the library and gazed out, her mood seeming to change suddenly from hard to soft. "'The clouds drift and drift.' she said dreamily, and sometimes they're majestic and white, with purple shadows, as now, and sometimes they're black and terrible, and sometimes mere little pale ghosts of clouds, but they're always clouds. They haven't anything to do with real majesty or terror or ghosts. Can one say real ghosts, Stacy? Only clouds. They just drift and drift. I think I'd like to be a cloud." "'Why shouldn't you want to?' he observed callously. "'It's your father's theory all over again.' She whirled around, her face mischievous. "'Oh, how funny you are, Stacy! You won't care for me any more. You'll damn anything I do or say. You're an enemy, out and out. Oh, yes, you are. Yet you'd be glad enough to kiss me this very minute.' "'Yes,' he admitted angrily. "'But you're not going to.' she said with haughtiness. Not now or ever. She smiled. Ames Price is coming to see me tonight. Shall I let him kiss me? It would make him so happy. I think it's my duty to. Come, let's sit down and talk of duty, Stacy. And so she kept it up, as full of witchery as Circe, dazzling in the bright rapid flash of her moods, swift and lovely as a swallow, soft at one moment and clouded, brilliant and gem-like the next. Yet, through it all, Stacy, though he talked freely enough, was cold, distant, and bored. He was like a man watching a sorceress draw circles and pentagons in the sand and murmur incantations. No spirits responded. No enchantment ensued. It was merely laborious lines and words, silly child's play. The only thing that interested him, a little, in the performance, was the question of whether or not it was deliberate. Stacy had continued to go daily to see Marian. He remained unmoved by almost everything in her that had formerly delighted him. There was no longer any magic, any mystery. Yet he desired to be near her. Something she did give him. But as to what it was, he did not inquire. It was a strange relationship but it is possible that Marian found it piquant. She seemed fascinated by Stacy, now that he was indifferent to her. At last the girl sank lightly down upon an ottoman near the young man's feet, and gazed up at him, as on that day years before, when he had come to tell her he was going to the war. 
"'You're the oddest person, Stacy," she said, her eyes shining. "'Just like a great rock, a handsome rock. Why do you come to see me? You don't need to, you know. You've broken our engagement, and my heart,' she continued elfishly. "'I shall tell everyone that you have. It will be in the newspapers. Returned hero breaks girl's heart.' This was better. There was something cool and hard in this that appealed to Stacy, wakened a sense of surface comradeship in him. Hmm, he remarked, smiling. Your heart seems to be doing pretty well, if you've got one. Have you got one, Marian? That's a horrid habit you've acquired, Stacy, she said gaily, of never answering a question, but always asking another. I asked you why you came to see me. Well, since you won't tell me, I'll tell you. You come to see me just as you'd go to see the Parthenon." The smile faded from his face. By Jove she was right. Stacy Carroll, 1914, had been intelligently introspective. Stacy Carroll, 1919, could always be surprised if someone told him truth about himself. Also annoyed, generally, but not this time. Yes, that was it, he supposed. The bodily fact of Marian wakened his atrophied sense of beauty, but differently than in the old days, austerely, save for the touch of desire. Now, when you can see things as straight as that, why do you go in so for everything rococo? he demanded harshly. Why do you embroider and sentimentalize? She gazed at him, her mouth compressed, her eyes brilliant with anger, which was certainly justified. Then her expression changed, and she shrugged her shoulders gracefully. "'So you see,' she said calmly, "'you were just asking a silly, careless question a moment ago. You don't care whether I have a heart or not.' She smiled again. "'What an odd pair we are,' she went on. "'Poor me, not engaged any longer, deserted after all these years.' You must be sure not to tell Papa until you've given me time to get engaged to someone else. Ames Price, I think you said I might marry. Papa would be too awfully angry. Why? Stacy asked. Is he so anxious to be rid of you? But at this Marian only laughed without replying. Stacy had, of course, seen Mr. and Mrs. Latimer more than once by this time. His old admiration for Marian's father had gone, like so many other things. He found Mr. Latimer a cultivated, futile gentleman, with an interest in baubles and a talent for intelligent monologue. The only thing about him that awakened any interest in Stacy was a kind of irascibility that Stacy did not remember as formally characteristic of him. Mr. Latimer was really sharp at times, in a suave, polished way, with his daughter and his wife. But Mrs. Latimer, though she had certainly aged, had clearly not done so because of such trifles, for she bore her husband's occasional petty outbursts with a pleasant detached tolerance. They might have been the outbursts of characters in a book she was reading, for all the effect they appeared to have on her. She had welcomed Stacy with quiet happiness, and he had felt at once a comfort in her presence which he felt in that of no one else. Yet she had said nothing of importance to him, had talked of externals even the time or two that they had found themselves alone together for a few minutes. He left the Latimer house rather early on the afternoon of this unsatisfactory interview with Marian. Something about Marian antagonized him strongly, even now that he was surely free, so that the impulse he felt to seek her society repeatedly in this way revealed a bond of some inexplicable sort and irked him. He walked swiftly north till he came to the handsome park, the entrance to which lay at no great distance from the Latimer home. And, plunging into the green shady paths, he felt a sudden relief. To cut loose from it all, all streets, all men, to be free. There was no joy for him in the full-leafed June beauty of the trees, or in the bird songs among them. No call to comradeship, quite otherwise. It was solely as release that he instinctively welcomed them. Striding aimlessly onward in this mood, 
Stacy suddenly heard his name called, and swung about quickly to see Mrs. Latimer sitting on a bench at the edge of the path he followed, and waving a green parasol at him. "'I couldn't help calling to you,' she said pleasantly, "'though I oughtn't to. You look so splendidly alone, as though you didn't want to see anyone.' "'Oh, but yes,' he returned. "'I'm glad to see you. No one else but you.' And he sat down on her bench. "'Now what old woman could help having her head turned by that?' she exclaimed with a smile. He scrutinized her face. Yes, she had grown older, he thought, but not ignominiously, in some way that made age seem of value. Even in regard to her, Stacy was not curious as to what experiences of body or soul lay beneath the changes her face showed, but he accepted what she was as a gracious fact. "'Where have you come from, Stacy?' she asked. "'From your house,' he replied, with an acid smile. "'Oh,' she observed, "'so that's why you are marching along with the air of being so glad to be alone. Have you broken—I mean, have you and Marion broken off your engagement?' "'Yes,' said Stacy coolly. "'I believe so.' After this they were silent for a while. "'Oh!' he observed suddenly, as an afterthought, but really with some little touch of human sentiment. "'I hope you won't feel hurt. I should be sorry to hurt you.' "'I?' Mrs. Latimer exclaimed. "'Gracious, no. I'm immensely relieved. I wouldn't have had you and Marion marry for anything in the world.' Stacy did not know whether she was being a vixenish mother-in-law or an unnatural mother, but he found her remark amusing, taken either way and laughed. She laughed with him, but more gaily. "'Oh,' he added after a moment, "'I forgot. Marion says we must be sure not to let Mr. Latimer know at present.' "'Of course not,' said Mrs. Latimer, as though it were too elementary a truth to deserve mention. "'Marion's much more intelligent than you ever gave her credit for being,' she added an instant later. "'Yes, I know that,' Stacy admitted freely even though he did not see the present application of the remark, or, indeed, why both Marion and her mother deemed it essential that Mr. Latimer should not learn that the engagement was off. "'Naturally,' said Mrs. Latimer thoughtfully, poking holes in the gravel with the tip of her parasol, "'I could see that things were not the same as once. Well, that was to be expected. I shouldn't have been at all surprised to have you show a kind of a fond indifference to Marion.' but what I don't understand, there's so much I don't understand about you, Stacy, is the positive hostility I felt sometimes in the looks you gave her. It was as though you hated her. Why? Poor Marion, she's just the same as always. Is that itself, her sameness, the reason? No, Stacy muttered, of course not. I don't know why. Can't you find out why? she asked gently. Stacy reflected, painfully and with resentment at the need. Finally he drew his hand across his forehead and looked at Mrs. Latimer. An odd fanatical intensity glowed in his face. "'I don't know,' he said, speaking thickly and with difficulty. "'I hadn't thought. But perhaps it's because Marion's perfection is so dependent on wealth. I see Marion,' he went on, his words suddenly pouring out, as a flower that you get by fairly watering the ground with money. Put her by herself in the panting, sweating world, and what would she be? Her grace is money, her ease, money, all her charm, money, everything in her except her chiseled Greek beauty is money. I hate money. And he fell into tumultuous silence. So that was it, Mrs. Latimer said in a tired voice. Poor Stacy, confidence for confidence, she added abruptly, after a pause. Have you ever wondered why we gave up Italy and came here to live? Often, he answered, surprised. I used to fancy it was your decision, your feeling that Marion ought to know America. She smiled oddly. My decision? It would make no difference where Marion lived. She would never at any point touch the real world. No, it was not my decision. 
You see, our income, which was considered a tidy little competence, at the time Mr. Latimer inherited it, remained stationary, while the cost of everything grew and grew. America was expensive, but in it Marion could marry money. Money, Stacy. And of course, she added with a kind of bravado, you were a splendid party. Stacy felt sickened by the revelation. Oddly enough, five years passed, when he had been incorrigibly romantic, it would not have disgusted him a tenth as much as now, when he was stripped clean of illusions. I see, he remarked, so today, with the present cost of living, Marion simply must marry. What an economic waste to have thrown away these five years in waiting for me. Why do you tell me this, Mrs. Latimer? Only because it's a relief to tell somebody, she replied, and because you said what you did about money, and because I wanted to show you that one might feel as you did, with even more reason, and still live and be tolerably happy. He shook his head. Very well, then, she concluded desperately, because truth is truth, and if I ever connived at anything against you, I want to tell you of it. Stacy smiled. You're much more girlish than your daughter, he said. They were silent for a long while. Then, did you have an awful, awful time, Stacy? she asked softly. He started. Where? In France? Oh, yes, of course, he replied in a matter-of-fact voice. I thought of you so often, she went on. It must be dreadful to be an idealist and then see all your ideals go violently, one by one. Violently, yes, he interrupted coolly, not one by one. Crushed to death by facts, not average facts, all the horrible evil facts, herded together and organized until they must have seemed normal. Oh, he said, facts are facts. They aren't either evil or good. And you're much too polite in saying that I was an idealist. Sentimentalist is the right word. Can't say that the method employed to remove my illusions was particularly gentle, but I'm grateful enough for the removal. There was a look of pain on Mrs. Latimer's face. No, no, she cried. It isn't fair. There's good disillusionment and bad. It's good to have false prettiness, false sentiment, whatever is false, scrubbed off. But it isn't good, it isn't fair to a man, to see only pain and death and agony and mud for four years, and be made to feel that that's all there is of truth. It isn't fair. It isn't. Stacy's face was pale, but calm and touched with a distant haughty scorn of all things. Oh, it wasn't only that, he said in a chill voice. I doubt if that was even the profoundest lesson in disillusionment. That was the lesson of pain and brutality and ugliness and fatigue, incredible fatigue. It even had gleams of relief, flashes of lightning and chaos. Men showed themselves beasts, but with a capacity for enduring more suffering than you'd have thought possible. There was funk, of course, individual cowardice and rank, bestial, mass terror, just as there was mass cruelty. But there was amazing heroism, too and the men did carry on, in spite of everything. Oh, no, the trouble with the front line was the senselessness of squandering so much life, the place to get real disillusionment, where you learned the senselessness and sordidness of life itself, was behind the lines, back where things were neat and pretty, where the officers had feuds over questions of personal prestige, and stupid fools gave orders disposing of men's lives, and the peasants gouged the soldiers for all they were worth. Or back in Paris, where the shopkeepers gouged everyone. And the YMCA, with their silly sloppy Christianity, all for the best in the best of all possible worlds. Or down in Italy, where butter and sugar were rationed down to the minutest fragments, and there wasn't enough so that women and children could get even those tiny rations and yet some people had butter on their table in quantities three times a day and bought sugar in five kilo packages at their back doors at six times the established price and the american red cross with its silly pompous majors and colonels out for decorations colonel so-and-so thought he'd been slighted and major thingumbob 
absolutely was going to be given a place on the balcony when that ceremony came off by god he was or know the reason why and the committee on public misinformation and no coal to run trains enough to carry the people who absolutely had to travel and president wilson coming to rome with a million journalists he laughed harshly or for the matter of that america i haven't seen very much of it yet but i gather oh i gather a great deal stacy paused at last but he did not look crushed or dejected by his enumeration of abuses he looked more alive than before he looked like a young evil disdainful god it was mrs latimer whose face was white poor stacy she murmured brokenly all true no doubt but not the whole truth poor stacy poor me he asked why i'm all right and free or almost free or almost she repeated he frowned wisps of old things hang around futilely and bother me a trifle like soft fog around a ship but i'll get rid of them he said confidently so as to be free yes she reflected for a moment why do you want to be free she asked timidly what will you do with freedom stacy do with it nothing it's an end in itself isn't it aim enough to want to get rid of association with the kind of thing i've been chronicling she shook her head it might be it isn't your aim stacy and anyway one can't be free oh stacy forgive an old woman who is fond of you but you you've come back a different person than you went away and indeed you must to live follow that old old advice know thyself he stared at her sullenly i know you've determined not to but you must she cried haven't i he said coldly been regaling you with reams about myself she shook her head again you haven't even scratched the surface it's late my dear boy she added please take me home end of chapter four chapter five of the lonely warrior by claude c washburn this librivox recording is in the public domain philip blair and stacy had been hunting houses catherine and the boys were to come on when one had been found and enough furniture rented to live with until their own could be shipped houses to let were scarce applicants numerous and rents high but stacy employed obstinate pressure and actually presented his friend with a choice of three which better than anything else indicates the position of the carroll family in vernon the thing was done the lease signed and the agent had left them but phil and stacy stood for a little while on the wooden porch of phil's new house looking down at the city vernon was for the most part flat but one hill of moderate eminence it did possess which in the narrow early days when the city was young and a man was deemed successful if he had at sixty amassed a fortune of a hundred thousand dollars had been the supreme centre of fashion as was evidenced by the towers to say nothing of the lightning rods on the now dingy frame houses stacy himself had lived on this hill when a small boy and the school he had attended still crowned it but those were the days when vernon's best citizens boasted that vernon had a population of a hundred thousand which it did not have now vernon had two hundred and twenty-five or perhaps two hundred and fifty thousand and its best citizens did not much care the crowded business section had flowed to the foot of the hill and even burst like a wave upon it spattering its slopes with small garages and second-rate shops noise rose and the odour of smoke fashion had long since departed to the edge of the city where the carols lived or still farther to the hills that rose beyond stacy withdrew his eyes from the prospect and glanced sharply about him at the porch the steps and the small front yard sordid kind of place to have to live in he remarked sorry i can't get anything better for you philip blair smiled his pleasant gentle smile 
"'You know you don't think that, Stacy. he returned. "'You're only saying what you take to be the proper thing. At heart you don't feel that it matters in the least where one lives.' "'No, I suppose not,' Stacy assented absently. He was again staring off at the city. It stretched out, monotonous and unbroken, save where the afternoon sunlight glittered on the two converging branches of its sluggish river. "'I wish,' said Phil shyly, after a pause, "'that you'd let me thank you for this whole business.' "'For God's sake, don't!' Stacy exclaimed sharply. "'Thank me if I give you anything real, peace or, or freedom. Don't thank me for anything to do with money.' Indeed, he did not want to be thanked. Gratitude was a bond, the recognition of gratitude a bond. Phil looked at him sadly, but Stacy did not see. His eyes were still fixed on the city. "'The solidity,' he muttered at last, "'the damned solidity of it. Did you ever see anything like it?' he burst out, turning on Phil. "'The solidity of what?' "'Of that, of the city.' I didn't feel it at first when I got back. It's getting on my nerves now. There are churches in it where men preach at it, and lecture halls where men talk at it, and auditoriums where it's sung at and played at. Bah! Children with puffed-out cheeks trying to blow down a house. Why, look at it. It's only sixty years old, yet it's more eternally unchangeable than the pyramids. Well, said Phil slowly, what's wrong with that? Why should it change? Why? The whole world has gone through agony, has been wrenched and torn until not one atom of it, not one emotion, not one value, remains as it was. And here is this damned ignoble changeless place that doesn't know there's been a war, or pretends not to know, so that it won't be expected to change. Nothing can change it, I tell you, but bombs. But, Phil asked steadily, how do you want to change it? What do you want to do for it? Nothing, Stacy cried. I don't want to change it, either for better or worse. Nobody can change what a war like this couldn't change. I want, he concluded, his eyes glowing strangely, to wipe it out, annihilate it. Bombs, I said. Nothing else is any good. A look of pain crossed Philip Blair's face. I think, he said, that you're a little mad, Stacy. <laughs> Maybe, said Stacy, with a short laugh. Because it isn't only Vernon you'd have to destroy. Everything's that way, unchanging. It has to be, I suppose, to endure. People have their own lives. They can't change so very much. Even mothers don't die because their sons have died. They suffer for a while, then forget. Vernon and the Middle West shock you now because they've been too removed and too unimaginative to suffer at the war. They've scarcely felt the war, while you've been in places all raw with pain. But they, too, will get over it and be like Vernon. It isn't Vernon you'd have to destroy. It's all humanity. Stacy's face was inscrutable. Not a muscle in it had moved. But his eyes had grown dark with a kind of shadow. Maybe, he said again quietly, come on, let's go. They went down the steps and along the brief boardwalk to Stacy's car, which was parked before the house. Dinner was at seven, and they were in the living room at ten minutes too. It was the one admonition Stacy had given Phil on the latter's arrival the day before. Do as you please in everything, only be on time at meals, he had said. Mr. Carroll was waiting for them, with cocktails ready to pour. He was in a genial mood, and nodded appreciatively at the younger men's promptness. "'Pleasure to have to do with people who understand that seven means seven. he observed. "'You wouldn't believe, Blair, the trouble I used to have with Stacy. He was almost as bad as his sister in his contempt for time.' He poured the cocktails. "'Make them myself nowadays,' he explained. I have profound respect for Parker, but I don't want to strain his integrity too much. You can't even trust the men at the club not to rifle one another's lockers. Not that Parker wouldn't make a more creditable member than a good many of them. They laughed. Dare say, remarked Stacy. But now this question of being on time. I can see two sides to it. Two? His father exclaimed. Not a bit of it. 
There's only one side. No, it's a matter of two opposing theories of life. One is that you should always be on time, so as to avoid inconveniencing one another, and wasting energy, and having dishes get cold. The other is that you shouldn't worry too much about promptness, or you let time get the upper hand of you, and run your life. Fiddlesticks, Mr. Carroll interrupted. It will run your life more if you neglect it. Yes, that's a point for you. I knew an Italian family in Rome, delightful people. Several branches of the family there were, lived all over the city. They were always going places together en masse, but it took them forever to get assembled. Once they stood in the rain, in three separate bunches, in three distinct and distant parts of Rome, because they'd all forgotten at just what time they were to meet, and where. No, you're a slave if you disregard time, and a slave if you bow down to it. You're had either way. Pshaw! said Mr. Carroll. I rather think that there's a little more to it, Phil observed quietly. I think Mr. Carroll's side is right. It is better to be prompt, but not because you save time that way and are more efficient, rather because you establish an apparent medium of smoothness to live in, make everything seem permanent, eternal, and of value. To have the 9-7 train pull gently out of the Pennsylvania station at precisely 9-7 gives you a feeling of confidence, a sense that everything's going to be all right. An illusion, of course, but essential. A lot of bohemian marriages break up just because they don't have it there, stable and making marriage seem stable. Mr. Carroll nodded. Something in that, maybe, he observed. But dinner was announced, and they went in. "'Did you find a house?' Mr. Carroll inquired after a while. "'Yes,' said Phil. "'I'm awfully pleased.' "'Where?' Stacy told him. Mr. Carroll fairly snorted. "'Stacy, I'm ashamed of you,' he cried. "'Blair can't live in a hovel like that. He can't surround his children with all that coal dust and noise.' "'I give you my word, Mr. Carroll,' Phil protested, "'that it's a lot better than where we've been living.' I really like the place. I can run a lawnmower in the evening." But the older man shook his head impatiently. "'Now look here,' he said. "'This house of mine is three times too big for Stacy and me, especially since Julie married. You bring your wife and children here to live, anyway, until you can find something really decent, or build if you decide to stay.' Philip Blair flushed slightly. "'I never heard of anything quite so generous as that, sir,' he replied, a trifle unsteadily. "'But I can't possibly accept.' And there was a gentle decision in his voice. "'Well, well, well. I'd have been glad to have you,' said Mr. Carroll, and dropped the subject. Stacy recognized that his father's offer was more than ordinarily generous, especially since Mr. Carroll liked to lead his own life and he would have lived up to it, Stacy knew. He would have tried to crush Phil's opinions into the mould of his own, and he would certainly have been cross if Phil or Catherine were late at meals, or showed Bolshevik leanings, but in his own way, and with externals, he would have been both impetuously and consistently generous. He would probably even have given Phil a key to the wine cellar. All this Stacy understood, and with it his father. He should have felt a warm glow, but he did not. The only emotion he felt was a faint sadness at feeling nothing. Dead, he muttered to himself, dead as they make em. Yet he would not really have chosen to feel. At coffee time a friend of Mr. Carroll's dropped in to play pinochle, and Phil and Stacy went upstairs. But Stacy was restless. He wanted to see Marion, and resented the desire another bond that he could not shake free of. Moreover, he knew that in Marion's presence he should dislike her. So the endurance of the desire was doubly exasperating. All this lack of harmony, even of common sense. "'I think I'll go over and see Marion Latimer,' he said at last to Phil. "'Be glad to have you come along. Really, you know.' "'Thanks,' returned Phil. "'No, I'm a bit fagged. Quite sincere about it run along. I'll find out first whether she's in, Stacy said, and lifted the receiver of the telephone on his desk. They were in his study. 
If she isn't, I'll go to a movie, he added, while waiting for his number. He got the house and, after a minute, Marion. She laughed musically in response to his question. Why, yes, come, do come, she said. Her laughter made him angry, but not with her, with himself. It was not her recognition of her power over him that he minded. It was that power itself. He walked to her house, a matter of a mile. He never used a motor-car nowadays, if he could get anywhere without one. Swift walking calmed the persistent fever of his blood. Mr. and Mrs. Latimer were in the drawing-room, and he stood there for a few minutes, chatting with them. "'Marion is in the library,' said Mr. Latimer presently. "'She left word that you were to go up as soon as you came.' "'Ames Price is there, too,' Mrs. Latimer put in quietly. "'All right,' said Stacy, with apparent equanimity. "'Thanks.' But he saw Mr. Latimer flash a sudden glance of anger at his wife, who, however, went on with her knitting calmly. "'So that's the way the land lies.' Stacy reflected as he climbed the stairs. Papa had been told, or, more likely, has found out. Decent of Mrs. Latimer, very. Nevertheless, he was unhappy. He knocked at the library door, and Marion called to him to enter. She was curled up in her favorite armchair, and Ames Price was rising from a smaller chair nearby. Marion gave Stacy a look of mischievous defiance but he went over and shook hands with her so pleasantly and coolly that her eyes grew suddenly puzzled. "'Hello, Ames,' he said, shaking his rival's hand. "'Haven't seen you for years. How have you been?' First class,' replied the other, eyeing Stacy doubtfully. "'You look pretty fit.' He was a tall, fair, loosely built man of forty, smooth-shaven and slightly bald. Stacy had known him in a casual way for years, but all that he really knew about him was that he had inherited money, had managed it well enough, was said to be a bit fast, but not excessively, and played an admirable game of golf. So far as Stacy or anyone else was aware, there had been, except for golf, no passions in Ames' life. Stacy felt a little sorry for him, that he should have been overwhelmed now by this one. Marion would make him uncomfortable. She would demand a great variety of emotions of him. But, in spite of himself, Stacy also felt a hot jealousy. By Jove, Marion was beautiful. I suppose, said Ames, with proper politeness, that you must have had a pretty rough time in France. You were over the deuce of a while. I didn't get across myself, division just about to sail when the armistice came along. There was a touch of constraint in his tone. Stacy understood it at once. It was as though Ames had said, You come back a hero. What chance have I got against you? Oh, well, Stacy returned, pleasantly enough. That's all done with now. Here we all are again. There's no change in anything, really. He glanced at Marion. She was surveying the situation distantly, with a faint, amused smile. Stacy's own sensations beneath his calm demeanor were turbulent and mixed. He desired Marion keenly, hated to let her go, yet felt an antagonism for her that his desire increased rather than diminished. He was jealous of Ames, yet not in the least hostile toward him, almost kindly, in fact. "'Going to build houses again?' Ames asked. Stacy considered him for a moment, then Marion, and in that moment wrenched himself free. No, he said, I believe I'll go away, travel. Funny thing, but a long stretch of the war stuff turns a man into a rather solitary animal. Maybe it's the noise of the guns that's shut him off for so long from companionship. He was not really thinking, except vaguely, of leaving Vernon, and had spoken principally to reassure Ames for which uncharacteristically benevolent act he was immediately rewarded. The other man's face relaxed from anxiety into an expression so blissful as to be silly. In spite of his conflicting emotions, Stacy could hardly keep from laughing. "'We shall all be awfully sorry to have you go, Stacy,' said Marion gently. "'I shall, especially.' This might be directed at Ames. Marion was certain to spend a great deal of time in hurting Ames. 
but Stacy did not think it was, for it was a simple remark, simply phrased, and Marion sat there, quiet, carved, thinking, no doubt, that Stacy liked her best that way. Well, he did. Before long he rose to go. He would have liked to remain and look at Marion, but he had a well-developed sense of fair play. Let Ames be happy, and deeper than this was the feeling that since he, Stacy, had decided for freedom, he had better begin to act on the decision at once. That was it. Act. Do something. It was the only release from everything. But when he rose, Marion rose too, and accompanied him out into the hall, and closed the door behind her. Ames did not seem to mind. When Marion excused herself, his rather vacuous face was as radiant as before. What more natural than that a girl should find it fitting to say good-bye to an outgrown lover of her early youth? Ames would not, perhaps, have been so calm about it had he witnessed the setting and details. For outside the door Marion paused only for an instant to look up at Stacy, then, with a gesture of her hand to him, hurried down the hall a few yards, stopped abruptly at a door that opened off from it, turned the knob gently, and, giving first one swift glance up and down the hall, pulled Stacy a little way into the room beyond. He gazed around him quickly. There was no light save that which came from the hall. It was Marion's bedroom. He turned on her and seized her wrists, his heart beating violently. But his hostility rose, wave for wave, with his passion. What a trick to play on him! Deliberate! Deliberate! But she stood there, close to him, perfectly still, looking up into his eyes. The corners of her mouth trembled a little. They kissed, madly. "'Good-bye, Stacy,' she murmured faintly, when he had released her. "'Don't think I was trying to hold you. I wasn't. I only wanted to say good-bye, like this. I think you're right, and I won't hate you, any more than I can help. Good-bye.' and, with another swift glance up and down, she drew back into the hall. But when she was already halfway to the library door, she turned and came back a step or two. Her eyes were wet, but her mouth had curved into a mischievous smile. "'Poor Ames,' she said, and was gone. Stacy managed to leave the house without seeing either Mr. or Mrs. Latimer. He walked away swiftly and when the confusion of his senses wore off, he began to see into things a little more deeply than before. He saw his feeling toward Marion as it really was, and as, he perceived, Marion had understood it, animal desire and love of beauty. Desire was a bond. It hurt to have it go. Stacy felt a painful emptiness, as though he had torn something violently from his heart. Yet he also felt a kind of exultation. End of chapter 5「Chapter 6 of the Lonely Warrior by Claude C. Washburn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Life in Vernon went on and on, and Stacy watched it proceed, but his attitude remained one of scornful indifference, through which flickered occasional gleams of sudden eager interest, anger or hate. The perception of greed was one of the things that stirred him most frequently, and it grew within him until it amounted almost to a fixed idea. His hatred of money, its symbol, became fanatical. He would have renounced his own income entirely, except that he did not want to throw himself into the melee just yet. But somehow, to see things through from outside, though through to where, he could not have said. As it was, he retained two hundred dollars a month, and sent the rest to the relief fund for Viennese children. In this he was making no effort to live up to a principle, to conform himself to some ideal of life. If he had been, he would have sent all. He was, almost solely, striving for freedom from something he hated. Not quite solely, however, or why did he make this particular disposition of the money? He refused to answer the question. He would be free from what he loved as well as from what he hated. One carefully covered-up aspect of life in Vernon did interest Stacy. 
Existence there seemed the same as formerly. People thought it was, though perhaps a few of them only pretended to think so. But at bottom certain fundamental relationships were shaken. Men paid eighteen dollars for a pair of shoes for which five years back they would have paid seven, or, not buying them, would next day have to pay twenty-three. Women would offer sixty dollars a month for a maid, then not get her. The majority said that the cost of living was outrageous, and servants scarce, and went superbly on as before. But Stacy grinned at them malignantly. He stamped on the ground and heard a hollow sound. Therefore, although by this time his father talked to him, almost with constraint, and gave him often a wistful, puzzled glance, Stacy himself felt a more just appreciation of his father than at first. Mr. Carroll was partisan down to the tips of his toes, but he did not know that more was abroad than mere surface changes. His angry thought of Bolshevism was an obsession, and, knowing his father's nature to be kindly and impulsive, Stacy gave him credit for something more than the mere desire to hold what he had got, which Stacy thought he discerned beneath the vehemence of most perturbed capitalists, Colin Jeffreys, for instance. No, Mr. Carroll was in arms for principles he believed in. As for Stacy, he neither believed in them nor in those that opposed them. It was unfortunate. He would have been much happier if he could have thrown himself actively into the fray on one side or the other. Not because he craved human association, he did not. He was singularly solitary and aloof, with a white-hot kind of aloofness. But because he craved action, there was strike after strike of labor in Vernon. They became almost the only subject of conversation. Even women discussed them, at teas or in their electrics as they drove to the movies. There was no coal for a while. Then the workmen in all the mills struck. Then the river dock hands went out, and were promptly joined by the truck and dray men. This last strike tied up nearly everything. Stacy was interested. He walked down to strike headquarters one afternoon, and faced one of the sullen groups of men gathered in the disheveled yard before the low brick building. "'What is it you fellows want?' he asked curiously. There ensued a rumble of hostile voices and some sharp cries. "'Beat it, you bum! Get to hell out of here, you damned aristocrat!' "'Oh, shut up! I want to know,' Stacy said impatiently. "'You must have some idea about it.' The rumble became a roar. A man struck out at Stacy, and Stacy promptly knocked him down. There was a general mix-up, during which Stacy was surprised to find a man, one of the laborers, so far as he had time to see, fighting efficiently on his side. The police, who must have been close at hand, presently smashed up the fray and rescued the two, whereupon Stacy, rather battered, but happier than he had been for a long while, swung about to investigate his comrade in arms. "'By the Lord! Burnham!' he cried, with real pleasure. "'The same, Captain,' said the other, instinctively raising his hand in salute, then dropping it again awkwardly. But Stacy seized the hand and wrung it. Burnham had been first sergeant in one of his two companies. Stacy gave his name to the police, observed that he was much obliged, but that there was nothing to make a fuss about, and walked away with Burnham. "'Quite like old times, eh?' he remarked. "'Oh, this,' said Burnham, and spat scornfully. "'What are you doing up here?' Stacy demanded. "'Thought you lived in Omaha.' "'Well, I did, and my wife and kids are still there with my wife's sister. But I heard there was good work with better pay up here, so I come up to see, and I was driving a truck, and then the boys went out.' "'Oh, look here!' cried Stacy. Then you were one of them. I swear I'm sorry. This will put you in bad with the others, won't it? Burnham grinned. They won't exactly be coming around and begging me to have another drink of ginger extract on them, he admitted. It don't matter, Captain. Honest, it don't. I was going back to Omaha anyway. Stacy stopped walking and stared at him curiously. Why on earth did you side with me? he asked. I don't know, said the other looking down and shuffling with his feet on the sidewalk. Habit, I guess. No, he added, looking Stacy in the eye, while a dull flush spread over his face. 
No, it ain't that. I'd go anywhere you went, Captain, even if it was straight to hell. Pshaw, hell would be a song compared with some of the places I've gone with you. Stacy was touched and also disturbed. What a responsibility. Here was a bond with a vengeance. I'm blessed if I know why, he murmured, and they walked on. And yet, he exclaimed suddenly, you've been here in Vernon for I don't know how long, and haven't even come to see me. Is hell the only place you'll accompany me to? Have you got a special preference for it? Burnham hung his head. Well, you see, he muttered, you're such a confounded swell up here, Captain. Stacy again paused abruptly and turned on the man. Damn you, Burnham, I'm not, he cried. What do you say that for? Well, said Burnham apologetically, maybe you don't want to be, maybe you ain't, but I guess you'll have a hell of a time not to be. Looks to me like everyone's gone back the way they was before. Stacy felt profoundly discouraged. The comment was so obviously true. Was that what the men down there had against me? He inquired almost humbly, walking on once more. Sure, Burnham assented. The boys are all right, but they're touchy. And you blow in, not meaning any harm, but they didn't know that, not knowing you like I know you. And you ask them what the matter is, like a man giving orders, and they get sore. Sullen anger with himself crept over Stacy. It was all true enough. He had spoken to the men crisply, like one in authority. There was no use in explaining to them, or even to Burnham, that this was not because he was a Vernon Carroll, but because he could not rid himself of the military habit of command in word and thought. There was no use in explaining anything to anybody. Bonds, he was tied hand and foot with them. By the way, he asked quietly, what is it they want, Burnham? They're getting seventy cents an hour, my crowd, I mean. They want eighty. I see. They continued in silence until at last they reached the Carroll house. Burnham paused to look up at it. Some place, Captain, he observed appreciatively. You know it? Yes, I, I've been by here before, said Burnham sheepishly. Oh, you've been by here before, have you? Stacy returned sharply. Well, you're not going by this time. You're coming in. No, now listen, Captain. I'm going to take the 10 p.m. for Omaha. Well, you can start for it from here as well as from anywhere else. Come now, march. Newspaper reporters were ringing Stacy insistently on the telephone. Pshaw, he answered, nothing to it. Went down to strike headquarters to ask silly questions and got into a baby fracas as I deserved to. No casualties. No, I can't tell you any more. There isn't any more to tell. He took Burnham up to his study and made him sit down. Now I tell you what we'll do, he said. About 9.15 or so, we'll drive around to your boarding house or wherever it is you've been living and pick up your things. Burnham was grinning. Gee, Captain, you're innocent, considering what kind of things you've been through, he interrupted. Do you think after what's happened that I'll find any of my stuff there? I'll find a bunch of the boys waiting to beat me up. Oh! said Stacy, and, paying no heed to Burnham's embarrassed protestations, he pulled a traveling bag from a closet and packed it. Oh, shut up, he said finally. Go into the bathroom there and wash. You're even dirtier than I am. Presently the door of the study was thrown open, and Mr. Carroll hurried in, red-faced and out of breath. I've just heard, he panted. Did those damned scoundrels do you any— Shh, said Stacy raising his finger to his lip, as Burnham came out of the bathroom. "'Father, this is Burnham, my first sergeant, C Company, and as good a man as I've run up against. Incidentally, though he's one of the boys who's striking, he turned in and fought them with me this afternoon. Whole thing very silly. Neither of us hurt at all. Burnham will stay to dinner.' Mr. Carroll looked at Burnham keenly and held out his hand. "'I'm glad to know you, sergeant,' he said. American Legion veteran attacked by strikers, announced the newspaper headlines next morning. The striking dock and dray men added another outrage to their intolerable behavior when they yesterday violently attacked former Captain Stacy Carroll, D.S.C., 
a hero of numerous battles in the late World War and son of Edward H. Carroll of this city. Captain Carroll had gone to strike headquarters at 13 Plum Street at about five o'clock yesterday afternoon in a generous attempt to learn the men's side of the case. His friendly questions, however, were met by a brutal assault. This time, however, the strikers mistook their man, and the only result of the attempted outrage is that Michael Dennis, 24, has a broken nose, Vladimir Sarovich, 20, a black and blue facial coloring that improves his former appearance, while Lorenzo Secchi, 21, is in the city hospital with a fractured wrist. The public will be relieved to learn that Captain Carroll is uninjured except for a few superficial bruises. Dennis and Sarovich were arrested on a charge of assault and battery, but were promptly released on bail, money, as is well known, being plentiful at strike headquarters. This brutal and uncalled-for assault upon a hero of the World War marks, etc. Stacy was infuriated. He wrote a sharp fetter to the paper, then, with grudging common sense, tore it up and wrote another, milder one, in which he protested that the whole affair was due to a misunderstanding and was anyway too unimportant to deserve mention in the press. He went to the hospital to see Secchi, a handsome dark-haired Neapolitan, who stared at him angrily at first out of immense black eyes, till Stacy apologized to him in Italian, after which the two conversed in that language with an increasing good humor that was heightened by their puzzled pauses over Stacy's mistakes and Secchi's dialect. The interview put them almost on terms of intimacy. Stacy gave the Neapolitan, who had fought in the Battle of the Piave, some Austrian banknotes printed in Italian for use in Venetia during the invasion, and Secchi responded with a tiny silver medal of the Madonna. Accidenti alla stampa! Damn the newspapers! They agreed heartily. But Stacy's pleasant frame of mind on leaving the hospital was destroyed by his glimpse of the morning paper's noon edition. His letter was there, but ruined by the caption above. Captain Carroll's generous reply makes light of cowardly attack, would exonerate strikers, and by the fulsome eulogy of his behavior that followed. A vibrant editorial completed the wreck, insisting that while the personal magnanimity shown in Captain Carroll's letter must appeal to every red-blooded citizen, the time had at last come when law and order must be, etc., Without the slightest desire to align himself, either on one side or the other, save that he felt a little more personal sympathy with the strikers, who anyway lived in touch with the few realities of life than with their opponents, Stacy saw himself established irremediably as a St. George-like champion of law and order. He damned the press more earnestly than before. He lunched at the club with his father, whose eyes shone with approval of him, and he had, moreover, to undergo an ordeal of praise and congratulation from his father's friends, together with briefer, less intense words from men of his own age. The younger men, he told himself, were anyhow less grandiloquent nowadays than the older, though perhaps this was only because they were younger. Once or twice he tried impatiently to explain the silly business as it really was, but unavailingly. Anything he said was taken, he saw, as merely a further proof of his generosity. He gave up the attempt sulkily. Clearly, his position was fixed. People had made up their minds about him, his reputation was solidly established, and nothing he might henceforth do could affect it. It struck him that the levity with which people acquired convictions would be ghastly if it were not so ridiculous. Deserting the club with a feeling of relief, he wandered aimlessly about the city but toward five o'clock, being caught in a sudden rain shower, he took refuge in Philip Blair's house. As a matter of fact, there were other houses closer by that would have afforded shelter, and it was at least partly from preference that he chose this one. He had not regained his old warm affection for Phil and Catherine, but their society was like a temporary bomb applied to his fevered restless mind. No touch of greed was in them. They were, Stacy concluded, hardly human. Phil had not yet returned from the office, but Catherine was at home with her two sons, Carter, now nine years old, and Jack, who was seven. She welcomed him with her pleasant smile, 
that was like light shining coolly through an alabaster bowl, but also with characteristic constraint. She was only perfectly at ease with him when Phil, too, was present, and less demand for expression was thus put upon her. Shy, thought Stacy once again, shy as truth herself. But he did not mind her shyness, he liked it. Being with Catherine was like bathing in a bottomless pool of clear translucent water. Fancies such as this, resembling those among which he had formerly lived so familiarly, came to him now only when he was with the Blairs. The fact should have revealed to him much that was obscure in himself, but it did not. There was no constraint in Carter's and Jack's greetings. "'Uncle Stacy!' cried Carter immediately. "'I got A in arithmetic on my report in New York, and A in reading and B-plus in spelling.' "'Well, that's good,' said Stacy. "'What did you get in conduct?' Catherine smiled. "'C-plus.' said Carter, in a small voice. But his depression did not last long. "'Uncle Stacy, do fly away Jack, fly away Jill, for him.' He pointed to his brother. "'I bet he can't guess the secret. I bet he'll look all over the room for them.' And Carter grinned a delighted, toothless grin. "Hm," observed Stacy, obediently making the necessary preparations. I remember someone else who looked all over the room for them a few years ago. I guess you mean me, Carter replied. Well, I guess I did. I guess I was awful stupid, maybe. Carter, said his mother with a laugh, there aren't that many guesses in the whole dictionary. Presently Phil arrived. He looked tired with the heat, but his thin face brightened when he saw Stacy there playing with the boys. Stacy, you're a fraud he said, what sort of behavior is this for a misanthrope? You ought to be gloating over what Jack and Carter will grow up to be. Catherine put an end to the game, and sent the boys out to play on the porch. Yes, she said, as she closed the door upon them. I guess Stacy doesn't mean all he says. I guess he's really kind-hearted. I guess he likes children, maybe. Phil stared at his wife and smiled. For heaven's sake, Catherine, he demanded, What's come over your English? Stacy laughed. Corrupting effect of Carter, he explained. Yes, of course I like children. Would you like to have some of your own? Phil asked. Stacy reflected, frowning. Yes, he replied at last. I think so. Just one, a boy, so that I could try bringing him up. Phil and Catherine both laughed. Upon my word, said the former, this is delightful. Fancy finding you not merely humanly usual, but positively universal, a bachelor with theories on education. What is your present theory, my son? Stacy smiled. However, it had become difficult for him to smile, and when he did so, his face took on uneasy lines. He was not at his best when smiling. He was at his best when his face remained impassive and soldierly. Oh, he said dryly, it's a romantic enough theory, quite Rousseau-like. I've just invented it this minute. If I had a son, I should take him to live in the country, in some place where the landscape was neither too grand, and thus apt to arouse vast disturbing aspirations in him, nor yet ignominious and depressing, like these dingy Middle Western plains. I would have him live among trees, that are handsome and do no harm and associate familiarly with a great many kindly simple-minded animals such as dogs, cows, and horses, with a few cultivated elegant animals such as cats, and, less frequently and intimately, with one or two goats, who are old, sophisticated, and sceptical, the libres penseurs among animals. And with no humans at all, eh? Well, said Stacy dubiously, Perhaps now and then, an occasional, very choice human, such as you or Catherine, just to show him what human beings can become. But rarely, Phil, rarely. Thanks, from Catherine and myself, Phil observed, with a rather weary smile. But I'd rather you'd select someone else. I should be profoundly unwilling to pose as an example. And I, echoed Catherine. Besides, I shouldn't have time. I should have to be getting dinner for Phil and the boys, just as I must do now. And she rose. I've not been able to find a maid yet. 
But Stacy, considering Catherine and Phil, perceived, with a softening touch of sympathy, that they were both very tired, and that no doubt he had been adding to their fatigue. These two lived with a life of their own, apart, serene, modestly adding their few grains of pure gold to that appallingly small treasure which represented the sole remainder of all these ages and ages of human existence. Yet, because they did so, thought Stacy, because they were clear pinpoints of light in chaos, all life was against them, chillingly indifferent where not actively hostile. The blackness swirled about with a malignant, dully sentient desire to engulf and extinguish them. They were repaid for their foolhardy torch-bearing, their unforgivable sin of having some meaning, by being ground down beneath the sordid difficulties of bare existence. Ames Price, who played golf, or Jimmy Prout, who tried lawsuits, or Colin Jeffries, who handled a dozen corporations of no value to life, had carpets unrolled obsequiously before them as they walked, while Phil must wear his genius frayed on hack labor and Catherine must cook for her family in a small hot kitchen. What a brute of a world! What an ugly, perverse mess of a world! thought Stacy, with a fierce, sick disgust. Worth nothing! Its hard-won treasure was too tiny to justify such a colossal groveling incoherence. But while Stacy was reflecting moodily in this manner, Catherine had gone into the kitchen. Stacy could hear her there, moving pots and pans. Suddenly he sprang up and went after her. "'Look here, Catherine,' he said. "'It's too hot to cook this evening. Come on out with me. We'll all go out and have dinner at a chop suey place. The boys, too, of course.' She looked at him doubtfully for just a moment, then smiled. "'Thank you, Stacy,' she said simply. "'That will be awfully pleasant. I think Phil is pretty tired. I'll go and get the boys ready.'" End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of The Lonely Warrior by Claude C. Washburn this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Stacy and Mrs. Latimer were having tea together, but, since Stacy had ceased to visit the Latimer home, they were having it at the Sign of the Purple Parrot. This was a small but expensive tea room, recently opened on the fifth floor of a building close to the river front, and Stacy, as he entered it for the first time, glanced swiftly about at its white walls, low white ceiling, small paned windows with hangings of purple-figured cretonne, and at the purple wooden parrot on a tall standard in the centre of the room. A silver vase containing a single yellow rose decorated each of the ten or twelve little tables. Finally Stacy turned in mute amazement to his companion, since it was she who had suggested the place. "'They have very good tea,' she said with an amused smile. However, Miss Wilcox, proprietor of the tea-room, advanced toward them. "'I'm so glad you've come early, before anyone else, Mrs. Latimer,' she said, "'because you can have one of the two tables out on the balcony. I'm sure you'd like that. They're always the first to go.' And accordingly they went outside, and sat down in wicker chairs beneath a purple and white awning. "'Don't you think it's a nice idea?' asked Miss Wilcox, standing near them to try and use our river aesthetically, Captain Carroll? It is Captain Carroll, isn't it? I recognized you from your photograph. We're honored to have you come. It seems such a shame to have this magnificent river and then use it solely for ugly business purposes. But that's so often true in America, I think. St. Louis is the same way. I should so like to have my modest little effort followed by others. Stacy said politely that he hoped it would be and Miss Wilcox presently moved away. "'You mustn't mind her, poor thing,' Mrs. Latimer observed kindly. "'She's devoted to her institution. It's her child.' "'Preposterous virgin birth,' murmured Stacy, gazing down at the river. It sweltered in the intense August sunlight. Barges and tugs moved up and down its sallow waters, and vast warehouses flanked it. Across on the further side was a train-yard with multitudes of red freight cars, idle or with engines shunting them about. Trucks and drays rattled over the cobblestones of the streets leading down to the river, the strike having been settled some weeks since, 
and shouts rose and the odor of grease. And Stacy, turning away from it to order tea and scones from a capped and aproned maid who had come to his side, looked at her as though he did not believe in her. "'A movie world, Mrs. Latimer,' he remarked finally. "'Yes,' she said. "'It is silly, isn't it? This painted parrot, and the tea-roses, and the tiny, fussy, white and purple room, trying to make itself noticed by that immense fierce reality out there. But it doesn't do any harm, and I thought the incongruity of it might amuse you. Where has your sense of humour gone, Stacy? Once you would have laughed gaily at this. Where does a china teacup go in an earthquake? he responded absently, looking down again at the river, then back at the room. No, of course there's no harm in it, he said after a moment, since it is so obviously absurd, but you might, I suppose, take it as a fantastic caricature of something. But Miss Wilcox was seating people at the other table of the balcony. So often true in America, I think, she was saying, I should like to have my modest little effort followed by others. Mrs. Latimer smiled, but Stacy did not. He waited impassively until Miss Wilcox had finished speaking and had walked away. Now, in the movies, he continued, you are presented with standards of behavior, sweetness and light, purity unsoiled, virtue triumphant, best of all possible worlds, that have nothing to do with real life. Seems impossible that real men and women could have posed for the pictures. You'd think the contrast with the promiscuity of their actual California divorce court lives would be too strong. Not a bit of it. Well, that's all right, if people like that kind of thing. Personally, I think it's sickening. No matter how abominable real life is, I'd a thousand times rather have to live in it than in a Pollyanna, Mary Pickford, glad and tender world. Fah! So should I said Mrs. Latimer, but if weary people find release in such tawdry fairy tales? Sure, let them. Nobody's business, but there's the trouble. The silly stuff isn't just taken as release. It gets accepted as truth. I mean to say, the ideals and standards are taken as those of real people. How in heaven's name they can be by any member of a movie audience who knows anything about himself, I swear I can't imagine, but they are. "'Ah, but that's the point,' said Mrs. Latimer gently. "'They don't know themselves. Even you don't know yourself, Stacy.' "'I know enough about myself to see that I'm not like that. And what results? That any glimpse of truth is condemned as rotten, abnormal, pathological. For the movies are only a glowing example of a spirit that corrupts everything. Why, if a novelist were to take any man alive, I don't say me, but somebody better, Jimmy Prout, for instance, and to tell the whole truth about him, the ghastly things he did, and the ghastlier ones he wanted to do but didn't dare, what a row there'd be! The reviewers would call the book abominable, the hero a hopeless rotter, though every one of them has done or wanted to do things just as bad. A movie world, Mrs. Latimer, no truth in it. Yes, she said, no doubt. I'd like it different, more honest. But what harm does the pretense do? It even sets a standard of a sort, doesn't it? What harm? he cried. Why, it makes people shocked at German atrocities, as though they were sins committed by some alien, inhuman monsters. Down with Prussianism? As much as you like. I'm glad we beat the Germans. So far, so good. But how about the Prussians in ourselves? A movie world. A smug, lying movie world. But there is kindness in it, too, she said wistfully, and generosity. I've met them both. Yes, Stacy assented somberly, there is, in sudden impulses, more frequent, I'll even concede, than these passing gusts of bestiality. But so far as I can see, there's only one real force, one motive in life, that stays on and on and never dies. Greed, he concluded fiercely. Mrs. Latimer gazed at him for a moment in silence. "'And still you don't see it all,' she said at last, very gently. "'You won't look deeply enough into yourself. If you did, you'd see the splendid spectacle of the human soul fighting all this that you describe, and without quarter, dear Stacy, as long as you have breath in you. Has your hatred of greed and lies no significance?' "'I don't know,' he replied, drawing his hand across his forehead. 
and I don't see that I'm doing any splendid fighting. I don't know what to fight. I merely fume impotently. But the wild look of pain had disappeared from his eyes. He fell to wondering about his companion. No optimist, surely. Doubtful of most things, but sweet and mellow in her scepticism. How had she attained such serenity? "'You must know Catherine, my friend Philip Blair's wife,' he said suddenly. "'You will like her, and she you. There's truth in the hearts of both of you, and yet you're different somehow. "'When you do say pretty things, they're pleasant to hear, Stacy,' Mrs. Latimer replied, with a faint girlish blush, "'because you seem not ever to be saying them for effect.' Soon they rose to go. Neither of them had so much as alluded to the fact that Marion was to be married to Ames Price in a few weeks. That same evening Stacy attended a meeting of the American Legion. His life was like that now, inconsequential. He went pointlessly from one unrelated fact to another. Being in a far from constructive frame of mind, he had nothing against the Legion and nothing in favor of it. It had indeed occurred to him that if an organization found on no common conviction, but on the mere fact that its members had all been in the army, should come to exert political influence, that influence would certainly be confusing and might be harmful. On the contrary, if the young men who had been soldiers wanted to play together, why not? But these were idle thoughts. He did not care one way or the other about the Legion. If he had shown more interest, he might, perhaps, in view of his record, have been elected commander of the post, but this is doubtful. He was a wealthy son of a wealthy father, and class antagonisms were not absent from the Legion. Up to now he had attended only one meeting, but he had learned that to-night a protest was to be presented against the engagement of Fritz Chrysler to play in Vernon in the coming autumn and Stacy, disgusted, was out to see if there was anything he could do to head off such nonsense. It was a full meeting. There were several hundred men in the large hall when Stacy entered, and tobacco smoke hung over them in a dull blue mist. The commander of the post was already in the chair, and the business of reading minutes was under way. Stacy dropped into a seat and waited abstractly. He did not have long to wait. Excitement buzzed in a group near the center of the room, and a young captain sprang up. Stacy knew him by sight. His unit was that to which Jimmy Prout had belonged. It had never left Camp Grant. "'Mr. Commander and comrades,' he began tensely, "'you know what I want to say. It's about this business of letting an enemy come here and take our money, just as if nothing had ever happened. You know who I mean. I mean Chrysler.' Chrysler was our enemy in the war. It doesn't make any difference that he didn't happen to fight against Americans, or that he was out of it before we went in. He was on the wrong side. He supported the side that did all the, the atrocities you know about. And what I want to say is that if we're asked to give him our support and our money, it's an outrage. And so, he added, unfolding a paper, I propose the following motion. We, the members of the John Harton Post of the American Legion, hereby express our amazement and strong disapproval of the action of the manager of the Park Street Theatre in engaging Fritz Chrysler, recently a soldier in the Austrian army, to play at a concert in the city of Vernon less than one year after the conclusion of a great war during which thousands of American lives were sacrificed to defeat the very principles that Herr Chrysler supported and we hereby request the manager of said theatre to cancel Herr Chrysler's engagement and notify him that failure to do so will result in an attitude of marked disinclination to patronize said theatre on the part of the members of this post. And the young captain sat down amid applause, during which half a dozen voices seconded the motion. Are there any remarks? asked the chairman calmly. Stacy was smiling a little at the contrast between the phraseology of the introduction and that of the motion, but, half risen in his seat, he was also looking about him keenly. It did not strike him that the tensity was universal. There were sluggish centers of indifference in the hall, and not many remarks were being made. Presently he rose to his feet, obtained recognition, and made his way to the front of the room amid some considerable interest. I quite agree with Captain Small, he said, leaning against the chairman's desk. 
that it doesn't make any difference that Chrysler was an Austrian instead of a German, and that the unit in which he fought never faced an American unit. Aside from that, I disagree with him in everything. It strikes me that for this post to pass any such motion as that proposed would be silly. Chrysler fought against us? Well, what of it? So did a lot of other good men. If we don't admit that, we depreciate our own achievement. Gentlemen, I call to your attention the advice given some months since by a newspaper in Rome. Quote, there are a large number of people sitting in a large number of offices, and especially those who never saw service at the front, this paper said, who ought to be made to write, the war is over, the war is over, twenty times a day, until they get the fact into their heads. There was a murmur of laughter, but Captain Small was on his feet, protesting angrily. Mr. Commander, he cried, I object to the insinuation that Captain Carroll has made. I mean to say that I never saw active service. If I didn't, it wasn't my fault, and I... The chairman rapped with his gavel. I am sure Captain Carroll intended no such suggestion, he observed. Go on, Captain. Certainly not, said Stacy coolly. It was through no fault of Captain Small's that he did not get to France. He was, I believe, one of the first to volunteer upon America's entry into the war. But, having made that perfectly clear, and since the point has arisen, I call it to your attention that both the proposer of this motion and those who seconded it happened to be men who, though through no fault of their own, did not see fighting. A rumble of voices interrupted him, but he waved his hand for silence. Wait a minute, let me finish. I say this not to create dissension, but because I want to show that I am speaking not just for myself, but for the point of view of the men who had the luck, good or bad, to fight the Germans in Flanders and the Argonne. He leaned forward and scrutinized the faces of the audience swiftly. There was something compelling in his presence. Undoubtedly he dominated the crowd, even against their will. "'You, Frank,' he called sharply, "'are you against letting Chrysler play?' No stammered the man addressed, startled. And you, Davies, you, Markovitch, you, Einstein, Jones, Thorbertson. No, no, shakes of the head, negatives all. Bruce? Jesus Christ, no, Captain, let him play, and... Laughter broke out tumultuously, and the chairman pounded with his gavel. That's all, said Stacy, and sat down. I think, said the commander, when silence had been partly restored, that it would be unfortunate to divide this organization up into those who saw fighting and those who did not. We should stick together in everything. But his words were perfunctory. He had been severely wounded at Les Eparges. All in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Opposed, no. The motion was lost. Stacy had won. But he was under no illusions. He had won by force, and he had made more enemies than friends. When he left the hall at the end of the meeting, he was a solitary figure at whom men looked from a distance. He did not care. He preferred his solitude. But outside, at the foot of the steps, Edwards, the commander, caught up with him and limped off beside him. He was a mechanic and a student, self-educated and popular with labor. In high quarters he was solemnly suspected of being a socialist. What you said was right enough, Carol, he observed meditatively. The trouble was with the way you said it, too much outside, too harsh and scornful. Quite true, Stacy assented. That happens to be the way I personally am, harsh and scornful. Edwards shook his head. You saw too much of it, I guess, Carol, he remarked. Four whole years, wasn't it? God in heaven, and more mud than we ever saw, years more of mud. Filthy thing, the war, wasn't it? Stacy laughed shortly. Wait twenty years and see how people talk about it, he said. Banners waving, steel-capped heroes. Glory, glory, we'll be talking that way, too. They walked on in silence. Oh, by the way, Edwards, said Stacy suddenly, you're a labor man. I wish to God you'd set me right about that strike business. The thing was too silly the way it got into those rotten papers... I... Edwards was laughing quietly. Pshaw, he interrupted. Do you think we don't know the facts? 
That's one thing we do know. The boys aren't down on you. They're not even down on Burnham now, though he did turn against them. Can't say that you're personally popular. Too harsh and scornful, but you're respected. Well, that's good, said Stacy, with genuine relief. You ought to crawl through the needle's eye and come in with us, Edwards added after a moment. I don't believe you give a damn for your money. You do, though, you labor people, Stacy returned coldly. You're out for all you can get, regardless. How do you expect me to take sides either for or against you? Greed on one hand, greed on the other, everywhere. Saw too much of it, Carol, Edwards repeated. Years too much. Night. I turn down here. End of chapter 7「Eight of the Lonely Warrior by Claude C. Washburn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Marion was married at St. Grace's early in September, and Stacy was present at the wedding. A number of people looked at him curiously, for it was known to some that he and the bride had formerly been engaged, but they found nothing in Stacy's face or bearing to reward them. There was general interest in the wedding, since Ames Price and Marion Latimer were both prominent. There were no excited whispered comments. No gossip linked Stacy's name with Marion's. And, indeed, it is an odd fact that it was difficult for a man, and still more difficult for a woman, to get talked about adversely in Vernon. This was particularly true if they were socially prominent. In that case, they must do something almost publicly scandalous, must literally be asking for it. Which, unfortunately, does not signify that morals were any higher in Vernon than elsewhere. Stacy's sensations were as mixed as ever. He was able to perceive the smooth elegance of the show, made up of the flowers, the soft light creeping through the stained glass windows of the handsome church, the rustling of costly dresses, the low murmur of fashionable voices, the smiles, the easy greetings, the ushers, and the discreet music of the organ. And he was even able to note that, though Marion was fetching enough to arouse at her appearance on her father's arm, a sudden hum of admiration before silence fell softly, she was not really at her best in that trailing lace and satin wedding gown. No, she was more beautiful in a plain tailor-made suit with a short skirt. She would have looked best of all, with her fair hair drawn back simply and bound with a ribbon, bare-armed, and with a kirtle falling only to her knees. But beneath the surface calm of Stacy's mind, fire smouldered. He was angrily stirred, angrily jealous, for he had not freed himself completely from desire of Marion. Had he, after all, been a fool to renounce her? He wondered. He might have stood there by her side in Ames's place. But at this he caught himself up scornfully. What? he thought brutally. Deliberately chain himself and her to a life of hopeless incompatibility because he desired to possess this girl's beautiful body? Was the craving of his whole soul for freedom less passionate than the mere craving of his senses for satisfaction? Poor Stacy, contradictory, stormy, inharmonious, made up of dissonances, repelled by Marion, yet desiring her, avid of freedom, but avid too of hate, an enslaving bond if ever there was one, more passionately and truly in love with beauty than ever before, yet destructive of it in himself full of power, with nowhere to direct it, hard and bitter, yet honestly anguished by the pain in the world. The ceremony over, he made his way out of the church as quickly as possible, but paused for a moment on the sidewalk to glance at the interminable line of handsome waiting motor-cars. The irony in their expensive patronage of one of Christ's churches made him suddenly smile. Then he set off on foot for the Latimer House, where the reception would be held. It was very well done, he thought, adequate, handsome, er, elegant, without being vulgarly lavish. Roses enough, but not bowers of roses, though bowers was what the paper next morning would say there had been. Champagne punch, but not tubs and pools of it. Decent air of gaiety, but no riot. Well, you could count on Mr. Latimer to carry the thing off in the right way. It was what he was for. 
fifty odd years of careful training, with never a moment wasted, had fitted him for the task. Stacy wondered what Mrs. Latimer thought about it all. Oh, she would probably be as detached as always, humorlessly but not unkindly amused by it. However, he had no chance to find out. Mrs. Latimer was much too busy receiving. His one real curiosity was to know how Marion would look at him when, in the line, he shook her hand and Ames's. He decided that she would be candid, simple and virginal, as became a bride, with no hint of anything in her greeting. But he was wrong. He was unfair to Marion, fancying her far more deliberate than she really was. The swift look she gave him was strange and enigmatic, and stirred him. There was a touch of defiance in it, as though she had said, Well, you would have it this way. Do you like what you've done? And he could not blame her if the words she spoke were merely the proper words. There were people all about. Later he came upon his sister, Julie. Oh, Stacy, she said, why couldn't you be nice and go with me to the wedding? Jimmy's out of town, so I went all alone. I saw you across the church from me, and thought I'd pick you up afterward, but when I came out I couldn't find you anywhere." He smiled at the protective solicitude in her tone. "'Oh, well,' he returned, "'I'll drive back with you to your house for a little chat, when you're ready to go.' "'I'm ready now,' she said quickly, and they went out to her electric. No one else had ventured to make any comment to Stacy when Marion's engagement to Ames Price had been announced. Even Mr. Carroll had only looked at his son in an odd, puzzled way. But Julie had ventured. She had asserted loyally that Stacy was much too good for Marion, and that Marion didn't care whom she married so long as he had money. He had reflected at the time that, though Julie simplified things down to bare essentials, it was essentials that she selected. She was not unlike their father in this, he thought. She returned to the subject now, as they glided along the city streets. "'I don't care,' she broke out hotly. "'I think she's horrid. Of course I know it must have been you who broke off the engagement. Now, wasn't it, Stacy? Why won't you admit it? Why, anybody would be proud to marry you. But then for her to go and marry a stupid person like Ames Price, old enough to be her father, too, Less than three months later, why, I think it's cheap. That's what Marion is, cheap. Stacy laughed, amused at her desire to comfort him. He enjoyed being with his sister, nor was there anything patronizing in his feeling for her. He was not doing so admirably with a complex mind that he could afford to look comfortably down upon Julie for having a simple mind. And she was not stupid. He thought she did rather well with life. Oh, he observed, Ames isn't as old as all that. He's only forty or thereabouts. I'm almost thirty-five. Well, he looks hundreds of years older. Here, take care, Stacy interrupted, stretching out his hand toward the lever, as the car barely grazed on a heavily laden motor van. Julie, you're a public menace. Then you, and he can't do a thing except play golf. Stacy laughed again this time at Julie's imperturbable calm. "'Everything's all right, old girl,' he said, "'and you needn't try to apply balm to my bruised heart, though it's nice of you to want to.' And they got out, having reached the Prout's handsome brick residence, the plans for which Stacy had drawn. But the maid who opened the door for them followed them into the living room. "'Miss Prout,' she announced tragically, "'Annie's going to leave.' "'Is she?' said Julie, drawing off her gloves. Well, that's a nuisance. Excuse me a minute, Stacy dear, while I telephone. Go mix yourself a highball. You'll find everything on the sideboard in the dining room. And she sat down at a small mahogany desk and opened a tiny cupboard that concealed a telephone. Stacy obeyed and presently returned with his glass to the living room, where he listened to his sister call up to employment agencies to make application for a cook and telephone an advertisement to two newspapers. "'You really are a wonder, Julie,' he said, when she had closed the desk, "'calm and efficient as they make em. "'Oh,' she returned, opening her eyes wide in surprise, "'that's nothing. It happens so often that I should be a silly if I were upset by it now. 
Perhaps you noticed that I didn't even have to look the telephone numbers up in the book. Now we can talk. But just at this moment the maid returned to announce the visit of a Miss Loeffler, who followed close upon the maid's heels. "'Hello, Irene,' said Julie pleasantly. "'Glad you dropped in. You don't know my brother Stacy, do you?' Miss Loeffler gave Stacy a nod and a brief firm shake of the hand, then threw herself down on the Davenport, crossed her legs, and swung the right one vigorously. She looked about twenty-four years old, had dark bobbed hair, a small pretty face with restless dark eyes and a petulant mouth, and wore a brown street suit with a very short skirt. "'Of course I don't approve of you, Captain Carroll,' she said crisply, "'because you are Captain Carroll, a tool of militarism in the late capitalist war. No, I'm glad to meet you, but I don't approve of you.' "'No, you wouldn't, of course, Irene,' Julie observed placidly. "'Oh, well,' said Stacy, "'even pity from you is more dear than that from another.' "'Naturally, if you quoted anyone at me, it would have to be someone hopelessly old-fashioned, like Shelley. Can I have a highball, Julie?' she asked, jumping up. All her movements were abrupt, like her voice. "'Of course,' said Julie. "'Oh, no, Stacy, don't try to get it for her. Irene will be cross if you do. Nevertheless, he followed Miss Loeffler into the dining-room, and at least stood by while she mixed her highball. Suddenly, in the midst of the operation, she turned to him and gazed into his eyes. "'What are you really like, Mr. Carroll?' she demanded intensely. "'Awfully orderly,' he replied, reaching out to restrain her hand that held the silver water-bottle. "'Can't bear to see things spilled.' Huh, she said disdainfully. They went back to the living room and sat down again. See, you've both been to the wedding, remarked Miss Loeffler. You look it. Have a lingering odor of ceremony about you. All very smooth and elegant, I suppose. And she lighted a cigarette. Julie was crocheting. No, Irene, she said. You needn't go around pretending to despise weddings and then come here and try to worm a description of this one out of me. If you wanted to know what it was like, you ought to have gone to it and seen for yourself. Stacy laughed, as much as his sister's keenness as at her guest's eccentricity. But Miss Loeffler was vexed. I don't pretend, she asserted hotly. I do dislike weddings, and if I ever want to go and live with a man I shall, without making a silly fuss about it, and then, when either he or I get bored, we'll simply break off. Julie sighed. I'm afraid you'll find it a very nervous, wearing life," she remarked calmly. I shouldn't care for it myself, but then I'm— Oh, perfectly hopeless, Julie. You belong back in the eighteen-eighties. What do you think about it, Mr. Carroll? About marriage? Stacy asked. Nothing at all. Doesn't interest me. But I should say you people were at least as Victorian as Julie. You're quite as excited about the necessity of not having a ceremony as old-fashioned people are about having one. Miss Loeffler insisted angrily that this was not true, but presently grew calmer. "'Anyway, you're right about one thing,' she said, finishing her highball, then setting the glass down on the floor and dropping her cigarette-end into it. "'The whole question's overstressed. We've got other bigger things to think about. Well, I must go. Just dropped in for a minute. See you again soon, Julie.' You going, Mr. Carroll? Give you a lift if you are. Thanks, said Stacy, getting up. He found the girl physically attractive, and he was glad of anything that would keep his thoughts from Marion. He followed her to her handsome runabout, and they set off swiftly. Of course, she said, I don't expect to have a car much longer. No? No, when we have Soviets in America, I suppose such cars as remain will all be in the service of the public. Of course they may put me to driving one, but more likely I'll have to cobble shoes or something. And a very good thing, too, said Stacy. Pleasant occupation, nice leathery smell, and lots of time to reflect on universal subjects. She frowned. You don't believe in me at all, do you? she demanded, looking at him petulantly. You think we're all... But in her excitement she had pressed her foot on the accelerator instead of the brake, so that they dashed past a policeman who had raised his hand to stop them, 
swerved madly around the front of a trolley car that was approaching on the cross street, sent pedestrians flying to left and right, and returned to a normal speed only a hundred yards farther along the avenue, fortunately not crowded, that they were following. Stacy sighed. "'There's not a pin to choose between you and Julie,' he remarked patiently. "'You both try to kill me the same afternoon.' Miss Loeffler laughed girlishly. "'That was stupid of me,' she admitted, "'and you were quite the calmest thing I've ever seen. But truly,' she went on earnestly, keeping the car, however, at a discreet twelve miles an hour, "'it's serious. You'd be surprised to know how much is stirring deep, deep down here in Vernon, that you'd think was a positive stronghold of capitalism. Come with me now, will you?' she said eagerly, "'and let me show you.' "'Show me what?' "'People who are really thinking, people who get together and see things straight, the social revolution, Bolshevism.' "'Dear me,' said Stacy, "'I knew Vernon was no longer provincial, but I had no idea it was so metropolitan as all that.' "'Oh, you can laugh,' she returned darkly, "'but you'll see. Of course you understand we trust your discretion.' "'Of course.' She turned off from the avenue, and stopped the car before an office building. "'We meet here,' she announced, "'in an ordinary office room, because it's so conspicuous that it's perfectly safe.' And they went up in the elevator. The large room which they presently entered had been given the semblance of a club. There were numerous easy-chairs around the floor, chintz curtains at the windows, and across one end of the room a huge oak table with a vase of flowers and many books and periodicals. Fifteen or twenty people were in the room, some standing, some sprawling in the chairs, two or three perched on the edge of the table. The air was heavy with cigarette smoke. "'Comrade Loeffler!' several voices shouted, as Irene and Stacy entered. "'And with a new comrade in tow!' cried someone. "'Well, he isn't exactly a comrade,' said Irene. "'I just brought him along, because he's so aggravating and sceptical. But he's perfectly safe. Stacy Carroll, comrades!' And with a proprietary air she drew him over to one end of the room. He rather liked Miss Loeffler. There was something so girlish beneath her pose. Stacy looked about him idly. All but five of the persons in the room were women. He knew a few of them by sight, and the faces of others were vaguely familiar to him. But he had been away from Vernon for so long, and so utterly cut off from it mentally, that it was hard for him to remember old acquaintances. Doubtless he had met nearly all these people formerly, he didn't know. Anyway, they were of a younger generation than he, in the twenties most of them. He observed that the majority of the women wore their hair bobbed. "'Why so much bobbing of hair, Miss Loeffler? Is it a symbol of freedom?' "'I suppose you might call it that,' she replied, sitting on the arm of his leather chair. "'If you were unlucky enough to be a woman, you'd appreciate the advantages of wearing your hair short.' "'It's rather becoming to you,' he observed. "'Can't say I think it is to all of them.' "'It's stupid and old-fashioned to pay compliments.' she returned coldly. They don't interest me at all. Sorry, said Stacy, but it's difficult not to, with all this air of freedom about, and you sitting so close to me. She jumped up angrily, but then, after a moment, defiantly resumed her seat on the arm of his chair. One of the young men, Comrade Leslie Vane, approached them. He wore a flowing black tie beneath a very low, soft collar. Stacy knew him, he was a poet, published things occasionally in The Pagan and The Touchstone, and the son of John Vane, the big flower man. People in Vernon were very nice about it, but naturally at heart they felt sorry for Mr. Vane, Sr., who was extremely well-liked, and rejoiced that at any rate his other son, John, Jr., was normal. Stacy was rather inclined to share Vernon's point of view in this. "'Hello, Stacy.' said Vane languidly. Glad to see a militarist with an open mind, anyhow. First example I've met with. Stacy reflected, as he acknowledged the greeting, that when the Middle West turned aesthetic it became mournfully old-fashioned. Positively, Leslie Vane was going back all of twenty-five years in search of a style. 
Sure, he said, I'm open to conviction, but what do you want to convince me of? Oh, drawled Vane, the papers have all been read, you're late, there's only just general talk going on now, but it may do you some good if you listen. A little group had gathered around them, and the smoky air became full of words, among which Soviets, proletariat, and Bolshevism predominated. Stacy, too bored to listen, fell to wondering for a moment about real Bolshevism. He shook his head. No use that either. He didn't care if change did come. In a way, he would be furiously delighted if order was upset. Things were so silly. But he didn't believe in any millennium, or even in improvement through change. What had the war accomplished? And so that, most of all, some woman was saying, is the true lesson of holy Russia. What do you think of it, Mr. Carroll? I won't call you captain. He started. Of Bolshevism? The, uh, coming social revolution? Oh, you'll all be raped, then cut in little pieces, and Comrade Leslie will have his throat cut. Not because Bolshevism is so especially worse than anything else, but because that's what always happens when any kind of violence gets loose. And do you know, I don't care a damn whether it comes or not. He meant what he said, as much as he meant anything at all, in respect to these futile idiots. But, since there was no passion in his words, and his face remained expressionless, his remarks were delightedly deemed a skilful evasion of the question. My dear, how could he say what he really thought? he a captain and a carol and an amusing pleasantry his bold use of the word rape too was much appreciated but such comments were made after his departure for neither miss loeffler's physical attractiveness nor conversation with the fashionable followers of lenin could any longer distract his mind from marion she and ames would be sitting close together now in the drawing-room of a pullman car he escaped from the club and went home However, he felt an amused curiosity to know what his sister's attitude had been toward her impetuous visitor, so he called Julie up on the telephone. "'What do you think about that wild creature that broke in on us today?' he asked. "'Irene,' said Julie's calm voice, "'oh, she's just a goose, but she's really quite nice and sweet and young at heart.' "'Yes, that's what I thought,' he assented. "'Occurred to me, though, that I'd better call you up and let you know that she hadn't eloped with me or done me any real harm, though she nearly ran us into a streetcar. Quite a good time. Now, Stacy, listen, she said anxiously. You won't go and fall in love with Irene, will you? He laughed. I won't do anything without asking you about it first, Julie. I lean on you, you know. And the odd thing about it was that in a way he did. End of chapter 8「Chapter 9 of the Lonely Warrior by Claude C. Washburn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. One morning, some three weeks later, Stacy received a night letter from Omaha. It was addressed, Honorable Stacy Carroll, and read, my husband Jim is awfully sick with flu, and I am afraid he is going to die. He keeps asking for you, though he is out of his head, and does not know what he says. Please, Captain Carroll, come if you can, because then he might get well. Gertrude Burnham Stacy wasted no time. He sent a telegram to say that he was starting immediately, telephoned for a lower berth on the evening train, and pulled a suitcase from a closet but in the midst of his neat, methodical packing, he suddenly paused and gazed abstractly away. It had occurred to him that perhaps if Burnham could see him, as he had been in France, the sick man might be more likely to recognize him, and might even, who could tell, draw a little strength from the old revived relationship of command and protectiveness. Stacy took out the things he had already packed, chose a larger bag, and put in his uniform at the bottom. He arrived in Omaha early the next morning, drove to a hotel, unpacked his bag, put on his uniform, and took a taxi to Burnham's address. The taxi stopped in front of a small dilapidated wooden house in a shabby quarter surprisingly near the center of town. 
Stacy descended and paid the chauffeur. But before he had time to reach the door of the house, it opened, and a woman hurried out to meet him. She was thin, haggard, dishevelled, though not slovenly, with a worn face and worn eyes, about which strayed limp locks of black hair. But there were faded traces of fineness in her. Stacy remembered that Burnham had always spoken of his wife with pride. She had, he often said, a high school education. "'Oh, Captain Carroll,' she cried, "'it's awfully good of you to come, sir. I knew I oughtn't to have asked you, but I didn't know what to do.' "'Of course you ought,' Stacy returned briefly, shaking her hand. "'And you wore your uniform, too,' she added, with a pale half-smile. "'That was just right. I wouldn't have thought you'd have thought of that.' They entered the house, in which the Burnhams occupied one half of the second floor. Three small children, shabby and not very clean, with frightened faces, were waiting for them just inside, and stared at Stacy. "'I keep them looking better than this, Captain Carroll, when everything's all right,' Mrs. Burnham explained apologetically, and they all climbed the stairs in silence. As they went, Stacy reflected swiftly on a number of things. That what life did to Burnham was very like what it did to Phil, and a lot of criminal rubbish was being talked about the prosperous working man. Why, thought Stacy, even his father, who was a kindly man, declared bitterly that workmen were buying silk shirts today and denounced them as profiteers. Well, suppose a man did earn six dollars a day for manual labor, suppose he even earned it regularly for six days in every week, which he didn't. How much was that a year? Let's see eighteen hundred and some dollars, on which, with the price of everything gone wild, he was supposed to raise a family and live in luxury. What rot! Stacy himself, who lived at home, had a car that his father had given him, and cared little for luxuries, felt pinch with two hundred dollars a month. Oh, damn money! They reached the top of the stairs and paused before a door through which came a strange murmuring voice. "'Jim won't know you, sir, not now,' said Mrs. Burnham. "'But if you'd be willing just to sit there a while, maybe—' "'Of course,' said Stacy. "'You have a good doctor?' "'Yes, sir. At least, I guess he's good. They don't any of them seem much help. He'll be here at ten o'clock.' They went in, Stacy and Mrs. Burnham. The children were left outside the door. Burnham, flushed with fever, lay tossing and muttering on a narrow bed. Stacy looked down at him and lifted his hot hand, but there was no recognition in the man's eyes. "'I'll sit here,' said Stacy after a moment, drawing up a chair beside the bed. The woman silently took another chair, and they remained so for an hour and a half, neither of them speaking, she rising at regular intervals to press a spoonful of medicine between her husband's teeth, until the doctor arrived. He was brusque had keen eyes, and appeared competent. Stacy drew him aside at the conclusion of the visit. "'Any chance?' "'Yes,' said the doctor. Fifty-fifty. He's as likely to recover as not. Splendid physique. There's nothing much I can do except to give stimulants in case of sudden collapse. We don't know anything about flu, really, you know, and this pneumonia that follows on flu. I've seen hundreds die of it. I was in France, too. And hundreds get well.' both without any reason. Served under you? My first sergeant. Good man. No better. Do your best for him. It's a strong bond, isn't it? Stacy nodded. Oughtn't he to have a nurse? It would be a great deal better. He'd have more of a chance. Then send one around, will you please? At my expense, of course. All right, said the doctor, shook hands with Stacy and departed. The conversation had taken place in the hallway, outside the door. When Stacy re-entered the sick room, Mrs. Burnham gazed at him wistfully. "'It's all right,' he said. "'Jim's got a good chance. The doctor's going to send a nurse.' Her eyes filled with tears. She opened her mouth as though to speak, but closed it again, with only a strangled, "'Thanks,' and turned her head away. After a time she got up. "'I'll go down and cook some dinner,' she said. "'You'll excuse me, sir, if it isn't much, won't you? I haven't had time to—' "'No,' he broke in. "'You're too tired to cook. 
please go out and get some lunch for yourself and the children if you know of some delicatessen place and for me too and he drew out his purse but at this her face coloured no sir she said with just a hint of resentment i couldn't he thrust a five-dollar bill upon her do as i tell you he said imperiously this is no time for silly pride go on and mind you get good things and plenty of them she cowered beneath his sternness and went meekly. And Stacy reflected grimly that pride was a decorative handsome emotion that flourished ornamentally, a highly esteemed orchid, in luxury. It couldn't grow well in poverty, came up sickly and scrawny, the soil was too weak. Half an hour later he heard her climb the stairs again and move quietly about the next room. Presently she returned to the bedroom. "'Will you go in there now, sir?' she said. "'Everything's ready for you. Here's your change. Two dollars and sixty-four cents.' "'No, no, please,' he replied. "'Keep it for to-morrow.' He wanted to insist on her eating first, but thought best not to try. So he went, without comment, through the door she indicated, into another bedroom, the only other, he supposed, that obviously also served as dining-room and parlour. Dishes were disposed neatly on a table, with sandwiches, bologna sausage, eggs, coffee, and doughnuts. He sat down, then looked up, listening, with a smile, and suddenly rose, crossed the room, and flung open another door. The kitchenette. And there, as he thought, were the three children, sitting, very terrified at his discovery of them, close together on a small bench. "'Hello,' he said. "'You're out here, are you?' well come on let's eat together only i think we'd better do it in this room or your mother will hear us she said we was to wait and not make a noise observed the oldest girl in a small voice well we won't wait stacy remarked there are doughnuts you know you come on in with me he said to the girl who had spoken on your tiptoes and help fix the plates she obeyed timidly first we'll fix one for your mother he whispered, and she nodded, her lips pressed together. He and the three children ate gravely in the kitchenette. Then Stacy rose. I'll go back to your father now, he said, and send your mother out. Your plate is ready for you, Mrs. Burnham, and the children have eaten, he announced in a triumphant whisper. She gasped, then suddenly her mouth curved prettily into a smile, the first he had seen her give. Stacy sat down again by the bedside. Burnham seemed a little calmer now, and his incoherent muttering had ceased, but he looked very exhausted, and Stacy was relieved when about one o'clock the nurse arrived. The three of them sat there silently all the hot afternoon, with only short intervals of release when Stacy stretched his legs in the hall or Mrs. Burnham went out to keep an eye on the children. There was no change in the sick man. The nurse said that the crisis would probably be reached the next day. At six o'clock Stacy left the house, asking the nurse to telephone him in case of a serious change. He walked back to his hotel. He was abstracted, an isolated personality, growing more isolated with every month that passed in his life, so that now he saw little of his surroundings and glanced but carelessly both at the depressing quarter from which he had set out and the prosperous business section he presently entered. He merely thought, idly, that the city seemed a characterless place, like all other Midwestern cities. And the imposing courthouse of white marble that he passed shortly before reaching his hotel did not impress him. It did, indeed, occur to him once that there was a certain tensity in the air, like that which characterizes a city in boom times but the observation, purely involuntary, did not particularly interest him. It interested him not at all when later, glancing through the front page of a local paper, he learned the cause of the tensity. Trouble with the Negroes. Quote, another dastardly assault. Unquote. Early the next morning, he was back at Burnham's house. The man seemed worse, Stacy thought, with a touch of real sadness, more feverish, more restless. There was no capacity for smiling, even faintly, left in Mrs. Burnham. The nurse, cool, professional, would express no opinion, and the doctor, too, when he came, was non-committal. 
Before tonight, there ought to be a decision one way or the other, he said to Stacy. I'll call again at four. Call me up earlier if necessary. There was nothing to do but wait, and Stacy again settled himself in a chair near the foot of the bed. The crisis came early in the afternoon. Burnham tossed and kicked furiously, and his incoherent muttering grew louder. Suddenly he raised himself on the palms of his hands into a half-sitting posture and stared directly at Stacy, or not really at him, through him. "'By God, Captain!' he cried wildly, in a high, unnatural voice. "'You've got nerve! Might have been shot! 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 What hell you care! You wouldn't do it!' he panted. "'Not you, Captain! Said I'd follow you to hell! Nerve! Nerve! Nerve!' His voice trailed away to silence, while the nurse leaned over him, pressing his shoulders down firmly. Stacy had started at the words. They were spoken, he knew, in delirium, not to him, but to a shadow vanished eleven months since. But Stacy understood them. Burnham knew, then, did he, about that Argonne attack? Good! Probably no other kind of approbation from any source would have touched Stacy even faintly. This, for an instant, made him thrill with a fierce, proud happiness. The next moment there was nothing left in his consciousness but concern for his friend. But Burnham lay quiet now, his color less vivid, his breath coming and going easily, and the nurse looked at Stacy and Mrs. Burnham with a smile. "'I think he'll get along all right now,' she said pleasantly. Stacy wiped his forehead, and Mrs. Burnham, collapsing into a chair, laid her head on a table, and wept softly. "'Fine,' said the doctor when he came. "'He'll get well now. Just a question of time.' The next morning, when Mrs. Burnham opened the door to Stacy, he observed that she was wearing a clean dress and had done her hair quite prettily. "'Then Jim's a lot better, isn't he?' he asked with a smile. She flushed. "'Yes,' she said. "'He slept right through the night.' only woke up once for just a minute, then went back to sleep again. Oh, I'm so glad, Captain Carroll, her eyes filled, and so grateful to you, sir. Oh, please, said Stacy, embarrassed. Late in the morning Burnham opened his eyes slowly and let them wander curiously about the room. They rested on Stacy, and a puzzled expression came into them, then, after a moment, recognition and the man tried to raise his hand in salute. "'Where's the devil, sir?' he asked in a thin voice. Then he smiled. "'Funny,' he said. "'I thought I was in hell.' And he began to laugh weakly. "'Shut up, Burnham,' Stacy commanded sternly, "'and lie still.' "'Oh, all right, Captain, all right,' Burnham returned, still laughing, and went to sleep again at once. Stacy was rather tired in the evenings now from sitting so monotonously still all day. He resented the excitement that he felt throbbing in the streets, and the nervous buzz of the groups through which he had to elbow his way in the hotel lobby. His one recreation consisted in changing to civilian clothes for dinner, for he always wore his uniform when he went to the Burnhams. It happened that the regiment in which he had commanded a battalion had been recruited from this part of the country so that there were perhaps twenty-five of his men living right here in Omaha, among them a first lieutenant whom he sincerely liked, and, ignorant though he was, and knew himself to be of these men's real personalities, he was bound to each of them, worst as well as best, by a closer bond than that which held him to Philip Blair, or to Marion, or to Mrs. Latimer. He would have given lavishly of his money or his time, nonsense, of something real, his freedom or his strength, to any of these men who needed it, and not in the least from a sense of duty, inevitably as a matter of course. Yet he had no companionable desire to see them. He made no attempt to look them up. He spent his evenings in bed, reading War and Peace, which in former days he had not cared for, but now found singularly satisfying, more satisfying than any book by his old idol Dostoevsky. Burnham's recovery was extraordinary. On the third day after the crisis, the doctor refused jovially to waste more time in visiting him. The nurse had been dismissed the day before, and told him to eat, 
talk, and do as he pleased, short of getting up. "'I think,' observed Stacy that afternoon, "'that I'll pull out tonight on the midnight. You're as fit as ever, Burnham.' He was, indeed, restless and anxious to go. Here, sitting near Burnham, chatting casually of trivial things, he was strangely at peace, but an increasing turmoil that he felt in the city each evening exasperated him. The man looked at him wistfully, then across at his wife. Gertie, he said, you go out with the kids for a while, will you? I got to talk to the captain. She obeyed, but her face had flushed, and her eyes were resentful. Now you've done it, said Stacy cheerfully. Fat lot of popularity I'll have with Gertrude from now on. Burnham laughed. Funny thing, ain't it, Captain? he observed. They can't seem to get on to it at all, women can't. They go and get jealous, like Gertie now. Can't get on to what? Why, this, this here what do you call it? Relationship? Uh-huh, I guess that's the word. It ain't got a thing to do with them, he paused. Maybe that's why they don't like it, he concluded. Philosopher, said Stacy, analyzing the female heart. You'll be writing for the magazines next. Sure, Burnham grinned, then frowned. All the same, I don't get on to it very well myself, he continued. Now you think I ought to be feeling all upset with gratitude to you, the way Gertie is, and worried about you wasting so much of your time and money. Well, I don't feel that way at all. Damned if I do. I just feel friendly and pleasant and natural-like. And of course some day I'm going to pay you back the money you spent on the nurse and doctor, but it don't seem important somehow, like it does to Gertie. If it was something you cared about, Captain, I'd get up now, the way I am, and work all day to get it for you. But Christ, you don't care a damn for money. Oh, shut up, Burnham, said Stacy, laughing. How you do run on. Nevertheless, the man's words were pleasant to him, and reinforced his own strangely peaceful mood. Seems sort of noisy outdoors today, Burnham remarked suddenly. What's the row, I wonder? And, indeed, through the window, a dull and sullen murmur, that was like a deep note held steadily in an organ, did enter and penetrate the room. Oh, replied Stacy quickly, I don't know. It's a noisy city. Burnham lay silent for a long time. Then he turned his eyes slowly to Stacy. And in them and in his voice, when he spoke again, was apparent a timidity which his huge bulk and rough unshaven face made somehow touching. Captain, he said hesitantly, there was something I wanted to say to you, only I don't know if I've got the nerve. We boys was always kind of scared of you, you know? Oh, not because you was a captain, fat lot of respect we had for captains as captains, but just because, oh, I don't know, and it's kind of hard to say anything to you that's kind of personal, as you might say. All the same, I'll take a chance. He rushed on with his words to get it over. What I want to say is that some of us know all about that attack that didn't come off. He paused apprehensively, but with a sigh of relief. However, Stacy was as friendly as before. Yes, he said quietly, I know you do. You let that out Wednesday in a lot of wild talk you were spouting. Well, what do you know about that? Burnham exclaimed. And me, who wouldn't have told even Gertie. Did anyone? No, no, it's all right. No one else understood. And I'm glad you know. And that's why I said what I did about going with you to hell or anywhere else. I ain't the only one, Captain. There's Morgan and Jones and Pettyval and Isaacs and all the rest of C Company that knows who'd fight to go along too. Oh, it would be a nice little family party. And Burnham laughed gaily. Well, Stacy had said to Phil months ago that this was the one exploit of which he was proud, but he had said so haughtily, with his heart full of bitterness. Just now his heart was calm, as though cleansed. He was almost happy yet he could hardly have accounted for his state of mind, even had he cared to try. It was not, certainly, that his vanity was flattered. Perhaps it was, in part, that when Stacy had related the episode to Philip Blair, his defiance of the machine was first in his thoughts, while now the stress was on the human results of that defiance. 
perhaps Burnham's simple assertion of loyalty released Stacy from his obsessing perception of greed, greed everywhere. But the noise outside had increased. Rolling waves of sound entered. "'What in hell is going on?' Burnham exclaimed. "'Tell me, Captain. You know all right.' "'Well,' said Stacy doubtfully, but thinking it on the whole better not to have the invalid aggravated by unsatisfied curiosity, there's been a lot of race trouble here lately. Just now it seems to be mostly about some negro, name of Brown, said to have assaulted a woman. He's shut up in the courthouse jail, I believe. Sounds as though some sort of demonstration. But at this moment a scattered crackling sound broke out in the distance. Burnham sat up quickly, and Stacy crossed to the window and looked out. Some sort of demonstration, said Burnham. Some sort of riot. That's shooting. Stacy nodded, pulled down the window sash, and came back to his chair. Mrs. Burnham entered the room hurriedly, but, though frightened, she had not forgotten her grievance. "'I suppose I can come in now,' she said, "'since there's a war or something going on.' "'Sure,' returned her husband, laughing. "'It's nothing, Gertie.' Darkness fell while they sat there together, Mrs. Burnham soon ashamed of her pettishness, and trying to think up little things she could do for Stacy. Burnham stretching his arms and legs to feel their returning strength, all three chatting about the most casual matters. A lamp sputtered a light in the street and shone in upon them. Oddly, Stacy thought of that afternoon with Phil and Catherine in New York five years ago. He had the same sense of calm now as then. But this sea of sound that roared dully in the distance, at times swelling for a moment, so that Mrs. Burnham turned her eyes apprehensively to Stacy, it had been absent then. Had it, though. What else was the war? Stacy thought fancifully. Well, I've really got to go now, he remarked, and rose. Mrs. Burnham tried stammeringly to express her gratitude, but Burnham only gripped Stacy's hand and smiled. May I say good-bye to the children? asked Stacy, and Mrs. Burnham, too, smiled at this and went in search of them. Now look here, Captain, said her husband anxiously, in a low voice, as soon as she had left the room. You won't get mixed up in that mess in the streets, will you? Stacy shook his head. No, no, I'll be all right, he replied reassuringly. The noise outside continued. End of chapter 9 Chapter Ten of the Lonely Warrior by Claude C. Washburn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Stacy glanced up and down the street, but it lay quiet and empty in the brightness of its regularly spaced arc lights. The noise came from the direction of the center of town, and as this was also the direction of his hotel, he sighed and set off toward it. He sighed because he felt himself stepping back into the old shadow from the rare brightness of his recent mood. It occurred to him that life was like that, someone had said, a handful of peaceful islands scattered stingily over a tumultuous sea, which figure reveals how little he knew himself, what he was and what he wanted, for at heart he did not crave repose. He turned a corner, the rumble of sound became a roar and he was on the edge of the crowd. Some distance down the street into which he had emerged, on the left at its intersection by another wider thoroughfare, he could make out a corner of the white marble courthouse that had left him unimpressed. And one side of this building, the east it must be, stretched along flush with the street that Stacy followed. But all about and obscuring such part of the structure as lay within his vision, there was now a black howling throng, while, over all, smoke hung. And even here, where Stacy stood, the crowd was dense. Traffic had ceased. Motor cars stood motionless. Men had scrambled up the sides of them and clung there, all staring in one direction. And from the windows of the houses flanking the street, more people leaned and gazed. Here the crowd was not yet a mass, groups only. But as Stacy went forward toward the courthouse, which was perhaps an eighth of a mile away, it thickened, so that to traverse it it became increasingly difficult. 
and as it thickened its temper grew manifestly warmer. A confusion of cries agitated it. Sometimes they burst into a refrain. Nigger! Nigger! We want that nigger! Arms were thrown up, gesticulating wildly, and there were little centres of local interest, a man suddenly hauling himself up to the shoulders of another for a view and thrown down again fiercely, snarling contests over invaded personal rights, animal-like squeals of women at the crushing pressure upon them. The sweating faces had a bestial look beneath the arc-lights, and a sourish human odour tainted the warm air. Noise! Noise! Stacy was not feeling anger, only a deep disgust, disgust of crowds, sick disgust of all humanity. His emotion was the more acute for its contrast with the mood he had felt in Burnham's house. He was like a man who had made a longer jump by taking a running start. So this was the kind of thing on which perpetual peace and leagues of nations were to be founded, was it? he thought coldly. He would have gone back out of its contamination, having certainly no desire to witness the spectacle it clamoured for, save that he had some desperate idea of perhaps being able to assist the few who must somewhere be standing off the multitude. So he fought his way forward, inch by inch, helped perhaps a very little by the fact that he was in uniform, using his shoulders and elbows mercilessly in cold contempt of his victims, shrieked at, cursed at, struck at even, but making progress, until at last he came, panting, to the corner of his own street and that other wider avenue. He could get no farther, either ahead or to the left. The crowd was a solid wall, and to return was equally impossible. He could only stay where he was and hope that something might happen, some movement in the mob, that would make it possible for him to push through suddenly and reach the courthouse. He stood on tiptoe and looked about him. He was almost at the corner, close to the right-hand edge of the street, and he perceived that here the latter was flanked by the side wall of what he took to be a theatre. In the wall, some two or three feet above the ground, were embrasures, vantage points held with difficulty by tightly wedged groups. As Stacy looked, a sudden backward surge of the crowd swept down and away two such members of one group, and Stacy, diving desperately in, himself struggled up to the place and held it against all contestants. All events were submerged beneath a roar of voices, a sea of noise that broke in echoing waves against the sides of the buildings. It was an emotion in itself, irrespective of its cause. It hypnotized the crowd, produced a singular wild stare in men's eyes, made their movements jerky, their own involuntary addition to the noise raucous. It did not hypnotize Stacy, because he was aloof, remote, and also because he was too familiar with noise. Yet he, too, had undergone its terrible spell early in the war, before he had grown hard enough to bear the unbearable. He knew bitterly well what Siegfried Sassoon meant by, I'm going stark staring mad because of the guns. Stacy threw one last contemptuous glance at the mob beneath him, then gazed off over their heads at the courthouse. The first thing he noted was that it was on fire, smoke creeping dully from its ground-floor windows. The second, that fighting was going on inside it, since the south door, that opening on the wide cross street, was shattered, while through it rushed in or were driven back mad struggling clusters of men. Good for the police, thought Stacy. Oh, by God, I wish I were there. Two firemen appeared at a third-floor window, and from the nozzle of the hose they held, a stream shot down upon the crowd. There was a wild surging movement that swept to the crowd even here, pushing it back upon itself tumultuously. Snarls of anger rose. There were struggles, shrieks, fists striking out, mad efforts of individuals to keep from being crushed. And up ahead on the left the lighted air was shadowed by the bricks and stones hurled through it against the courthouse. The courthouse windows shattered in fragments. Stacy could not hear them crash. The noise of voices submerged all other sounds, as it was submerging thought. But he could see the jagged black gaps appear, and the shining rain of glass. 
he held his place in the embrasure with difficulty clinging to an iron ring in the wall and to his nearest companion then suddenly a vast exultant roar shook the crowd the stream of water had ceased cut it we've cut their damned hose cut it cut it the crowd was wilder now frenzied stacy looking down saw faces convulsed venomous filthy with ugliness he felt a shudder of loathing and recollected with passionate assent what anatole france had called life a sickness a leprosy a mould on the face of the earth nigger give us that nigger time passed stacy knowing mobs thought that perhaps eventually this one would wear itself out on its own emotion begin to break up into individuals sick with fatigue and little by little disperse but he soon perceived that it had too varied a spectacle to witness an immense vicious vaudeville something new every few minutes a ladder thrown against the courthouse wall half scaled by eight or ten youths pushed slowly back by the defenders and crashing over at last to earth the scalers leaping off wildly as it fell a rush through the door fighting shots even so the mob had sullen moments when its roar sank to a rumble but again it occurred to stacy that it was being lashed up afresh by leaders there was a young man on a white horse there in the street before the besieged building twice he wheeled his horse about and harangued the crowd his voice was inaudible here but the emotion he created immediately around him swept on like something tangible beyond the reach of his words and his gestures stirred men to renewed frenzy also it struck stacy that while here at the corner the crowd was jammed beyond hope of penetration there on the left just before the south side of the courthouse where the fighting was sharpest was room to move there were rushes assaults the fighting part of the mob was relatively small oh they all wanted the negro damn them they wanted blood and torture but as spectators if only he could get there and at this thought that there were deliberate leaders anger began to rise in stacy who till now had felt only disgust and scorn but a sudden whirling streamer of red light curved into a broken window of the courthouse and a dull explosion made the air throb a red glare flamed up inside the building and a great ah came from the crowd by god look at it a bomb oh christ a bomb oh look at her burn nigger we'll get him now oh nigger ay shouts leaps struggles madness the crowd could afford to wait now thought stacy looking on grimly as black smoke poured from windows and rose in clouds begriming the marble walls it was late how long had he been here in this filth two hours three stacy looked at his watch ten thirty he gazed back wearily down the street in a sullen despair beneath which anger smouldered an outrage to be born into such a world and he could not take refuge in himself he hated himself as he hated the mob oh he did not of course feel with them now what was a black man's life or a white man's any man's his own philip blair's even to deserve such clamour he was hard crusted over with bitterness but there had been times in france when a sudden frenzied shriek from the mob made him start and turn his eyes back to the courthouse on the steps at its entrance that opening on the street which stacy had followed alone in the lurid smoky light stood a man rather stout not tall but impressive in his solitude the mayor it's the mayor smith mayor came in a shattered volley of cries from about then in one fierce burst of sound nigger give us that nigger 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 and after this dwindling sound save from the storm centre at the south entrance where the news could not be known finally a semblance of silence stacy could not hear the man's voice when he spoke i can't do that boys he learned later the words had been but he could see him shake his head and could see the firm negative gesture he made with both extended hands an immense insane howl of anger burst out 
a crowd surged up the east steps, and the solitary figure disappeared among them, dragged down in a chaotic black mass of assailants. A thrill of exultation and anger ran through Stacy. By God, he'd stood them off, one living man with a soul of his own against the mob, and he was to be dragged down like that, killed for it? Beside himself, Stacy leaped to the ground and fought madly to break through to the one man on the scene. Impossible. Far from pushing forward, he was caught in a sudden retreating surge of the throng and swept back, back, raging, down the street, to the edge of a narrow roofed-in alley that led out of it behind the theatre building. Here he held his own once more. Mad cries of wrath against the mayor came from all about him. Nigger lover! Get the nigger lover! Lynch him! Close to Stacy, a heavy red-faced man was shaking his clenched fists high in the air. Oh, lynch him! The goddamn son of a bitch! Oh, nigger lover! Oh, kill him! Lynch him! He shrieked, his voice hoarse, his face purple, convulsed, incredibly bestial and suddenly a white, ungovernable rage flared up in Stacy. There was nothing left of his personality but rage. He seized the man about the waist, and, helped by a new surge of the crowd, half flung him, half was swept with him, back into the narrow dark entrance of the alley, and down it. The momentum gathered from the crowd hurled both forward, staggering, and separated them. But Stacy was upon his man again instantly, they were perhaps thirty yards down the alley in a semi-obscurity. "'Here, you! What do you—' Stacy merely dived, in hot silence, for the man's throat, and fastened his hands upon it tensely. The victim struck out wildly, gasped, kicked, but Stacy bent him back and leaned over, sinking his thumbs deeper and deeper with every ounce of his great strength into the fleshy throat. And, as he pressed, he had the delirious exultant delusion that he was strangling all humanity. His teeth were set. His eyes were terrible with hatred. The man's face grew violet. His eyes protruded loathsomely. His gurgling mouth opened to press out a swollen tongue. Then all at once he relaxed weakly, his whole body limp. Stacy flung him off, and he fell in a sprawled motionless heap to the ground. Stacy looked down for a moment and pushed the body with the toe of his shoe, then turned away, wiping his hands on his handkerchief. He was quite calm again, fierce, but with no further impulse to kill. He did not go back and fight his way into the crowd once more. Where was the use? He could not break through. Instead, he followed the alley in, leaving the roar of the crowd behind him, and came out eventually into another street, parallel with the one he had left. It, too, was crowded, but not densely like the first. Stacy made his way off from it swiftly, and before long reached still another street, empty, silent. But from back over there, behind the intervening house walls, came yet wilder noise and crackling volleys of shots. They had got the negro, Stacy supposed. He strode on for a long, long time, half an hour, an hour, heedless of direction, turning corners aimlessly, until at last he was walking up a street down which, toward him, people were flowing in groups, talking loudly. The show was over, no doubt, the audience dispersing. He heard excited comments. The nigger got his all right. Damn shame about the mayor. Oh, I dunno, too damn fresh. Stacy whirled about and caught the man who said it was a shame. Did they kill the mayor? he demanded. The man addressed stared, open-mouthed, with frightened eyes at Stacy's stern voice. No, he stammered. They hung him up tw twice, but he was, was cut down. He's all right, I guess. Th they got him away. I said it was a damn shame, he added weakly, trying to release himself from Stacy's grasp. Stacy did not reply, but withdrew his hand and strode on, his teeth set. Again he walked aimlessly for a long while, but at last, making a wide curve, he turned back toward the noise that still came in broken waves from the riot center. Finally, led by the glow of the fire, he approached the courthouse once more, 
but now from the north. On this side it was not flush with the street, but set in some fifty yards behind an ornamental grass plot. Street, grass plot, and curving walks were covered with a howling throng, not so thick as to prevent passage, but rushing wildly this way and that, under the red light from the burning building. The centre of the confusion, Stacy presently made out, to be a motor-car, careering about through the crowd, that shouted exultantly and stumbled back out of its path. All at once it bore down on Stacy. He sprang aside to avoid it, then, looking back, saw that after it, at the end of a rope, trailed a shapeless, bumping object. The rope that towed this curious object, caught for a moment on an electric light pole, the car came to a temporary halt and Stacy, bending over to look at the thing more closely, perceived that it was the charred, naked, and limbless torso of a man. Three hysterical girls, their hats awry, their arms linked, pushed him out of the way and kicked, squealing at the dead flesh. Stacy left the scene. He found a small lunchroom open in a neighboring street. It was crowded with genial, exulting ex-rioters, but Stacy pressed up to the counter, ordered sandwiches and coffee, and gulped them down ravenously. He was frankly famished. This did not shock him. He was too familiar with the physical effects of emotion even to give it a thought. And, indeed, so far as emotion went, he had, despite his almost impassive bearing, gone through more of it than the mob itself. For the mob had hated the negro and the mayor. Stacy had been consumed with hatred of the colossal mob itself, and of all men, all human life. He left the lunchroom and went to his hotel. As he reached its doorway, there was an echoing tramp of steady feet, and he turned to see a company of infantry march past. He saluted, and the officer marching beside the men saluted in return, gravely. "'It's time,' thought Stacy bitterly. If I'd had two men and a machine-gun, I could have cleared the street. He thought he was done with all sympathy for armies. Error! He would have given his right hand to-night to be in command of his battalion. Not because he cared for law and order. He didn't give that for law and order. But because he could have saved the mayor, one brave man, a living individual, from the collective beast. And because he could have saved the negro. But mostly because he could have killed. Killed! He entered the hotel. Here, too, though the hour was late, were excited groups. Stacy pushed through them and up to the desk. "'The key to four hundred and twelve, he demanded peremptorily. But the clerk, his elbows on the desk, was listening to the voluble conversation of a group of commercial travellers and paid no attention. Stacy seized a paperweight, lifted it, and flung it down with a crash. "'Damn you! The key to 412,' I said, and be quick about it." The clerk jumped. Y "'Yes, sir,' he stammered, and reached a trembling hand for the key. Probably at a normal moment he would have asserted his right to respect as a free American citizen. Tonight things were rather strange. End of chapter 10「Chapter Eleven of the Lonely Warrior » by Claude C. Washburn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The next morning, after Stacy had bathed, he stood for a moment, reflecting, then again put on his uniform. In the midst of dressing, he paused to look in the telephone directory for the name of the lieutenant whom he had especially liked in his first company, and who, he remembered, lived in Omaha. He called up the number. Curtis Trail's house? Oh, this trail? Good. Stacy Carroll talking. He heard a joyful exclamation. It is. What are you doing here? Where are you? Stacy told him. Then you, you saw all that mess last night? Yes, said Stacy dryly. Listen, Trail, can I see you this morning? If you'll tell me how to get to where you live, I'll... You will not? I'll be around at the hotel for you inside of twenty minutes. All right, thanks. You'll find me in the dining-room. Bye. 
Stacy went down into the dining room and ordered breakfast. Then he unfolded a newspaper. Outwardly he appeared as unmoved as ever. It was only when he came upon the one piece of news he cared about. Mayor's condition serious. Still unconscious at three this morning. Doctors hopeful. A ripple of emotion passed over his face. He ate his breakfast calmly. But on page four he happened upon a small item, cursorily recorded, which he read with interest. At twelve-thirty this morning, after the termination of the riot, Sergeant of Police Bassett, who was patrolling 17th Street, heard groans issuing from the covered alley leading in behind the Boyd Theatre. On investigating, he discovered that they came from a man lying in the alley in a semi-unconscious condition, and apparently suffering from attempted strangulation. When able to speak, he at first gave his name as John Smith, and claimed to have been assaulted, at what time he could not say, by a man wearing a U.S. Army uniform. Later he admitted he was Adolph Kraft, of 1102 Chicago Street, and withdrew his first story, declaring that he was attacked by an unknown man while endeavoring to restrain the rioters from further violence. He was taken to Ford Hospital, where his condition was said to be serious but not critical. The police attach little credence to either story told by Kraft, believing his injury to be the result of some personal vengeance carried out during the confusion of the riot. Kraft was formerly a bartender, and so far as known has no present occupation. He has been twice convicted of petty offences. So I didn't kill him after all, thought Stacy doesn't appear that he'd have been much of a loss. But he reflected dispassionately, merely as noting a fact, that in his assault he had shown the same overwhelming desire to kill that had possessed the mob. That the cause was different on his part did not matter a straw. His intense will to murder had been the same as theirs. Too bad. Not detached enough. Not detached enough. He should have slain the man coldly. A cordial voice interrupted his meditations. "'Well, Captain, I say, you're in uniform. You, of all people. How come?' "'Hello, Trail,' said Stacy, looking up and shaking hands. The lieutenant was young, and had a fresh, pleasant expression when, as now, he was smiling. When, as a moment later, his face grew sober again, there was a certain gravity in it, as though a curtain had been dropped a hint of the same shadow that hung about Stacy. And this odd contrast in the young man's face, between buoyant youthfulness and weary knowledge, impressed Stacy, since he had not seen Trail for many months, and was therefore now seeing him freshly. "'This is fine,' Trail continued swiftly, "'but it was pretty rotten of you to be here so long, and never let me know. Oh, I know all about it now, you see. Dropped around at Burnham's on the way here.' How is he? Fine. He told me about your coming and staying with him. Confound it, he might have let me know he was sick. But no, his wife had to go and wire you, Trail concluded ruefully, pausing for breath. He sat down. Have some breakfast? Thanks, no, I've eaten. Then you, you saw all that last night? Stacy nodded. Have you read the estimable comment in the morning paper? He asked. Listen. Whatever the provocation, it does not warrant any band of men taking the law into their own hands unless they are prepared to face the judgment of their fellow citizens for such an act. Seems sufficiently moderate, don't you think? Trail flushed. Isn't that damnable, he blurted out boyishly. You must think I live in a rotten town. No, said Stacy somberly. I wish I did think so. If that were all there was to it, we could band together cheerfully to blow up Omaha. "'I tell you what, Captain,' Trail cried, his face stern. "'We're going after the leaders if we can get them, going after them hard. There are scores of names listed already. There'll be twice as many by tonight. General Wood's been ordered here, arriving tomorrow morning, and meanwhile we're organizing the Legion men.' Stacy nodded. "'I thought you would be.' That's what I particularly wanted to see you about. I'm not from here, of course, but I want you to let me in on it." Trail's face radiated a sudden joyful surprise. "'You, Captain? 
he exclaimed. Why not? asked Stacy coolly, lighting a cigarette. Well, stammered the other, I... Of course we'll take you in with a rush. You're in uniform, too. How come? Stacy looked at him thoughtfully. You needn't be embarrassed, Trail, he said. You're quite right. I don't like army stuff, and I don't care a fig about helping maintain law and order in this pleasant world. But if, he said, his eyes and voice hard, I can do any fighting against a thousand beasts that tortured one lone individual, and especially that mauled and half-killed the one man who stood up to them. His teeth snapped together. Why, then, I'd like to, that's all, he concluded in his normal voice. Trail stared at him for a moment in silence. Come home with me, he said, and rose. Sure, remarked Stacy calmly. Just give me time to sign my check. Trail's car was outside. They entered it and drove swiftly off. Just to show you the way some of us feel about this, the lieutenant remarked presently, I'll tell you that I've been phoning steadily ever since 6.30 this morning. That's why you got me so promptly when you called up. To our boys? Trail nodded. What results? The lieutenant frowned, gave the car a sudden exasperated burst of speed, then slowed down somewhat unsatisfactory. Hang it, they won't come. Only two of them, Mills and Jackson, were at my house now. Did you really think they'd volunteer? No, said Trail shortly, I didn't. The ones who'll jump at the job will be the sweet lads who drilled in safe camps and never so much as saw a transport. Oh well, Stacy replied coolly, that wasn't their fault, and no more's their point of view. You're a funny cuss, Trail. Here you are, wanting men to show up, yet I'm blessed if you aren't railing at the ones who do, and praising your men because they don't. That's right, admitted the other, laughing sheepishly. But then, aren't we all that? Funny cusses, I mean. We chaps who saw the real show? He added meditatively. Anyhow, will you try them, Captain? Maybe, he concluded diffidently, they'll come for you. Stacy nodded. I'll try, he assented. How many enlisted men of C Company, your company, live here? Twelve, said Trail promptly. And how many of D Company, do you happen to know? Ten. Here we are. They turned into a curved driveway leading up to a handsome residence. Trail hurried Stacy out of the car and down the hall of the house to the library. Here's who I made you wait for, boys, he cried. You didn't know, eh? The two men in the room sprang to salute, surprise and unmistakable pleasure in their faces. Stacy felt a sudden touch of gratitude that was like the warm trickle of a brook into an ice-bound lake. Yet he said little enough to the men in the way of greeting, only a word or two, and shook their hands. Then he plunged at once into business. Mills, he said, can you and Jackson corral all the men of your company and of D Company too, and get them around here to see me, without obligation to anything? Say at noon sharp. That all right, Lieutenant? Trail nodded. Yes, sir, they replied in unison. All right. Let's make out a list, Lieutenant. Now what's to do? Trail remarked impatiently when the men had departed. He was walking nervously about the room. Do, said Stacy. Nothing unless you can give me a drink. You bet I can, the other cried boyishly, and pushed a bell in the wall. Leagues and leagues of wine cellar, family away in Maine, whole house to myself. Great. Come in, Blake. Scotch, please. V.O.P. And glasses and ice and all that sort of thing. He flung himself down in a chair. Funny. Ever since I got back, I feel as though I had to be doing something all the time, and yet there isn't a damn thing I really want to do. You feel that way at all, Captain? Yes, said Stacy, smoking moodily. Now let's see, he added in a different tone. Where do we stand? What's the state of affairs in town? Trail sat up, alert again. Two companies of troops from Fort Crook patrolling the city. Couldn't get here last night in time to do any good, he added bitterly, because permission had to be granted from Washington first. I recognize the well-loved system. Uh-huh. General Wood arriving tomorrow morning. 
No definite plan of action to be adopted till he gets here. Listing of names of suspects going on rapidly, however. Stacy nodded. Do you think, he asked meditatively, that we'll have a chance to be in on the arresting part of the game? That's what I want. Patrolling streets is no use. Sure I do. The colonel from the fort said as much. It's just what they will use us of the Legion for, because we know the town. Here are our drinks. Now, when we've drunk them, what in hell shall we do? I know, he cried triumphantly. We'll drive around to the hotel and bring your things over here, where they ought to have been all the time. Stacy smiled. All right, he assented. I don't care much for the night clerk at that hotel. At five minutes to twelve, the library all at once overflowed with men. There was pride in Stacy's look as he greeted them. How many, Mills? he demanded after a moment. Twenty out of twenty-two, sir. Burnham's sick, as you know better than anyone else, Captain. Monahan, he, he couldn't come. He couldn't? Stacy's voice was regretful. That's too bad. He paused for a moment, reflecting. Then he drew himself up very straight, and gazed at the men, looking keenly from one to another. "'Now look here, men,' he said. "'You're fed up on army stuff, and so am I. You know as well as I do that I haven't got a bit of authority over you. I can't tell you to go and do anything you don't want to do. But last night some things were done in this town that I happened to see.' and one of them was that a brave man stood out in front of a mob of beasts and said no to them, and what happened to him because he said no, as any one of you would have said, was, Oh, God damn it, you know what it was. Stacy's face was white now, and his voice shook with anger. He was your mayor, he continued after a moment, but it isn't that I care about. What I care about is that he was a man, you fought the Germans, and no one knows better than I how you fought them. Well, there were men among the Germans, decent men, whatever we think about what they fought for. In this mob last night there weren't any men, just beasts. And I ask you, just ask you, mind, if you'll turn in with Lieutenant Trail and me and go after them. That's all, he concluded, and shut his teeth with a snap. There was an instant's pause. Then... I guess you know, Captain, said one of the men awkwardly, that we'll all of us do whatever you say, and do it quick, he added sharply. Thanks, Sergeant. Is that the way you all feel about it? Thanks again. Now then, he went on, in a brisker, matter-of-fact tone, Lieutenant Trail tells me that we'll be able to make arrests. Well, that's what we want. I wouldn't have called you across the block for the sake of patrolling streets. That's a Boy Scout job. This is the way it'll be, I suppose. Officers will get lists given them, and go out with a patrol of men to get the animals listed. I don't know how many men they'll assign to each officer, but two will be enough. Now listen to me. I only want four of you to show up in uniform. Let's see, uh, Morgan and Isaacs for me, Mills and Jackson for Lieutenant Trail. The rest of you, all sixteen, keep out of uniform. Don't show up at any Legion meeting. Report to me through Sergeant Peters and Corporals Pettivale, Blaine, and Swanson. You're to find out where the men are whose names they'll have given us. They won't be at their homes, of course, most of them. Then the six of us in uniform will go get them. Do you see? Dirty work, spies' work, informing. He paused questioningly, but the laughter that greeted his warning was reassuring. All right, then, he said easily. You won't be very popular, of course, but who wants to be popular with skunks? That's all for now. Nothing doing till General Wood arrives. The sergeant and the three corporals will come here at nine tomorrow morning. In civilian clothes, mind, and await instructions. Morgan, Isaacs, Mills, and Jackson show up in uniform at the Legion meeting tomorrow after General Wood's arrival. When the men had gone, Trail looked at Stacy oddly. "'Gee whiz, Captain,' he cried finally. "'You're stronger than ever on love for military discipline, aren't you? "'Here you've gone and organized a civilian detective service "'right in the bosom of the army. "'Oh, cripey!' "'And he burst out laughing. "'Well,' said Stacy coolly, "'what we want is to get those men, isn't it?' "'But Blake appeared at the door. "'Good!' Trail exclaimed. 
Lunch is ready. We'll go down. And this afternoon there's a legion meeting. I'll take you over. Not for the joy of it, but just because I'll have to present you to the officers. And to the colonel from Fort Crook. He'll be there. The next morning, while the two men were at breakfast, Trail was called to the telephone. He returned after five minutes, his face radiant. "'It's all right,' he said. "'Commander of Legion called me up. General got in two hours ago. Already conferred with Governor, City Commissioner, Police Department, everything else conferable. Police Department transferred to the Colonel, Commanding Officer at Fort Crook. Already taken control. All arrests to be military arrests. Oh, boy! That means us. General to see Legion members at ten this morning. And the Mayor? Damned if I didn't forget to ask. Trail looked at Stacy remorsefully. You really do feel badly about the Mayor, don't you? He said. You're a, a good sort, Captain, if you don't mind my impertinence in saying so, he concluded impetuously. No, said Stacy quietly. I'm not a good sort. I'm only mad, that's all. And I'm not forgetting why. You're ten years younger than I, Trail. You're rather enjoying the lark. All the same, the other insisted soberly, you are sorry about the mayor as well as mad. I'll go call up the hospital. Better, he said, when he came back, improving slowly. Stacy nodded. When they set out for the Legion meeting, they left behind them the four NCOs in civilian dress, sitting placidly in the library. You know, observed Trail exultantly, as he set his car plunging down the driveway, it's not at all a bad thing the general couldn't get here till today, because all the conglomerate skunks of this town didn't get on to the fact that we meant business. They've had one whole joyful day with nothing doing but a few troops marching around, and they've fairly laid themselves open with bragging about what they did Sunday night. One long bright day of practically handing out their names on a platter, scores and scores of them on the lists. There were perhaps three hundred Legion members in the large room they entered. General Wood appeared almost at once, the colonel from Fort Crook beside him. Stacy gazed at the general with interest. A clear, honest face, he thought swiftly, with no appearance either of bitterness or the autocratic spirit. A good soldier from his record, not a doubt of it. But why in the world had such a man chosen to be a soldier? And how had he come through it looking like that? The general wasted no time. "'There are long lists of men implicated in this business,' he said to the three hundred. "'Your job will be to go out and get them. When you go to make an arrest, use no more force than is necessary, and use all the force that is necessary. Remember, you are sent for a certain man. Come back with him. Bring him in alive, if possible, but bring him in. Officers will now report to Colonel M.' and the general left the room abruptly. Presently Stacy and Trail received their lists, ten names apiece. We'd like just four men for escort, two each, sir, if it's all the same to you. May we pick the four? Trail asked. Certainly, said the colonel. Get service revolvers for yourselves, and rifles for your men of the ordnance officer. Bring your prisoners here to police headquarters as you get them. Pshaw! the lieutenant remarked in disgust, as they were speeding swiftly homeward, with, in the tonneau behind them, the four men, armed now and in uniform, whom Stacy had chosen as escort the day before. Pshaw! What's twenty names? They left their guard in the hall of Trail's house, went into the library, and copied their lists for the other four men who were waiting there. All right, Stacy remarked, start at it. As soon as anyone's located, send one of your men around to report to us. And you'd better detail someone to see that he doesn't get away in the meantime. Yes, sir, said Peters. I guess you'll find that all right, Captain. We've worked out a plan. I thought you would have, Sergeant. The men saluted, for all that they were in civilian clothes, and went out. There was nothing to do but wait. Trail fidgeted, but Stacy was impassive. Suddenly he smiled. It had occurred to him that, having learned from the newspaper item the name of the man he had attempted to strangle Sunday night, he could easily lay an information against him and proceed to arrest him, 
supposing he was sufficiently recovered to permit of a rest. Stacy smiled. He had a rather grisly sense of humor, because he could picture the horror on, what was his name? Kraft's brutish face when he saw his assailant himself come for him. But it was only a diverting fancy. Stacy did not follow it up. In the matter of retribution, he thought Kraft had had his share. "'You'll take my car, Captain. You can drive a Cadillac, can't you? And I'll use my father's,' Trail suggested. "'All right.' In less than an hour, a man reported with an address. "'You go after him, Lieutenant,' said Stacy calmly. "'You're more in a hurry than I am.' Trail went joyfully. Fifteen minutes later, two more were announced to be located, and, as Stacy was on the point of getting into Trail's car, with Morgan and Isaacs, his escort, and the two men who had reported, still another name was brought in. Stacy went after them. Two he got without difficulty, disregarding their cringing protestations of innocence, with the same impassive disgust he had shown, except for one moment toward the mob on Sunday night. The third, who was hiding in the back room of a saloon, and was encouraged by the presence of companions, showed fight, until Stacy rapped him dispassionately on the head with the butt of his revolver. Stacy took his prisoners to the police station, and returned to the house. Trail had already been there, and gone again. Two other men were waiting, and Stacy set off once more. "'Beautiful system. Works like a charm. Good man, Peters.' Too bad Burnham can't be in on it, he thought to himself. He wondered once or twice why Monahan couldn't come. He felt a little sorry. He had always liked Monahan. At four o'clock he and Trail had brought the last men on their lists to the police station. Pshaw, said the lieutenant, it's too easy, though two of the ones I got livened things up for a while. Come on, let's ask for more. They reported to the colonel. "'We've got all our men, sir,' said Trail, who was spokesman because he knew the officer personally. "'What?' the colonel exclaimed. "'All twenty? Why, no one else has got a third through his list yet. Complain they can't find their men.' "'We were lucky, I guess, sir,' Trail returned. "'May we have some more names?' "'Sure. Coming in all the time.' They received two further lists, dropped them in their pockets, and set off once more. But when in the library each read his own paper through, Stacy started slightly. There were only nine names on the copied list that he handed to Peters. At ten that evening they reported once more to the colonel. "'I've brought in all but two on my list, sir,' said Trail, "'and Captain Carroll all but three on his. They're beginning to get wise and skip out of town.' The colonel considered the two men curiously. "'How on earth do you do it?' he asked. Trail grinned. He had always been irrepressibly unmilitary. It was why Stacy had liked him. "'Just system, sir,' he replied. "'Can you give us some more names?' The colonel reflected. "'Well, I'll tell you,' he said finally. "'I'll make you out a list, one list, since it's clear you two work together, of twenty men the others couldn't get, but who aren't supposed to have left the city. Go after them and see what you can do, but not till tomorrow morning.' Mind, that's an order. These are a bad lot. Crooks, nearly all of them, the chief of police says. I don't want any midnight casualties among Legion men. The two took their escort to their homes, then drove back to the house. But as they got out of the car, Stacy paused. Trail, he said, will you let me have your car for a little while? There's someone I want to see. I'll be back inside of an hour. Sure, you know you don't have to ask but Trail could not conceal his boyish curiosity. "'I'll tell you about it soon, by tomorrow, I hope,' Stacy remarked, climbing back into the car. "'You copy out that list for our men, will you? And tell them we'll be ready at seven tomorrow morning.' Trail nodded, and Stacy set off. He drove the car slowly along the avenue until he sighted a policeman, then drew up beside him. "'Where's Dodge Street, please?' he asked. And where would 816 be? The officer explained carefully, and Stacy drove on. It was a long way to the street he sought, but he reached it at last and found the number, a boarding house in the section near the railway. Is James Monahan in? 
he asked the woman who answered the ring. Hall bedroom on the third floor, she replied, looking suspiciously at his uniform. I don't know if he's in. Stacy went up the stairs and knocked at the door. There was a kind of growl from inside that might have been meant for, come in. So Stacy entered the room. End of chapter 11